too hard in Bengal. Half the men in an English invasion force died of disease that year, and the company had to swallow a humiliating peace. The lesson seemed clear. Europeans had the edge on the battlefield, but unless they could combine that with an edge in the war of germs, it availed them little. Distance, disease, and demography made the Asian empires invulnerable. The most that Europeans could hope for was to fight over the crumbs that fell from their tables. But then everything changed. Sooner or later, bad luck, bad blood, or bad judgment catches up with every empire, and in 1707 it was the Mughals' turn. After ruling India for almost half a century, the great Aurangzeb finally died. The occupant of the peacock throne had spent his last years falling out first with his own son, and then with the Rajas, Nawabs, and minor sultans who did the actual work of running the subcontinent for him. At his passing, his former agents grabbed the opportunity to opt out of the Mughal organization. Law and order collapsed, and violence spiked. It was every man for himself. By 1720, local grandees were intriguing and fighting against each other, against their nominal overlords in distant Delhi, and against their own unhappy subjects. Players in this game of thrones ran up huge debts to finance their moves. I am falling at my creditor's feet till I have rubbed the skin from my forehead, one complained in the 1730s. Needless to say, the various East India companies were only too happy to exploit this diplomatic opening by lending to the would-be Nawabs, especially when they handed the money straight back to the companies to hire European troops. But these were anxious days for the companies, too. On the upside, companies that backed the right men could become kingmakers, perhaps even winning rights to administer and tax the lands around their coastal enclaves. But the downside was that all the fighting disrupted the trade that kept the companies going, threatening them with ruin. Tight-lipped men in tricorn hats slipped back and forth between European forts and Rajas' palaces, betraying and being betrayed in turn in a murky world of shifting politics. The princes became independent, observed the British politician and philosopher Edmund Burke, but their independence led to their ruin. Few, if any, of the company's men were actually seeking to ruin the princes, Yet this was precisely what happened in the Carnatic region of southern India. Here things were even messier than usual, because the intriguing Nawabs and Sultans had the option of dealing not just with the British, based in Madras, but also with the French, in Pondicherry, and of playing the two East India companies against each other. In 1744, when news arrived that Britain and France were again at war in Europe, both companies decided to put boots on the ground in the Carnatic, which promptly blew up in a multi-cornered conflict. The Anglo-French confrontation added another wrinkle, Europe's ongoing revolution in military affairs, to the diplomatic opportunities presented by the Mughal meltdown. Had India fallen apart in the 1640s, Europeans might not have been strong enough to capitalize on it, but by the 1740s their professional armies were unstoppable. These forces were tiny, rarely more than 3,000 men, and most troops were in fact local recruits rather than Europeans. But when it came to a fight, the well-armed, well-trained, highly disciplined company men consistently routed native armies ten times their size, even when the Indians brought along armoured elephants. The Europeans were like a wall which vomited fire and flame, a survivor of one battle said. The Carnatic War raised the stakes for the companies. Whoever came out on top in the Anglo-French fighting would dispose of the entire Carnatic, not just its coastal trade, but it also became clear, as the war dragged on, that the costs for the companies would be enormous. Both companies had gone to India to make money, so commercial logic demanded a negotiated end to the war. In 1754, the French company began looking for an exit strategy but the British did not. For 150 years, Europe's great powers had fought over trade and colonies so they could make money to fund their wars at home. Britain had done better than anyone at this, becoming, one writer claimed in 1718, the most considerable of any nation in the world 
because of the vastness and expansiveness of our trade. Yet if this were true, some Britons asked, did it not imply that conventional wisdom was wrong? Instead of trade in India being a means contributing to the end of winning wars in Europe, perhaps wars in Europe should be the means and winning more trade in India should be the end. Really profound shifts in strategic thinking typically only come along every century or two, but one was now under way in London. Amid intense debate, a loose alliance of commercial interests dragged Britain in fits and starts toward a new business model, in which fighting in Europe was solely a way to distract France so that Britain could snap up its colonies and trade without interference. The British government lent money and men to France's other enemies in Europe, while the British East India Company stayed the course in the Carnatic and bestowed the throne on its chosen Nawab. The company then extorted massive kickbacks from him, seized his tax revenues, and swamped his economy with its agents. Money rolled in, and when a new pro-French Nawab in Bengal, the richest part of India, started making trouble in 1756, the company leapt at the chance to repeat its Carnatic strategy. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. War. What is it good for? Conflict and the Progress of Civilization from Primates to Robots by Ian Morris but the Nawab struck first. He swept down on the company's base in Calcutta and on the pitchy, stifling night of June the 20th to the 21st, crammed over a hundred prisoners into a cell made for eight. By dawn, half had suffocated or died from heatstroke. The company dispatched Robert Clive, an unlikable but undeniably daring hero of the Carnatic War, to avenge the black hole of Calcutta. Clive did not just toss the Nawab out of Calcutta. He also joined a Bengali uprising against him, and, adding the company's men to the rebels, took on an army twenty times the size of his own. The resulting battle at Plassey was slightly farcical. The Nawab's gunners accidentally blew up some of their own artillery, which stampeded the elephants dragging the guns. The rest of the Nawab's army then ran away when the Nawab's key ally, who also happened to be the company's pick as the next Nawab, changed sides. The company now took over tax collection in Bengal, and Clive helped himself to a reward of £160,000, as I write, the equivalent of about $400 million from its treasury. And Bengal was just the beginning. Over the next two years, Britain worked with its allies to keep France tied up in Germany, while seizing for itself key Caribbean islands and the whole of Canada. A British army beat the French again in India, and the Royal Navy smashed the French fleet not once, but twice. Rarely has a strategy been so successful. Could it be believed, Burke asked the Speaker of the House of Commons in 1783, when I entered into existence, in 1729, or when you, a younger man, were born, 1735, that on this day, in this house, we should be employed in discussing the conduct of those British subjects who had disposed of the power and person of the Grand Mogul. The Invisible Fist Between the Portuguese capture of Ceuta and Burke's speech in 1783, Western Europeans had conquered millions of square miles of territory and tens of millions of people. They had reinvented productive war rather than just reviving it. They took it global, creating entirely new kinds of bigger societies. And while their wars were raging across the oceans and in America, Asia, and Africa, in the Western European homelands rates of violent death fell faster and further than ever before. The 15th century was perhaps Europe's bloodiest since the fall of the Roman Empire a thousand years earlier, with bands of unemployed mercenaries ravaging France and Italy, and civil war tearing England apart. O oh, piteous spectacle! O oh, bloody times! Shakespeare imagined the mad King Henry VI crying out in 1461, as fifty thousand men hacked at each other for hours in a snowstorm to decide his claim to the throne of England. 
and well he might cry out, given what archaeologists have found on the battlefield of Toten. One soldier, now known only as Toten 25, went down in a hail of blows that smashed his skull eight times. First came five stabs in the face, none of them fatal, but then a gigantic blow from behind ripped off the back of his skull and drove bone splinters through his brain. He fell forward, but another swipe flipped him over before a final sword stroke slashed his face in half, going in through an eye socket and bursting out through his throat. But it could have been worse. His comrade Toten 32 took thirteen head wounds, one of them deliberately slicing off an ear. Nor were the contending kings immune. In 1485, in the last battle of the Civil War, Richard III, identified in 2013 by his curved spine and DNA, was tied up, stabbed clean through the head with a sword, and hacked again with a halberd. Then, after he was dead, he was stabbed through his buttocks and tossed into a pit. By the time Burke spoke in 1783, no one imagined that such violence could return to Western Europe. Across the previous three centuries, government, desperate to raise cash for huge armies and navies, fierce new ships and guns, and professional officers and men, had reasserted itself. This was Elias's civilizing process, the coming of an age of reason, order, and prosperity that would have astonished Kings Henry and Richard. It was an uneven process. The seventeenth century saw another wave of failed states, prompting Hobbes to write Leviathan, but by 1783 pirates and highwaymen were becoming things of the past. Blackbeard was shot five times in 1718 and Dick Turpin hanged in 1739, and homicide rates had collapsed. In the 1480s, roughly one Western European in a hundred was being murdered. In the 1780s, that fate awaited just one in a thousand. Burke's England was probably the safest place the world had ever seen. Western Europeans were, in a sense, rerunning the tape of ancient history. Like the Romans, Mauryans, and Han before them, they were creating bigger leviathans. Just as in ancient times, the process was brutal and exploitative. But, again as in ancient times, in the long run it drove down rates of violent death and delivered prosperity. Intellectuals were acutely aware of this, devoting polemical pamphlets and learned treatises to what they called the Battle of the Ancients and the Moderns, arguing over whether, or when, they had surpassed the achievements of antiquity. For what it is worth, the social development index that I describe in my earlier books, Why the West Rules, for now, and The Measure of Civilization, provides answers they might have liked. Yes, and in 1720. In another sense, though, Europeans were going well beyond the Romans. As with productive war, they did not so much revive Leviathan as reinvent it. By building empires across the oceans, instead of building a traditional territorial empire within their own continent, Western Europeans created an entirely new kind of economy, which generated wealth on a staggering scale. Britain alone saw its exports boom from about £2 million in 1700 to nearly £40 million at the century's end. What made the new economy different from anything seen before was the Atlantic Ocean. Europe's conquest of America had turned the northern part of the sea into a kind of Goldilocks ocean, big enough to have very different ecologies and societies around its shores, but small enough that ships could cross it, trading at every point and generating steady profits. Historians usually describe this as triangular trade. A businessman could start in Liverpool with a boatload of textiles or guns and sail to Senegal, exchanging them at a profit for slaves. He could then carry the slaves to Jamaica and trade them, again at a profit, for sugar, which he could bring back to England to sell for more profits, before buying a new consignment of finished goods and setting off to Africa again. Alternatively, a Bostonian could take rum to Africa and swap it for slaves, bring the slaves to the Caribbean and exchange them for molasses, and then bring the molasses back to New England to make into more rum. Europe's conquest of America had created something entirely unanticipated, an integrated intercontinental market, 
generating a geographical division of labor and making men rich on every shore. It gave each of the lands abutting the North Atlantic a comparative economic advantage and encouraged entrepreneurs to specialize in capturing slaves in Africa, clearing plantations in the Caribbean and North America's southern states, and manufacturing in Europe and America's northern states. To work well, the new economy needed new kinds of government that would make specialization easier. West Africa saw the rise of powerful kings, the Caribbean and the American South saw the coming of planter oligarchies, and in Northwest Europe and the American Northeast, commercial elites challenged absolutist monarchs. Each shift generated conflict. Africans raided their neighbors to abduct slaves, settlers in America seized the natives' lands, and Europeans boarded and sank each other's ships to seize trade routes. Everywhere that the new Atlantic economy touched, all fixed, fast-frozen relations were swept away. In Western Europe, cheap shipping brought a world of little luxuries within reach of everyday folk. By the 18th century, a man with a little cash in his pocket could do more than just buy another loaf of bread. He could get miraculous drugs, tea, coffee, tobacco, sugar, brought from distant continents, or homemade marvels such as clay pipes, umbrellas, and newspapers. And the same Atlantic economy that provided this bounty also produced people ready to give a man the cash he needed. Because traders would buy every hat, gun, or blanket that they could get to ship to Africa or America, manufacturers were always willing to pay people to make more of them. No longer did men automatically follow their fathers into farming if drifting into towns promised better wages. Some set their families to spinning and weaving to earn cash, Others joined workshops and walked away from the fields. The details varied, but across the 17th and 18th centuries, Europeans increasingly sold their labor to employers and worked longer hours. And the more they did so, the more sugar, tea, and newspapers they could buy, which meant more slaves dragged across the Atlantic, more acres cleared for plantations, and more factories and shops opened. Sales rose, Economies of scale were achieved, and prices fell, opening this world of goods to even more Western Europeans. The real source of riches, the philosopher Adam Smith concluded in 1776 in his Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, was not plunder, conquest, or monopolies. It was the division of labor. This division of labor, he said, was itself the consequence of a certain propensity in human nature to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. In pursuing profit, people start to specialize on the jobs that they do particularly well or inexpensively, and exchange the fruits of their labors for goods and services that other people produce particularly well or inexpensively. By creating markets for these goods and services, they simultaneously lower costs and raise quality making everyone better off. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, Smith observed, but from their regard to their own interest. By directing his industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, Smith explained, a man intends only his own gain, but he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. The implication was obvious. The more that governments got out of people's way and left them free to truck, barter, and exchange, the better the invisible hand would work and the better off everyone would be. Or would they? For 5,000 years, one of the big perks of ruling had been the right to plunder successful subjects. Even the most assiduous stationary bandits sometimes gave in to the temptation, but the Smithian vision of the world now asked the mighty to make a bet. Stealing from your subjects, it advised rulers, gives you a bigger slice of the pie but if you settle for a smaller slice, you will in the end eat more, because the pie will become much bigger. In those parts of Western Europe where kings wielded the greatest power, particularly Spain, 
This did not sound very plausible. But in countries where kings were weaker, England, and especially the Netherlands, which did not even have a king, governments were more willing to roll the dice by granting the nouveau riche truckers, barterers, and exchangers more and more freedom to exploit the new Atlantic economy. France, home of the original nouveau riche, was somewhere in the middle. Fortunately for the delicate sensibilities of the well-born, men who made money in trade could usually be relied upon to buy country estates and put on powdered wigs as soon as the opportunity presented itself. But capitalizing on the Atlantic economy did not just mean cutting deals with these people of no name. It also meant inviting them into the inner circle. Economic freedom led inexorably to demands for political freedom, and kings who tried to hold back the tide might lose their thrones, like England's James II in 1688, or even their heads, like England's Charles I in 1649 and France's Louis XVI in 1793. Yet not everything was wine and roses for the wealthy merchants either. The traditional way to rule a kingdom had involved farming out the right to collect taxes, judge disputes, and administer market monopolies to local worthies, who normally lined their own pockets but also kept government expenses down. Freeing people to truck, barter, and exchange meant sweeping away much of this archaic machinery and giving free rein to the invisible hand, but something had to replace the old way of guaranteeing law and order and the only something available was central government. Allowing markets to work well was more complicated than it appeared. It was not just a matter of government stepping aside. Rather, government had to step in, creating a whole new structure of more impartial functionaries, judges, and civil servants. Without this, the open access order, as the noted social scientists Douglas North, John Wallace, and Barry Weingast call the new system in their book violence and social orders, could not function. We should not exaggerate the scale and speed of changes. Eighteenth-century governments remained tiny by twenty-first-century standards. The better sort expected and generally received deference, and almost everywhere democracy was a dirty word. But all the same, ordinary people's interests began to matter more to rulers. The price of representation, however, was taxation, and more money meant that governments needed more managers, who, little by little, extended Leviathan's reach deeper into civil society. In England, which led the way in open access, the number of government pen-pushers tripled between 1690 and 1782, and the tax take grew sixfold. Let any gentleman but look into the statute books lying upon our table, the Earl of Bath harumphed in 1743. It is monstrous. It is even frightful to look into the indexes, where for several columns together we see nothing but taxes, taxes, taxes. Despite the grumbling, by Smith's day it was clear that governments that laid bets on open access were doing better than those that did not. From Madrid to Constantinople, rulers carried on defending royal, aristocratic, and clerical prerogatives against merchants. They limited who could trade, they set up monopolies, and they went on seizing their subjects' goods. The payoffs? Hunger, misery, and want, as economies grew more slowly than people reproduced. In northwestern Europe, by contrast, rulers were far more willing to take a chance on the new ways of doing things. Holding their noses, they made deals with the money men. The payoff? Economies that grew even faster than people could breed. Even so, Smith saw, reordering relationships within nations was only the beginning. Rulers also needed to reorder the relations between nations. By forcing Asia, Africa, and America into a vastly expanded market, Smith acknowledged, European governments had added greatly to the world's wealth, but now the market had grown so big, he argued, that Europe should voluntarily give up all authority over her colonies and leave them to elect their own magistrates, to enact their own laws, and to make peace and war as they might think proper. The Assyrian, Roman, or any other earlier empire would have been insane to abandon its provinces and rely on trade to make it rich, but now, said Smith, 
freeing colonies to truck and barter as they saw fit, would be a net gain for rulers. Such a measure, Smith admitted, never was, and never will be, adopted by any nation in the world. But in 1776, the very year that The Wealth of Nations was published, Britain's American colonists relieved their motherland of the need to decide whether to follow Smith's advice by rebelling. Traditional-minded politicians assumed that losing the colonies would ruin Britain's Atlantic trade, but events soon showed that they were wrong and Smith was right. Anglo-American commerce regained its pre-war level in 1789 and just kept growing. Explaining this became in many ways the burning question of the late 18th century, and it has never really gone away since then. In a sense, it is the same question that I am trying to answer in this book. I have been arguing that in the 10,000 years since farming began, productive war has been the motor that made the world safer and richer, by creating leviathans that in turn created bigger societies, pacified them internally, and allowed economies to grow. But the American Revolution seems to point in the opposite direction. By breaking a big chunk off the British Empire, the Revolution was very much a counterproductive war, in the sense I have been using that expression. But instead of leading back to the kinds of calamities that we heard about in Chapter 3, it made both Britain and the new United States richer than ever before. Perhaps what the American Revolution teaches us is that the whole argument of this book is wrong. Perhaps the real secret to a safer, richer world is just to set everyone free to pursue their own interests, without governments setting rules and enforcing them with violence. This was certainly the conclusion that many intellectuals reached in the late 18th century. These were the years in which Rousseau challenged Hobbes, arguing that before governments had begun bothering them, people had lived in a peaceful and happy natural state. There were also the years in which Thomas Paine, in his best-selling pamphlet Common Sense, assured Americans that government even in its best state is but a necessary evil. Some of Americans' revolutionaries, Above all, a group around Thomas Jefferson, known as Republicans, tried to put the new theory into practice. Others, above all a group around Alexander Hamilton, known as Federalists, pushed back against the idea that government itself will become useless and society will subsist and flourish free from its shackles. The reality, the Federalist and soon-to-be President John Adams told Jefferson, was that men were slaves to their violent passions and that, Nothing but force and power and strength can restrain them. Smith himself took a middle course. Just look, he said, at the Navigation Acts, which England passed in 1651. These laws, designed largely to exclude Dutch rivals from English colonial trade, were disastrous in purely economic terms. Shutting out the Dutch shrank England's markets and made everyone poorer. In strategic terms, however, the laws were vital, because growing Dutch power threatened England's very survival. As defence, Smith pointed out, is of much more importance than opulence, the act of navigation is, perhaps, the wisest of all the commercial regulations of England. The Navigation Acts threw into sharp relief the fundamental problem of the Atlantic economy, a problem that it shared with every other part of the open access order. Markets could not work well unless governments got out of them, but markets could not work at all unless governments got into them, using force to pacify the world and keep the beast at bay. Violence and commerce were two sides of the same coin, because the invisible hand needed an invisible fist to smooth the way before it could work its magic. The fifty years that followed the American Revolution gradually showed how to solve this conundrum, not by ridding the world of Leviathan, but by making a Leviathan that reached across the world. This Leviathan would be a novel kind of stationary bandit, one that stood above the fray and impartially umpired an international open access order, preventing any lesser Leviathans from interfering with the invisible hand. What the new business-friendly rulers of northwestern Europe were doing within their countries a new business-friendly super-leviathan would do between countries. It would act as a globocop, an impartial policeman providing security for all 
and leaving economic self-interest to bring people together in larger and larger markets. In return for giving up plunder and monopolies, the Globocop would become the most privileged player in a hugely expanded market, and if all went well, it would end up much richer than traditional leviathans had ever been. Once again, war was reaching a culminating point. Since reinventing productive war in the 15th century, Europeans had conquered more of the planet and created bigger markets than anyone had done before, but the strategies that had brought them so much success were now leading toward disaster. To thrive in the new world of global trade that productive war had made, governments had to embrace the open access order. As Smith foresaw, no nation in the world was ready to adopt such measures wholeheartedly, and even after its defeat in North America, Britain went on aggressively extending its control of India. However, Britain's governments did begin to see that they did not have to rule North America to get the benefits of a bigger society. They just had to rule the waves. It is no coincidence that Rule Britannia, the soundtrack to this chapter, was first sung in 1740. Britain edged little by little toward being a globocop, using its invisible fist to police the sea lanes, clearing the way for the invisible hand of the market to do its job. Productive war and leviathans had not become obsolete. Rather, they were just evolving into new and more powerful forms. Unfortunately, it would take another generation of killing before the world learned this lesson. War and Perpetual Peace in 1793, a force appeared that beggared all imagination. Suddenly, war again became the business of the people. This, thought Clausewitz, who lived through the events, was the real legacy of the late 18th century. Not for nothing did the United States founding fathers open their draft constitution in 1787 with the words, We the people. It was the people in arms, not paid professionals or mercenaries, who rose against the British. Lacking their enemies' wealth and organization, the American revolutionaries had raised armies by enthusing them with patriotism instead of paying them, and had run rings around the rigid, ponderous professionals. The open access order was now opening war, as well as markets and politics, to the energies of the masses. A new revolution in military affairs was beginning. This was not well understood at first, although it should have been. Many European observers insisted that there had in fact been nothing special about the American Revolution. Far from being a people united, they pointed out, Americans had actually been deeply divided over rebelling, and the rebels might well have lost without interventions by French and Spanish fleets and the Baron von Steuben, a German officer who trained the Continental Army to fight more like professionals. Even when Europeans did recognize that the Americans had waged a novel kind of people's war, they rarely thought that it mattered much. The post-revolutionary United States, they observed, was a puny military power. As late as 1791, the outnumbered Miami Indians annihilated an American army near the headwaters of the Wabash River. They killed 600 white soldiers and stuffed their mouths with soil to satisfy their land hunger. If this was what people's war brought, many Europeans concluded, they could do without it. When Europeans were impressed by the American Revolution, it was more for its outpouring of announcements that the new republic had transcended war than for the way it had fought. Even George Washington, who knew more about battles than most men, felt able to tell a French correspondent that it is time for the age of knight errantry and mad heroism to be at an end, because... The humanizing benefits of commerce would supersede the waste of war and the rage of conquest. As the scripture expresses it, the nations learn war no more. By the mid-1790s, Europe's literary salons were awash with proposals for world peace, often explicitly inspired by the American example. None, though, had quite the impact of Immanuel Kant's little pamphlet, Perpetual Peace, Kant was probably Europe's most famous philosopher, renowned almost as much for his austere lifestyle. He liked to end his single meal of the day with laughter, he said, not because he enjoyed laughing, but because it was good for his digestion. As for his brilliant, closely argued monographs, 
Even other philosophers initially found his 800-page Critique of Pure Reason impenetrable. Perpetual peace, however, was neither austere nor dense. Kant even opened it with a little joke. His title, he said, came from the satirical inscription on a Dutch innkeeper's sign, upon which a burial ground was painted. Despite the gallows' humour, Kant's point was that perpetual peace was also possible in the here and now. The reason, he said, was that open-access republics were better at commerce than closed-access monarchies, and, if the consent of the citizens is required in order to decide that war should be declared, as it is in republics, then nothing is more natural than that they would be very cautious in commencing such a poor game. And as republics renounced war, each may and should, for the sake of its own security, demand that the others enter with it into a constitution similar to the civil constitution, for under such a constitution each can be secure in his right. This would be a league of nations. War would be no more. Perpetual peace remains hugely influential, regularly assigned, sometimes along with coming of age in Samoa, in college classes. But by the time it came out, in 1795, it was already clear that something was wrong with the argument. Far from ushering in perpetual peace, republicanism had plunged Europe into war. In one of the 18th century's greater ironies, the catalyst was the military aid Louis XVI of France had lavished on the American revolutionaries in order to weaken Britain. He had borrowed heavily, and by 1789 could no longer meet the interest payments. His efforts to raise cash set off a taxpayer's revolt, which quickly turned violent. The revolutionaries locked up the king and his wife, Marie Antoinette, and then sent both of them, plus 16,592 of their fellow citizens, to the guillotine. Horrified, Europe's great powers rallied in a grand coalition to restore the status quo, and in 1793 the French revolutionaries, suddenly scared, unleashed a people's war the force that beggared Clausewitz's imagination. The full weight of the nation was thrown into the balance, said Clausewitz. The resources and efforts now available for use surpassed all conventional limits. Nothing now impeded the vigour with which war could be waged. A million Frenchmen joined up. Kant may have been right that the citizens of republics would be very cautious in commencing such a poor game as war, but once they did commence it, they went about it with a violent rage that paid professionals largely lacked. America's Revolutionary War had seen relatively few massacres outside the campaigns in the Carolinas, but the French Revolutionary Wars were fought in frenzies of self-righteousness, directed particularly against enemies within. We are bearing fire and death, a French officer wrote to his sister in 1794. One volunteer killed three women with his own hands. It is atrocious, but the safety of the Republic demands it imperatively. The Revolutionary Army slaughtered a quarter of a million country folk, considered counter-revolutionaries, that year. Finding guns and guillotines too slow, they took to tying civilians up and throwing them into rivers. What a revolutionary torrent the Loire has become, the commander joked, before adding, apparently sincerely, that... It is out of a principle of humanity that I am purging the land of liberty of these monsters. Against the trained troops of their Prussian, Austrian, and Russian enemies, however, the revolutionaries had a harder time, just as the American revolutionaries had initially had against the British and their Hessian mercenaries. The French people's army was huge, undisciplined, and, having beheaded or chased into exile most of its reactionary officers, usually poorly led. Only its excellent artillery, which had retained a backbone of non-aristocratic, pre-revolutionary officers, saved it from disaster. By 1796, one of these officers, a short, quarrelsome provincial named Napoleon Bonaparte, had even worked out how to turn a people's army into a war-winning weapon. No more manoeuvres, no more military art, just fire, steel, and patriotism, revolutionaries had proclaimed, but Napoleon's genius lay in turning this rhetoric into reality. Abandoning the clumsy supply trains that slowed down professional armies, 
Napoleon's men lived off the land, buying or stealing what they needed. No one had tried this since the seventeenth century, because forces had grown too big to be fed from farms along their line of march. Napoleon, however, broke his army down into corps and smaller divisions, each marching on a separate line. Each could fight a standalone battle if it had to, but the key to victory was that the columns could converge rapidly when the enemy was spotted, allowing Napoleon to concentrate overwhelming force. Once on the battlefield, Napoleon followed the same principles. His men could rarely perform elaborate linear tactics as well as old-school professionals, so he did not ask them to. Instead, swarms of skirmishers sniped at the enemy's neat lines, while the mass of French infantry ran forward in ragged columns, covered by barrages of shot and shell. When the columns got close to the opposition, they could quickly spread out into rough lines and fire off good enough volleys, substituting numbers for precision, or they could keep going, barreling into the enemy line with fixed bayonets. Even professionals regularly threw down their muskets and ran, rather than receive the revolutionary's charge. Right around the time Kant was writing Perpetual Peace, France drifted, without too much deliberation, from waging people's wars in defence of the revolution to waging them to extend it. In 1796, Napoleon swept through northern Italy. In 1798, he invaded Egypt, and in December 1800, French armies stopped just 50 miles short of Vienna. In 1807, three years after Kant died, Napoleon occupied his hometown of Königsberg. People's war in Europe had taken a very different path from the American version. After the British surrendered at Yorktown in 1781, the Americans had beaten their bayonets into plowshares. The revolutionary generals had gone back to their farms, and Jefferson and like-minded Republicans had stubbornly resisted centralized power, taxes, a national debt, standing armies, and all the other tools of Leviathan. To some Americans, this showed that they were cut from a different, more virtuous cloth than the corrupt Europeans. However, the fact that the United States lurched back toward Leviathan whenever it did perceive danger, as in the late 1790s when fears of a French invasion flared up, suggests that the real difference was one of political geography. The United States faced few existential threats after 1781. In their absence, it could get away with being a military midget and even with engaging in arguments about whether it needed a leviathan at all. European governments, on the other hand, faced predatory neighbors on every side. The slightest weakness could prove fatal, and republics had to fight just as hard as monarchies if they were to survive. On both continents, the rise of patriotic passions was part of the larger rise of open access orders, but European people's war diverged even further from the American brand when Napoleon discovered that it could be decoupled from republicanism. A quiet coup in 1799 effectively made him France's monarch, and in 1804 he very publicly crowned himself emperor. From now on, France's mass armies fought for the very old-fashioned cause of imperial expansion. George Washington had believed that commerce was making war redundant, but Napoleon never felt that way. In fact, after 1806, he tried to prove just the opposite, using war to overwhelm commerce by requiring defeated foes to join the continental system, basically a trade embargo intended to bankrupt Britain by shutting it out of Europe's markets. It took almost ten more years of war, involving some of the biggest battles in European history—600,000 men fought at Leipzig in 1813 to show that Napoleon was wrong. The only way for war to defeat commerce was for French fleets to seize control of the seas and terminate Britain's trade, but because this trade was so profitable, Britain could always build more and better ships and train more and better sailors than France. Napoleon's naval efforts came to nothing, and because Britain's global commerce survived, Europeans quickly found that they needed British trade more than Britain needed them. One nation after another found ways to get around the continental system and keep dealing in England's markets. Napoleon's fights to enforce the system soon took him beyond the culminating point of people's war. Since 1799, he had shown that he could co-opt people's war to make himself an emperor, 
but Europe's more established monarchs now learned how to do the same to bring him down. When Napoleon occupied Spain in 1808 to keep it inside the continental system, he was sucked into a quagmire of popular revolt, and Spanish insurgents, stiffened by British regulars, tied down hundreds of thousands of French troops for the next six years. Worse followed when Napoleon, still trying to enforce the system, invaded Russia. As mentioned in Chapter 3, it was this blunder that inspired Clausewitz to come up with his theory of culminating points. Enraged when his native Prussia submitted to France, he joined the Russian army in 1812 as a volunteer and realized that his own anti-French anger was just part of a vast reaction that Napoleon had himself created by going too far. The tide turned rapidly. Just two years after Napoleon took Moscow, the Russians had taken Paris and Napoleon was in exile. But the tide then turned again, and in a hundred dramatic days in 1815, Napoleon stormed back into France, raised another army, and almost, but not quite, broke the British at Waterloo before being bundled back into a much more remote exile. So it was that Britain's newfangled, open-access empire of trade survived the great challenge posed by Napoleon's marriage of old-school militarism and up-to-date people's war. By the time Bonaparte died in 1821, helped along, some said, by British poison, Britain bestrode much of the world like a colossus. Acting as a globocop was paying off. Policing the waterways with British warships cost money, but it was worth it, because between 1781 and 1821, Britain's exports tripled and its workers became the most productive on the planet. Britain was becoming a nation unlike any seen before, and also solving a problem that had never been seen before. The sun never sets. Bigger markets, Smith had argued, made for a finer division of labor, which lifted productivity, profits, and wages in a virtuous spiral. But what would happen when tasks had been subdivided as finely as possible, and no further efficiency gains could be squeezed out? Smith had not worried unduly about this, because the problem had never arisen. But by the time Napoleon died, his successors were worrying very much indeed. The high wages that British workers earned were already pricing some of their goods out of European markets. The only way for British firms to stay in business, it seemed, was to pay their workers less, and the average Londoner of the early 19th century was earning 15% less than his grandparents had. Having won the war, Britain seemed to be losing the peace. Thomas Malthus, David Ricardo, and a string of other political economists speculated that there was an iron law of wages. The division of labor, imperial expansion, and becoming a globocop might all push wages up for a while, but in the end income would always be driven back down to the edge of starvation. The 19th century, some predicted, would be an age of misery. But this did not happen, because an odd concatenation of forces compelled the invisible hand and invisible fist to work together in new ways. The story starts with clothes. Because everyone needs them, textiles are a major sector in all pre-modern economies, and because sheep do well in wet, grassy countries, Britons had for centuries worn wool. But as it made inroads into Asia, Britain's East India Company saw an opportunity and started shipping rolls of brightly coloured, inexpensive cotton cloth back to the home isles. It was a huge hit. Wool merchants, unhappy about this competition, struck back by doing the kind of thing that Smith hated most, distorting the market by lobbying Parliament to ban Indian cotton. Cotton cannot grow in Britain, so clothiers responded by importing raw cotton, which was still legal, from the Caribbean colonies and spinning and weaving it in Britain. But British workers could not do the job as cheaply, or frankly as well, as Indians. In the 1760s, 30 pieces of woolen clothing were being sold for every one of cotton. The bottleneck in cotton production was spinning, the labor-intensive, repetitive job of twisting cotton fibers together to make strong, even thread, and it was opened, according to legend, in 1764, when a spinning wheel belonging to one James Hargreaves fell over. 
As he watched it continue turning for several seconds as it lay on its side, Hargreave said, he had an epiphany. He could make a machine that flipped a spindle from vertical to horizontal and then back again, over and over, replacing the human fingers that laboriously twisted the fibers. In fact, a single machine could have dozens of spindles doing the job faster than a human. Hargreaves had hit on a solution to the downside of high wages. He would augment human labor with machine power, raising productivity. Hargreaves's spinning jenny was a hit, perhaps too much so. Hargreaves was unable to enforce his patent. And in 1779, a vastly superior device, Crompton's Mule, also came onto the market, spinning cotton that was not only cheaper but also finer than anything made in India. All this seems very far from the history of war, but before its relevance becomes clear, we must stray still farther from the battlefield, into the world of underground streams. In the 18th century, coal mine owners were also facing the problem of high, by the standards of the day, wages. As wages rose, Britons had more babies. As population grew, people cut down forests to clear farmland, and as wood grew scarce, coal replaced it for heating and cooking. All this was good news for colliers, who dug their mines deeper to bring up ever more coal, but by 1700, mine after mine was flooding. Paying high-priced laborers to bail out the diggings was ruinously expensive, as was using high-priced land to grow oats to feed dozens of horses pulling bucket chains. The answer, first installed at a coal mine in 1712, was an engineering marvel, a machine that substituted cheap coal for expensive muscles. It burned coal to boil water, making steam that drove a piston that pumped water out of the mine shaft, allowing more coal to be dug up and burned. Coal and clothes came together in 1785, when the first cotton mill owner hooked up his mules, jennies, and throstles to steam engines. Productivity exploded. The price of spun cotton fell from 38 shillings per pound in 1786 to under 7 shillings in 1807, but sales grew even faster. In 1760, Britain had imported 2.5 million pounds of raw cotton, by 1787, that jumped to 22 million pounds. In 1837, it reached 366 million pounds. Steam power then leapt from industry to industry as engineers figured out new applications. British wages, which had been sliding since the 1740s as Smithian improvements ran into diminishing returns, stabilized, and after 1830 surged upward. The Industrial Revolution had arrived. Steam power smashed the last barriers to European commerce. For centuries, the vast distances separating Europe from East Asia had kept Western trade to a mere trickle, while the interiors of Africa and Asia had been beyond the merchant's reach altogether. Steam changed that. Engineers immediately saw that steam engines could be mounted on wheels and that these wheels could paddle ships across oceans and carry trains down tracks. Steam could do the work of the winds and waves in transport, much as it was doing the work of muscles in manufacturing. Steam could swallow space. The British led the way. The earth was made for Dombey and Son to trade in, announced Charles Dickens in his great novel Dombey and Son, of pride, prejudice, and global commerce. The sun and moon were made to give them light, rivers and seas were formed to float their ships, Rainbows gave them promise of fair weather. Winds blew for or against their enterprises. Stars and planets circled in their orbits to preserve inviolate a system of which they were the center. A.D. had no concern with Anno Domini, but stood for Anno Dombe and Son. Dickens wrote these words in 1846, Anno Domini, that is. In 1838, a British steamship had crossed the Atlantic in 15 days, ignoring headwinds and currents to average an unheard of 10 miles per hour. The next year, an even more extraordinary ship sailed from England for China, the Nemesis, an all-iron steamship armed with cannons and rockets. So odd did this boat seem that even its captain conceded that just 
as the floating property of wood rendered it the most natural material for the construction of ships, so did the sinking property of iron make it appear at first sight very ill-adapted for a similar purpose. The nemesis was on its way to East Asia because of an extraordinarily sordid quarrel. Chinese governments, deeply suspicious of Western traders, had for generations penned them into tiny enclaves in Macau and Guangzhou and limited what they could buy and sell. The merchants, however, found that whatever the Chinese government might say, Chinese customers were eager for their goods, especially opium. Since the world's best opium grew in British-controlled India, business was good, until in 1839 Beijing declared a war on drugs. Chinese officials confiscated a fortune in opium from British drug dealers. After some dubious lobbying, the dealers persuaded the government in London to demand compensation, plus a base at Hong Kong, and the right for traders and merchants, including drug dealers, to enter other ports. The Chinese, understandably, refused, confident that distance would protect them. But the nemesis and a small British fleet quickly showed that this assumption no longer held. The technological gap between the two sides in this opium war was just astonishing. Chinese junks, one British officer observed, looked exactly as if the subjects of medieval prints had assumed life and substance and colour, and were moving and acting before me unconscious of the march of the world through centuries, and of all modern usage, invention, or improvement. Chinese forts crumbled under the intruder's guns, and in 1842 Beijing gave Britain what it demanded. Steamships now flooded China's coastal cities with western goods, and in 1853 an American flotilla, looking for coaling stations, steamed boldly into Tokyo Bay. It cowed the Japanese government without even firing a shot. Back in Washington, the president ignored his Commodore's suggestion that he now annex Taiwan, but the lesson was clear. No country with a coastline was now safe from the West. Nor, for that matter, were countries without coastlines. What steamships did at sea and up rivers, railroads did in the interior. Here, though, aggression was spearheaded less by Europeans than by their settlers overseas. Europe's governments had discovered early on that colonists separated from home by thousands of miles felt little need to follow orders. Since the 16th century, Lisbon, Madrid, London, and Paris had issued rafts of regulations on trade, tea, slaves, and stamps, but Brazil, Mexico, Massachusetts, and Quebec had ignored them. Even when King's demands were quite mild, that colonists pay for their own defense, for instance, white settlers regularly refused and fought back against efforts to coerce them. After Britain lost the United States, it only held on to Canada, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand by giving them most of what the American rebels had demanded. France sold off its last North American holdings in 1803. By 1825, Spain had lost all its American holdings except Cuba and Puerto Rico, and at that point Portugal's stake had been wiped out altogether. European governments had hesitated to push inland, worrying about the costs of conquest, and sometimes even about the rights of local people. The white settlers, however, had fewer qualms. Americans were streaming across the Appalachians even before the ink was dry on the Declaration of Independence, and the Chickamauga Wars, 1776-94, to began a century of attacks on natives. In the 1820s, white Australians followed the same path, conquering Tasmania and breaking into their continent's interior. In the 1830s, South African Boers struck out on their own to escape British regulation and at the Battle of Blood River shot dead 3,000 Zulus for a loss of just three wounded Afrikaners. In the 1840s, New Zealanders went to war with the Maori and the United States reached the Pacific, finally stretching from sea to shining sea. A great native retreat was underway, but what turned it into a route was the railroad. In the 1830s, Americans laid down twice as much track as the whole of Europe combined, then doubled this in the 1840s and tripled it again in the 1850s. 
The Iron Horse moved millions of migrants westward and carried the supplies the army needed as it herded Native Americans into ever more remote reservations. By the 1880s, railroads were also bringing miners from Cape Town to dig up gold and diamonds in Transvaal and taking Russian settlers and soldiers to Samarkand. In 1896, a British army striking into Sudan to crush an Islamist uprising even built a railway as it went. The last barrier to Western expansion, disease, collapsed between 1880 and 1920. In the space of a single lifetime, doctors isolated and conquered cholera, typhoid, malaria, sleeping sickness, and the Black Death. Only yellow fever, responsible for 13 out of every 14 deaths in the Spanish-American War of 1898, held out until the 1930s. The consequences were felt all over the tropics, but most powerfully in Africa. As late as 1870, hardly any Europeans had gone more than a day or two's walk from the coast, but by 1890 steamships and railroads were moving thousands of them inland, and medicine was keeping them alive when they got there. For centuries, the only way to get ivory, gold, slaves, and anything else Europeans wanted had been by cutting deals with long chains of African chiefs, each of them taking a slice of the profits, but now the Europeans could take charge themselves. As often happens, solving one problem just created another. Quinine and vaccines worked just as well on French and Belgians as on English and Americans, with the result that traders who braved deserts, jungles, and hostile natives kept finding that other Europeans had got there ahead of them. In a rerun of what had happened in America and India centuries earlier, the men on the ground lobbied their governments to take over great slices of Africa and keep other Westerners out. Annexation often needed only a few hundred Western soldiers. Africans and Asians had worked hard at catching up with European firepower since the 1750s. After a particularly hard-fought battle in India in 1803, the British commander confessed, I never was in so severe a business in my life or anything like it, and, pray to God, I never may be in such a situation again. But Western firepower just kept getting better. In the 1850s, proper rifles, that is, guns with grooves inside the barrel to make bullets spin, increasing their range and accuracy, came into general use with devastating results. Steam-powered factories churned out rifles by the ten thousands, each one perfectly machined and far less likely to misfire than pre-industrial muskets. Americans particularly shone at this mass production. British observers were astonished in 1854 when a workman at the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts randomly chose ten muskets made at the factory across the previous decade, disassembled them, threw the parts into a box, and reassembled them into ten perfectly working guns. The British immediately bought American machinery and founded the Enfield Armory. There is nothing that cannot be produced by machines, Samuel Colt told them. When both sides had rifles and knew how to use them, as in the American Civil War, thousands of men could be mowed down in minutes. September the 17th, 1862, remains the single bloodiest day in the history of American armies, with nearly 23,000 men killed or wounded at the Battle of Antietam, usually called Sharpsburg in the South. In Africa and Asia, though, Europeans rarely faced much return fire from rifles. General Henry Havelock's comment in 1857, after annihilating a huge Indian army that ambushed his tiny British column, in ten minutes the affair was decided, could be applied to dozens of mid-century slaughters, from Senegal to Siam. The Gatling gun, patented 1861, Carnahan and Dravot's beloved Martini Henry rifle, introduced 1871, and the fully automatic Maxim gun, patented 1884, made the firepower gap between the West and the rest so wide that only rank incompetence of the kind British officers exhibited against the Zulus at Isandluana in 1879 and Italians against Ethiopians at Adwa in 1896 could close it. By the 19th century's end, Western armies went more or less wherever they wanted, and Western navies had even more freedom. European ships had had no serious rivals since the 17th century, 
but the 19th century introduction of steel-plated steamships and explosive shells made resistance futile. The first clash of ironclads, the point-blank shootout between the Monitor and the Merrimack during the American Civil War, had amazed onlookers, but by the 1890s battleships were displacing 15,000 to 17,000 tons, steaming at 16 knots, carrying four 12-inch guns, and fighting duels at five miles range. European governments spent fortunes on these ships, only for them to become instantly obsolete in 1906, when Britain launched HMS Dreadnought, complete with turbine engines, 11-inch armour, and 10 12-inch guns. Five years later, British battleships switched from coal to oil, and by then, with a single exception that I will return to in Chapter 5, the maritime gap between the West and the rest was absolutely unbridgeable. When I was a little boy, my grandmother had a battered globe that must have been made right around this time. Its paper surface was bubbled and peeling, but it fascinated me. British newspapers in the 1960s were full of stories of national humiliation and the retreat from empire, but here, in this little time capsule, everything was different. Two-fifths of the planet was coloured pink for the British Empire. On her dominions the sun never sets, Scotland's oldest newspaper had rejoiced as early as 1821. While sinking from the waters of Lake Superior, his eye opens upon the mouth of the Ganges. Altogether, Europeans or their former colonists ruled five-sixths of the world, but not even Granny's globe captured the full magnitude of Europe's victory in the five hundred years' war. Western dominion was so profound that historians regularly suggest that the word empire does not really do it justice. Rather, they propose, we should think of a nineteenth-century world system in which formal empires ruled from European capitals were just one, and not necessarily the most important, part of a wider web of connections binding the entire earth. This was not exactly Adam Smith's vision of a world held together by self-interest, but it was closer to it than the empires of earlier ages. By 1850, the invisible hand and the invisible fist were cooperating in entirely new ways. The Royal Navy kept the seas free and punished people who offended against the open access order. Between 1807 and 1860, it effectively shut down the Atlantic slave trade, seizing 1,600 ships and returning the 150,000 slaves on them to West Africa. But the system was so big that there was never any possibility of Britain directly ruling it. The home islands were undoubtedly at centre, but what coordination London did impose depended on providing incentives to the formerly independent parts to act in ways that kept the system as a whole going. The goal toward which Britain tried to nudge the world system was simple enough. The great object of the government in every quarter of the world, the Prime Minister told Parliament in 1839, was to extend the commerce of the country. But doing this nudging was anything but simple. British leaders had to coordinate four wildly different tools. The first was the United Kingdom itself, home to the biggest industrial economy on earth and a booming population that sent out more migrants than any other nation. The Royal Navy, stronger than the next strongest two or even three fleets combined, kept open the sea lanes for emigrants, imports and exports, meaning not only cotton, steel and machines, but also a seductive soft power which gave the world business suits, sandwiches and soccer, as well as Dickens, Darwin and Kipling. The second tool, located on the other side of the world, was India. As well as running an enormous trade deficit with Britain, as early as the 1820s, the subcontinent paid for an army of over 200,000 men. This was, in effect, Britain's strategic reserve. When Napoleon needed to be thrown out of Egypt in 1799, or Chinese markets forced open in 1839, or the Shah of Persia bullied in 1856, or Russia shut out of Afghanistan in 1879, or, for that matter, when Rommel needed to be stopped at Al Alamein in 1942, most of the men who did the job were Indians. The flood of British emigrants, altogether about 20 million of them, built the third tool, 
resource-rich white settler colonies on other continents. Their explosive economic growth mattered more and more as the 19th century wore on, and in the 20th their young men were as important as India's in defending the world system. Finally, there was a fourth tool, a sprawling network of capital, experts, shipping, telegraphs, financial services, and investment. This vast, invisible empire extended far beyond the areas colored pink on the globe. Entire countries, Argentina, Chile, Persia, became so dependent on British markets and money that historians often call them an informal empire. They did not take direct orders from British politicians, but they rarely dared defy British financiers. By the 1890s, shipping and services brought three-quarters as much money into Britain as merchandise exports. Keeping this elaborate world system working was a tricky balancing act. It required Asian empires to remain weak, Europe to remain at peace, or at least not to be forced into a single hostile empire by a new Napoleon waging people's wars, and the United States to remain strong but cooperative. And since Britain could rarely compel any of these actors to play their appointed parts, everything depended on a delicate mixture of gunboat diplomacy, market pressure, and enlightened self-interest. There were constant crises. The worst was in India, where a great mutiny in 1857 might have expelled the British altogether, had it been better led. In Europe, an ugly war had to be fought in Crimea between 1854 and 1856 to stop Russia from disrupting the balance of power, and on the American front, war scares were constant. In 1844, arguments over the latitude of the U.S.-Canadian border grew so heated that 54-40, or fight, became a presidential campaign slogan. In 1859, troops dug in and gunboats were sent to the same border after a British pig wandered into an American potato patch. And in 1861, with America's house divided against itself, war again loomed when Union sailors boarded a British ship. But war never came. While damping down an earlier crisis in 1858, this time over British sailors boarding American ships, the American president, James Buchanan, had reminded Congress that no two nations have ever existed on the face of the earth which could do each other so much good or so much harm. Congress agreed, and after making due allowance for local circumstances, most governments in Asia and Europe came to similar conclusions. For almost everyone, there was more to gain from buying into the British system than from trying to break it. Pax Britannica I think there's an enormous amount to be proud of in what the British Empire did, Britain's Prime Minister David Cameron said in 2013. But of course, he added, there were bad events as well as good ones. He was speaking at Amritsar, where nearly a century earlier, British troops had gunned down thousands of unarmed Indian protesters, killing 379 of them. Immediately, Cameron's words were assailed from every side. To some, they smacked of hand-wringing liberal self-loathing. To others, they indicated his gross insensitivity and nostalgia for imperialism. Prime ministers expect to be pilloried for everything they say, but there is probably no way to try to evaluate the legacy of Europe's 500 years' war without being accused of political bias. Accepting that, I will steel myself for the worst and come right to the point. The 500 Years' War was the most productive, in the sense I have used that word in this book, war the world had so far seen, creating the biggest, safest, and most prosperous society, or world system, yet. In 1415, the globe had been fragmented, with each continent dominated by a cluster of regional powers. By 1914, this ancient mosaic was gone, replaced by just three or four powers with truly global reach. France, Germany, the United States, and, of course, the United Kingdom, tightly linked in a system dominated by Britain. Europe had, almost, conquered the world. The marriage of invisible hand and invisible fist made the modern world system very different from any pre-modern empire, 
but the five hundred years' war that created it had nevertheless followed a broadly familiar pattern. First came a conquest phase, driving up rates of violent death. Next, in many cases, came an era of rebellion, with more great bloodlettings. And finally came an age of peace and prosperity, as violence declined and economies were reconstructed on a larger scale. The timing of the phases depended on where you lived. The wave of conquest broke on South and Central America in the 16th century, on North America in the 17th through 19th centuries, on India in the 18th and 19th centuries, on China in the mid-19th century, and on Africa in the late 19th century, with the major rebellions generally coming hard on the heels of the end of the conquests. The effects varied as much as the timing. In the Americas, invaders visited unspeakable horrors on the natives. And, it should be said, the natives repaid them in kind when they could. But, as we heard earlier in this chapter, the great killer was disease. If, as I think we should, we count the victims of pestilence and famine among the war dead, the figures are shocking. Between 1500 and 1650, the native population of the New World fell by half. Those historians who call the conquest an American Holocaust have a point. In South Asia, the East India Company's conquests from the 1740s onward must have killed hundreds of thousands of natives, usually for minimal losses on the European side. Out of a population that started this period around 175 million and steadily grew, however, all the shooting and sabering can only have added a fraction of 1% to the death rate. One historian has claimed that the British massacred some 10 million people after the 1857 mutiny, or one Indian in 25, but although the reprisals were savage enough to shock many Britons, almost all experts put the true figure almost an order of magnitude lower. A death toll running into the hundreds of thousands remains appalling, but even at their worst, the British killed less than one Indian in 250. As in the European conquest of the Americas, the biggest killer was not direct violence, but its consequences, which in India meant famine more often than disease. Between the Great Bengal Famine of 1769-70 to and the All India Famine of 1899-1900, to a horrifying 30 to 50 million Indians starved. Roughly a billion people lived in India across these 130 years, and so one in 20 or one in 30 people died from war-related famines, if, that is, this horror should be laid entirely at the British door. Bad weather, particularly El Nino events, was the immediate cause of most of these disasters, but some historians argue that a combination of the disruption caused by conquest and the callousness and or stupidity of the conquerors turned unavoidable climate-driven crises into entirely avoidable human catastrophes. The blame game has been ugly ever since it began in the 1850s, but even the most anti-European critic would have to concede that the conquest of India was much less lethal than that of America. In China, the pattern was different again. European, and to a lesser degree Japanese, invasions between the 1840s and the 1890s killed hundreds of thousands. About 750 million people lived in China across this half-century, meaning that the wars directly killed roughly one person in a thousand. But here the biggest death toll began when the Qing dynasty fell apart, and rebels rose up all over China. These civil wars took tens of millions of lives. China's population fell by 10% between 1840 and 1870, with violence and its train of starvation and disease causing most of this loss. To complete this catalogue of horrors, we should note the huge variations between the experiences of different parts of Africa. In some places, Europeans met almost no resistance and had minimal impact on the people they supposedly ruled. The vast French holdings in West Africa, for instance, were something of a virtual empire, in which virtually no officials administered virtually no subjects in the virtually empty wastes of the Sahara Desert. But in other places the story was gruesome. The extreme case was the Congo Basin, seized by Belgium in 1884. 
Here, a brutal system of punishing natives for not delivering rubber quotas might have cut the population in half by 1908, mostly through starvation and disease. No one can deny that the 500 years war made the world more dangerous for the people being conquered. Europeans, like ancient Romans, regularly created wastelands. But, again like the Romans, the legacy of war was peace. In most cases, once the gun smoke had cleared, shattered institutions had been rebuilt and new antibodies had evolved, the conquered found themselves ruled by powerful new leviathans that aggressively suppressed violence, much as Dravot and Carnahan did in Kafiristan. To many Westerners, this civilizing mission made imperialism a moral cause. Take up the white man's burden, Kipling urged the United States in 1899. Send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives' need. Take up the white man's burden, in patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride, by open speech and simple, and hundred times made plain, to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Within days of its publication, the poem was inspiring parodies. Pile on the brown man's burden, went one, to gratify your greed. Go clear away the niggers, who progress would impede. And it is hard to read Kipling's words today without squirming. Yet he was far from alone in seeing the world this way. Thousands of official memos deposited in dusty or mildewed district offices from Mauritania to Malaya record the earnestness with which functionaries at every level threw themselves into veiling the threat of terror and checking the show of pride. These petty principalities are enjoying the full measure of British protection and are in a state of the most profound tranquility, wrote one Lieutenant Murray in an 1824 report looking back on ten years of pacification in Nepal. Murder is seldom committed and robbery unknown, and several Rajas are content and their subjects receiving all the blessings of a mild and happy rule. The cultivation has improved in a fourfold degree, and the mountains are clad in stepped verdure to the base. But did Murray, or Kipling, know what he was talking about? Or were both men simply lying to justify an empire from which they profited at the subject's expense? Answering this question is difficult, not least because of the sheer variety of places in the 19th century world system. In Australia, where Europeans almost annihilated the natives, or Ascension Island, uninhabited by any vertebrate before the British arrived, pacification was a very different business from, say, in Indochina, where a few thousand Frenchmen parachuted into the middle of thirty million natives. And even within a single region, it could be hard to tell what was going on. As usual, India is the best known and most controversial case. Here the East India Company, focused on maximizing profits, threw itself into pacification. The same Mughal breakdown that had given the company its opening in the 1740s had also filled the subcontinent with warring princes, and although reliable statistics are once again sorely lacking, all the evidence suggests that rates of violent death had leapt up as law and order broke down. The squabbling nawabs and sultans had hired thousands of irregular cavalry to fight each other, and, thrown out of work, many of them turned into bandits, terrorizing the peasantry. Eighteenth-century India's roads were infested with highwaymen, some said to be thuggies, members of a cult devoted to strangling travelers in honor of the goddess Kali, and the countryside was awash with guns. Like any competent stationary bandit, the company cracked down on these roving bandits. But, like all too many stationary bandits, the company's activities were so violent and profitable that observers often wondered whether the cure was not worse than the disease. Heaps of rupees, sacks of diamonds, Indians tortured to disclose their treasure, one London pamphleteer lamented, cities, towns, and villages ransacked and destroyed, Jagirs and provinces purloined, Nabobs dethroned and murdered, have found the delights and constituted the religions of the directors and their servants. 
Already in 1773, the British government tried to regulate the company into being a better stationary bandit. The company's officers shall not accept, receive, or take directly from any of the Indian princes or powers, or their ministers or agents, or any of the natives of Asia, any present gift, donation, opportunity, or reward, Parliament ruled. The men on the ground, however, took little notice until, in 1786, Parliament decided on its own crackdown. It impeached Warren Hastings, the company's governor, charging him with high crimes and misdemeanours, basically with making a wasteland. Edmund Burke led the charge, for all the world like Cicero come again to bring down the modern-day equivalent of the venal Roman governor, Verres. I impeach him in the name of the English nation, he thundered, whose ancient honour he has sullied. I impeach him in the name of the people of India, whose rights he has trodden underfoot, and whose country he has turned into a desert. Lastly, in the name of human nature itself, in the name of both sexes, in the name of every age, in the name of every rank, I impeach the common enemy of all. And that was just Burke's opening statement. The trial went on, with one lurid revelation after another, for seven shameful years. In the end, despite an ocean of evidence, the House of Lords acquitted Hastings, but it was no victory for the company. Britain had had enough of this kind of pacification. Parliament passed another India Act, taking over the right to appoint governor-generals and setting the stage for the rise of the famously incorruptible Indian civil service. The Parliament in London, like Leviathans in every age, remained more interested in lowering its administrative costs than in creating open access order among its subjects. In one notorious case, begun in 1808, the judge who prosecuted a particularly vicious English settler for beating and starving an Indian servant to death seemed less worried that the defendant's actions were injurious to the peace and happiness of our native subjects than that he had defied my authority and conducted himself in a manner highly disrespectful to the court. But whatever their motives, judges sent out from Britain did gradually roll back the company's rough-and-ready martial law and reduce the violence of Indian life. The most visible consequence was a blanket ban on the Hindu ritual of sati, in which a widow would throw herself onto her husband's funeral pyre. Several Mughal emperors had legislated against sati, in all lands under Mughal control, never again should officials allow a woman to be burned, Aurangzeb had ruled in 1663, with some success, but the British blanket ban of 1829 more or less eradicated it. Documents written by educated Indians in the 18th and 19th centuries have little to say about rates of violent death, but a remarkable number of their authors seem to have concluded that the British Empire was, on balance, no bad thing. The extraordinary Calcutta-based scholar Ramahan Roy, for instance, embraced British liberalism, education, and law, and joined the British crusade against Satie. Roy did not hesitate to criticize the Europeans. He rebuked the British in 1823 for being slow to teach the useful sciences to Bengalis, and had a smart put-down for a bishop of Calcutta who mistakenly congratulated him on converting from Hinduism to Christianity. My lord, Roy said, I did not abandon one superstition merely to take up another. But when all was said and done, Roy thought that the ideal outcome for India would be to remain within the British Empire, in a position like Canada's. India, in a like manner as the Canadians, he wrote in 1832, will feel no disposition to cut off its connection with England, which may be preserved with so much mutual benefit to both countries. Other Indians, such as the members of the Young Bengal movement, who shocked their elders in the 1830s by championing Tom Paine over Hindu scriptures, went much further in their admiration of all things Anglo. But their opinions, just like Roy's and Lieutenant Murray's, remain mere impressions. Until social historians do the kind of painstaking archival work that vindicated Elias's claims about Europeans becoming less violent, or until physical anthropologists catalogue much more skeletal evidence of violent trauma, 
we have to continue to rely on qualitative evidence, just as we do in studying ancient times. But even so, the weight of the documentation does seem to be overwhelming. Despite their smugness, Kipling and Murray really were onto something. Once the conquests died down and the rebellions were suppressed, European empires generally drove down rates of violent death. That said, the colonies and frontiers always remained rougher than Europe's imperial heartland. By 1900, homicide was taking the life of only one Western European in 1600, but one American in every 200 was still dying violently at that point. And even within the white settler colonies, there were stark differences between the urban cores and the wilder peripheries. Murder was no more common in New England than in Old England, but parts of the West and the South were ten times as dangerous. According to one story, a Southerner, quizzed about this by a Yankee, replied that he reckoned there were just more folks in the South who needed killing. The likelihood of being killed in war fell almost as fast as the chance of being murdered. When we throw in all the battles, sieges and feuds, about one Western European in twenty was dying violently around 1415, but between 1815 and 1914 Europeans fought few major wars. The muddy, bloody Crimean War of 1853-56 to killed 300,000. The Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71 to another 400,000 or more, and the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78 to a further half million. This was a lot of slaughter, and yet, even after adding in every single war, less than one European in fifty, and probably closer to one in a hundred, can have died in conflict between 1815 and 1914. Wars within and between white settler colonies, as opposed to wars they waged against non-whites, were almost as rare. In the Americas, the horrific War of the Triple Alliance between 1864 and 1870, in which Argentina, Brazil and Uruguay blocked Paraguayan expansion, claimed about half a million lives, and the American Civil War, 1861-65, to 65, took closer to three quarters of a million. In Africa, the Second Boer War, 1899-1902, to 1902, killed at least 60,000. Overall, Europeans who settled overseas were more likely to die violently than those who stayed home, but not much more so. The Five Hundred Years' War was far bigger than the wars that built the ancient empires. Mass armies with iron weapons had allowed the Romans, Han, Parthians and Mauryans to project power on a subcontinental scale, but ocean-going ships, guns and steam power extended Europeans' reach across the entire planet. Ancient wars produced societies tens of millions strong, with rates of violent death, I suggested, in the 2 to 5 percent range, but the 500 years' war produced societies hundreds of millions strong, with rates of violent death in the European core in the 1 to 3 percent range. Rates were slightly higher in the American and Australasian white settler colonies, and those in direct rule colonies higher still. Patchy data, lack of scholarly study, and the sheer variety of places involved, ranging from hells on earth such as the Congo through Margaret Mead's Samoa to sleepy outposts in Nepal, combine to make meaningful estimates of rates of violent death in the 19th century empires almost impossible. This means that the number I offer somewhere between 2.5 and 7.5 percent, is perhaps the most speculative in this whole book. It simply means that on average, 19th century direct rule colonies in Africa, Asia and Oceania were more violent than the ancient empires, but less violent than Eurasia in the Age of Migrations. One day, archival research and skeletal studies will allow us to make much better estimates, but we are not there yet. What Calgacus said about Rome's wars of conquest was just as true of Europe's. Both made wastelands. But on the other hand, what Cicero said about Rome's empire was also true of Europe's. Both eventually drew their subjects into larger economic systems, which in most cases made them better off. 
It is hard to argue with the economist Dara Nasimoglu and the political scientist James Robinson when they say in their influential recent book, Why Nations Fail, that the profitability of European colonial empires was often built on the destruction of independent polities and indigenous economies. And yet, this was what economists like to call creative destruction. As new economic systems replaced old ones, income and productivity rose all over the world after 1870. There were certainly exceptions, the Congo again springs to mind, and the bulk of the gains did flow to the rulers of the new world system. But as the 19th century drew to a close, the rising tide of the 500 years' war was lifting all the boats, making the world richer than ever as well as safer. So it was that in August 1898, Nicholas II, Tsar of all the Russias, drew what seemed to be the obvious conclusion and ordered his foreign minister to make an unprecedented announcement to the dignitaries who danced attendance on his court. The preservation of a general peace and a possible reduction in the excessive armaments that now burden every nation, it said, are ideals toward which all governments should strive. Nicholas therefore proposed an international conference, a happy overture to the century ahead, to discuss the end of war and mass disarmament. General delight ensued. Baroness Bertha von Suttner, author of the international bestseller Lay Down Your Arms, one of Tolstoy's favourites, and soon to become the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize, called Nicholas a new star in the cultural heavens. And in 1899, on the Tsar's birthday, in fact, 130 diplomats convened at a sylvan chateau near The Hague in the doggedly neutral Netherlands to work everything out. After two months of dining, dancing, and decreeing, they emerged with a string of agreements, if not to end war, then at least to limit its barbarity. They agreed, enthusiastically, that another meeting was called for. This duly convened in 1907 at the same delightful spot, and such was its success that everyone made firm plans to gather there again in 1914. 5. Storm of Steel The War for Europe, 1914-1980 to Cosmos into Chaos the Daily Mail has never been the mouthpiece of Britain's chattering classes. Produced by office boys for office boys, one Prime Minister acidly remarked around 1900. But a century ago it was the country's best-selling broadsheet, and Norman Angel, its Paris editor, was a man accustomed to being listened to. Even he, though, was astonished at the success of his book The Great Illusion when it appeared in 1910. Angel was a character. After abandoning an expensive Swiss boarding school at 17, he had run off to California, where he tried his luck at pig farming, ditch digging, cattle ranching, and mail carrying. But then he drifted back to Europe, and now, approaching respectable middle age, he turned more Kantian than Kant himself. Updating perpetual peace for the 20th century, he asked, What is the real guarantee of good behavior of one state to another? His answer? It is the elaborate interdependence which, not only in the economic sense, but in every sense, makes an unwarrantable aggression of one state upon another react upon the interests of the aggressor. War, he concluded, had put itself out of business. The day for progress by force has passed, he pronounced. From now on, it will be progress by ideas or not at all. Angel joined the long list of prophets with terrible timing. In 1914, the same politicians who had praised his book and attended the Hague peace conferences set off World War I, and over the next four years they killed 15 million people. The civil wars that dragged on for another four years killed another 20 million, and between 1939 and 1945, the greatest war of all killed 50 to 100 million more. Angel was perhaps the worst prophet ever. But then again... If Angel could have come back a century after he wrote, he might have claimed to be the best prophet of all time. In 2010, the planet was more peaceful and prosperous than ever before. 
the risk of violent death had fallen well below one in a hundred, in Western Europe below one in three thousand. People typically lived twice as long, ate well enough to grow four inches taller, and earned four times as much as their great-grandparents had in 1910. The 20th century was the best of times, and it was the worst of times, what the great historian Eric Hobsbawm called an age of extremes, combining the bloodiest war ever fought with the greatest peace ever known. Angel went on writing books for another forty years after The Great Illusion came out, but never really did explain this paradox. The easiest way out of the conundrum, which Angel sometimes took, was to insist that the big story was that the world really was going the way he and Kant had said, but that bad luck had intervened. Given the way the First World War began, in an absolute avalanche of bad luck, this seemed rather reasonable. If Austria's Archduke Franz Ferdinand had just decided not to go to Sarajevo on June 28, 1914, he would not have been murdered. Austria would not have declared war on Serbia, and Russia, Germany, France, and Britain would have stayed at peace too. Or if the head of Austrian security that day had not published the Archduke's route through Sarajevo in advance, let him ride in an open-topped car going at ten miles an hour, and refused to have any of the 70,000 troops on manoeuvres nearby serve as security details because their uniforms would be dirty, the terrorist plot would surely have failed. If the security chief had not then forgotten to tell the drivers of the first two cars in the Archduke's convoy about a change in the route, if he had not stopped them and had the whole convoy back up, so that it was moving even slower as it passed the assassin Gavrilo Princip, if he had put the Archduke's bodyguard on the side of the car facing the crowd, rather than the side facing the empty road, if another Serb had not attacked the policeman who grabbed Princip's hand as he pulled his revolver, if any of these things had gone differently, there would have been no July crisis. The guns of August would not have fired, and come December, a million young men would still have been alive. Accident has a lot to answer for. When the war was over, the politicians who had led their people into it embraced this argument, rushing to reassure readers that the catastrophe had not been their fault. The nations in 1914 slithered over the brink into the boiling cauldron of war without any trace of apprehension or dismay, Britain's wartime Prime Minister David Lloyd George claimed in his memoirs. Going one better, Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty in 1914, suggested that the war had been a force of nature, beyond anyone's control. One must think of the intercourse of nations in those days, he wrote in 1922, as prodigious organizations of forces active or latent which, like planetary bodies, could not approach each other in space without giving rise to profound magnetic reactions. If they got too near, the lightnings would begin to flash and beyond a certain point they might be attracted altogether from the orbits in which they were restrained and plunge cosmos into chaos. And yet the letters, diaries, and cabinet minutes that politicians actually wrote during the doomed summer of 1914 reveal something entirely different. Europe's leaders were not slithering, sliding, or suffering from magnetic attraction. In reality, they coldly, calmly, and with all due calculation, considered the risks, and, one after another, concluded that war was their best option. Even after it was clear what the costs of war would be, more countries kept coming in. Turkey late in 1914, Italy and Bulgaria in 1915, Romania in 1916, and the United States in 1917. And in 1939, with no illusions left at all, the politicians condemned tens of millions more to death. Should we conclude that all these politicians, with all their years of education and experience, were in fact fools, so blinded by irrational fears and hatreds that they could not see where their people's best interests lay? Judging from the number of books with titles like The March of Folly, many historians would answer yes. But this is superficial. The twentieth century's leaders were neither wiser nor more foolish than those of other ages, neither more nor less predisposed to think that force would solve their problems than the men we met in chapters 1 to 4. 
The reason that the last century combined such violence with such peace and prosperity was that the legacy of the five hundred years' war was more complicated than Angel, and many writers since his time, realized. Unknown Unknowns When constabulary duties to be done, to be done, the chorus sings in Gilbert and Sullivan's comic opera The Pirates of Penzance, a policeman's lot is not an happy one. Audiences hooted with laughter when the show first went on stage in 1879, but the masters of the world system were perhaps not amused. For two generations, Britain had, usually, been willing and able to play Globocop, because, as late as 1860, it was the only truly industrialized economy on earth. British factories turned out better, cheaper goods than anyone else's, and so long as the seas were safe for free trade, these could always find buyers. Britons could then use their profits to purchase food wherever it was best and cheapest, and the farmers selling the food could use the profits from these sales to buy more British goods, allowing the British to buy more food, and so on. Britain had the money to play Globocop, and needed to play Globocop to keep making money. Everyone involved prospered, but Britain prospered most of all. Its gross domestic product, GDP, almost tripled between 1820 and 1870, increasing from 5% to 9% of the world's total. Today it is 3%. Ships and bases to keep the sea lanes open cost money, but the British economy grew so fast that they seemed like a bargain, costing just sixpence out of every pound of wealth being produced, less than 3% of GDP. By the 1870s, though, Britain was finding constabulary duty less happy, not because it was doing it badly, but because it was doing it too well. As British profits accumulated, the same free trade that allowed Britain to prosper also allowed the country's capitalists to invest their surplus wealth wherever it promised to bring the highest returns, which, much of the time, meant financing industrial revolutions in other countries. Relying heavily on British loans, often using British money to buy British machines that could produce goods that would compete with British exports, a string of countries industrialized after 1870. That Britain's ancient rival France would go this way surprised no one, but civil wars in the United States, 1861-65, to 65, and Japan, 1864-68, to 68, and wars of unification in Germany, 1864-71, to 71, also produced centralized governments that aggressively pursued industrialization. In 1880, Britain still accounted for 23% of the world's manufacturing and trade, but by 1913, this had fallen to 14%. In purely economic terms, this was in fact good for Britain, because as the world industrialized, the pie got bigger. 14% of the world's manufacturing and trade in 1913 added up to a lot more than 23% in 1870. Further, Britain was moving up the value chain. It had shifted from agriculture toward more profitable industries after the 1780s, and in the 1870s it shifted again, abandoning investment in industry for greater profits from services, particularly banking, shipping, insurance and foreign loans. Britain's GDP more than doubled between 1870 and 1913, and with all this extra wealth, Britain and other industrialising nations could afford to expand its open access order aggressively. Germany led the way, introducing health insurance and old age pensions for workers in the 1880s, and by 1913 most industrialised nations had followed. Free primary education, universal male suffrage, and eventually votes for women became the norm. Strategically, though, the economic triumph was a disaster for Britain, because its strategy, much like the strategies of the ancient empires 17 centuries earlier, had overshot its culminating point. The United States' economy outgrew Britain's in 1872, and in 1901 so did Germany's. Every newly wealthy government now built a modern fleet to project its power and prestige. Britain stayed in front, more than quadrupling the size and firepower of its navy between 1880 and 1914, but its share of global gunnery nonetheless declined. The Globo Cop could take on any plausible combination of enemies, 
but could no longer intimidate everyone at once. If Britain was the world's policeman, we might think of the new industrial giants as being rather like urban gangs. The global cop, like any cop, had to decide whether to confront these rivals, cut deals with them, or do some combination of the two. Britain could wage trade wars on its rivals, wage shooting wars on them, or make concessions. The first two options threatened to ruin the free trade that made Britain rich. The third, to strengthen the rivals so much that Britain would no longer be able to play Globocop. Matters came to a head first with the United States. The 1823 Monroe Doctrine had in theory banned European meddling in American waters, but in the 1860s the prospect of the Royal Navy intervening in the Civil War remained Abraham Lincoln's worst nightmare. By the 1890s, though, it was clear to all that Britain was no longer strong enough to project power into the Western Atlantic while also meeting its other obligations. Facing facts, London initiated a great rapprochement with Washington. The Globocop effectively took on a deputy, giving it its own beat. Britain retreated even further in eastern waters. Japan was the only non-Western country that had succeeded in responding to the European onslaught by industrializing itself, and in the 1890s it was without doubt the greatest power in Northeast Asia. Its fleet was not yet one of the world's top half-dozen, but given the distance separating Britain from the Western Pacific, London concluded in 1902 that the only way to maintain some influence on the far side of the globe was a formal naval agreement, the first in Britain's history with Japan. Exactly a hundred years later, the U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld would tell journalists, there are known unknowns, that is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know. So long as the 19th century had a single, stable Globocop, strategic problems were mostly known unknowns. When the Russians threatened Constantinople in 1853, or the Indians mutinied in 1857, or the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter in 1861, they did not know what the Globocop would do to protect the world system, but they did know it would do something. By the 1870s, however, unknown unknowns were multiplying. It became harder to predict whether the Globocop would do anything at all. Uncertainty increased, and few could foresee the consequences of their actions. British strategists knew this, but, given the grim alternatives, they kept taking on deputies. Their next deal, an entente cordiale agreed on in 1904, entrusted the Mediterranean to France so that Britain could concentrate on the biggest unknown unknown of all, Germany. What made Germany so unknowable was its geography. In the same year that Britain cut its deal with France, Halford Mackinder, geographer, explorer, and the first director of the London School of Economics, gave an extraordinary public lecture. 20th century history, he announced, would be driven by the balance between three vast regions. At the centre of the story was what he called the heartland, the pivot region of the world's politics, that vast area of Euro-Asia which is inaccessible to ships, but in antiquity lay open to the horse-riding nomads. Until the 15th century, Mackinder explained, raiders from the steppe heartland had dominated the rich civilizations of China, India, the Middle East, and Europe, which he called the Inner Rim. Beyond this Inner Rim, he also identified an Outer Rim, which counted for little, until, after 1500, European ships drew this huge region together. By the 18th century, Outer Rim powers were projecting force into the Inner Rim, contesting the heartland's control of it, and in the 19th, the Outer Rim's strength was so great that it penetrated into the heartland itself. British troops were marching into Tibet even as Mackinder delivered his lecture. Control of the Outer Rim's seas delivered domination of both the Inner Rim and the heartland, and therefore the world. British politicians did not like sharing the Outer Rim with the United States, Japan and France, but they gambled that they could strike deals with like-minded men who faced Outer Rim problems much like Britain's own. Germany, though, was a different matter. It belonged to the Inner Rim, which gave it direct access to the heartland. 
seen from London, a strong, united, industrialized Germany, looked like the kind of place that might turn the heartland's resources against the outer rim. If Germany were to ally herself with Russia, Mackinder worried, it would permit of the use of vast continental resources for fleet building, and the empire of the world would then be in sight. Seen from St. Petersburg, however, the other side of the same coin seemed more urgent, the danger that Germany might get the upper hand against France and Britain and then turn the Outer Rim's resources against the heartland. The real risk was not of Germany's allying with Russia, it was of Germany's conquering Russia. Napoleon had tried this, but reaching all the way from the Outer Rim to Moscow had been too much for him. Germany, however, might find the reach from the Inner Rim more manageable. Politicians in Berlin saw a third dimension. To them, the big danger was not that Germany would exploit the Outer Rim or the Heartland. It was that the Outer Rim and the Heartland would combine to crush Germany between them, which had almost happened several times since the 18th century. That, German leaders concluded, had to be prevented at all costs. And this simple strategic fact largely explains 20th century Germany's tragic history. The three visions of where Germany fit into the world pointed toward very different ways of arranging European politics, but initially the Germans had things their own way. They owed much of this success to Otto von Bismarck, arguably the least scrupulous but most clear-sighted diplomat of the 19th century. Bismarck saw that Germans needed to be violent in the 1860s. Short, sharp wars against Denmark, Austria and France turned the muddle of weak German principalities into the strongest national state in the Inner Rim. But having won these wars, Bismarck saw that in the 1870s, Germans needed to renounce violence. The best way to escape being squeezed between the heartland and the outer rim was to keep everyone else off balance, which meant making and breaking alliances in Eastern and Central Europe, placating Britain and isolating France. Bismarck kept all these balls in the air into the 1880s, but the proliferation of unknown unknowns as Britain's position deteriorated made such subtle juggling increasingly difficult. In 1890, a young new Kaiser fired his aged Chancellor and began wondering, as did heads of state everywhere, whether force might not, after all, be the best solution to the problems his nation faced in this uncertain world. He ordered his generals to plan preemptive wars, just in case, and German politicians played on the risk of war to distract voters' attention from the class conflicts at home caused by rapid industrialization. Bosses and workers might hate each other, but so long as both hated foreigners more, all might yet be well. Germany's leaders found themselves taking chances that would have seemed insane in Bismarck's day because the alternatives looked worse. Grabbing African colonies and building battleships were bound to provoke Britain, but not grabbing and building appeared to be the path to encirclement. At best, that might mean Germany's rivals could shut it out of overseas markets. At worst, it might mean war on two fronts. Germany had to do everything it could to break the circle, and yet everything it did just seemed to push its enemies closer together. With unknown unknowns multiplying, and rumours of war weighing on all minds, continental powers bought more weapons, conscripted more of their young men, and kept them under arms longer, even though that threatened to turn the rumours into reality. By 1912, the Kaiser and his advisers felt that drastic measures were the only options left. Sometimes they talked about forging a United States of Europe, dominated, of course, by Germany, at other times, as a Viennese newspaper put it on Christmas Day 1913, they envisioned a Central European Customs Union that the Western states would sooner or later join, like it or not. This would create an economic union that would be equal or perhaps even superior to America. In London or Washington, this sounded like fighting talk. None of this made war inevitable in 1914, Franz Ferdinand could easily have survived June the 28th. Calmer heads could easily have prevailed in the weeks that followed. Most people, in fact, thought calmer heads had prevailed. Investors in the bond markets showed little anxiety until late July, 
and politicians and generals went ahead with their summer vacations. With just slightly better luck, the abiding memory of 1914 would have been its fine weather, not its killing fields. But what would have happened then? Avoiding war in 1914 would not have revived the Globocop, because the continuing spread of industrial revolutions around the world, caused by the Globocop's success, would have made its position steadily less tenable. Unknown unknowns would have kept on multiplying. New crises would have followed the crisis of 1914, just as the Balkan crisis of 1914 had itself followed Moroccan crises in 1905 and 1911, and another Balkan crisis in 1912-13. Had every diplomat in 20th century Europe been a Bismarck born again, perhaps they could have carried on diffusing emergencies indefinitely, but this was the real world, and its diplomats were, on average, no better and no worse than those of earlier ages. Every crisis was, in effect, a roll of the dice, and sooner or later, if not in the 1910s, then surely in the 1920s, some king or minister was going to conclude that war was, after all, the least bad solution to whatever problems were pressing on him. And so, a month after Princip shot Franz Ferdinand, the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war on Serbia, banking on the Kaiser's assurance that he had considered the question of Russian intervention and accepted the risk of a general war. After all, the German Chancellor mused, the alternative was self-castration. A week later, most of Europe was on the march. There was no slithering over brinks, no planets spinning from their orbits. It was just a world in which the Globocop had lost its grip. The Storm Breaks The general aim of the war, said a document drafted for the German Chancellor a month into the fighting, is security for the German Reich in West and East for all imaginable time. To achieve that, France must be so weakened as to make her revival as a great power impossible for all time, and Russia must be thrust back as far as possible from Germany's eastern frontier, and her domination over the non-Russian vassal peoples broken. Annexations would follow in Belgium and France, former Russian provinces would become German satellites, and British goods would be shut out of French markets. The goal was a counterproductive war, breaking the larger alliance that encircled Germany and dealing the Globocop a terrible, perhaps fatal, blow. Whether Germany went to war with this plan in mind or only formulated it in reaction to the terrible casualties of the first few weeks of fighting remains unclear, but either way, the Germans were taking gigantic, terrifying risks. Bismarck's worst-case scenario came to pass in 1914, exposing Germany to the full weight of the heartland and the outer rim, and the German general staff concluded that their one hope was to exploit their central position and industrial organization to knock France out of the war before Russia could mobilize. Pulling off an administrative masterstroke, German bureaucrats commandeered 8,000 trains and rushed 1.6 million men and half a million horses to the western frontier. From there they swept through neutral Belgium, marching and fighting without rest. By September the 7th, the vanguard was across the Marne River, just 20 miles from Paris. On the map, it looked as if the war were almost won, with the French army being enveloped and forced away from its capital, but Helmut von Moltke, the German chief of staff, was about to discover how modern warfare really worked. His 20th century Leviathan had called up a million-man army, which was now spread across a hundred miles, but he only had 19th century ways of communicating with it. Radios were rare and unreliable, telephones were worse, and there were virtually no spotter planes. Moltke had no idea what was actually happening in September 1914. Reports took days to reach him. One would say the French were collapsing, the next that they were counter-attacking. With no other way to find out what was going on, Moltke put a staff officer into a car and sent him to the front. If the pessimistic Lieutenant Colonel Hench had crashed into a tree somewhere on his journey of the 8th of September, another German officer later lamented, or if he had been shot by a French straggler, 
we would have had a ceasefire two weeks later and thereafter would have received a peace in which we could have asked for everything. But Hench did reach the front, and, horrified by the risks the men on the ground were taking, prevailed on them to order a retreat. Despite a century of hindsight, we are no better placed today than Moltke was in 1914 to know whether Hench snatched defeat from the jaws of victory or saved the Germans from catastrophe. But to men who thought triumph was within their grasp, the decision to retreat was devastating. It came like a bolt of thunder, said the commander of the 133rd Reserve Infantry Regiment. I saw many men cry. The tears rolled down their cheeks. Others simply expressed amazement. Moltke had a nervous breakdown. Germany's great gamble had not paid off, and it had no plan B. However, the alliance opposing it was little better off. Its own plan A had been, just as the Germans expected, to crush Germany between simultaneous attacks from France and Russia. But by October the Russians had suffered a string of defeats, and the French were lucky still to be in the war. The Anglo-French-Russian alliance did have a plan B, in which Britain's huge fleet would bottle up Germany's battleships in their harbours, impose a naval blockade, and snap up the enemy's overseas colonies. With the exception of East Africa, where an extraordinary German colonel was still waging guerrilla war when hostilities in Europe had ended, all this went smoothly. But unfortunately, Plan B could only produce victory very slowly, by starving Germany's people and industry. Churchill, in charge at the Admiralty, pushed for a more decisive use of naval supremacy. The admirals had rejected an invasion of northern Germany as too risky, but Churchill insisted that amphibious operations could instead split open the Central Power's soft underbelly. A landing at Salonica, ignoring the detail that Greece was neutral, got nowhere. Another in Iraq led to a humiliating surrender, and a third, at Gallipoli, was such a disaster that it almost ended Churchill's career. By 1915, even the most determined navalists recognized that the war would be won or lost on land. But how to do that? There is a saying that generals always refight the last war, but initially Europe's military men were even further behind the times. The Boer and Russo-Japanese wars had shown that armies could not survive in the open against modern firepower, and as long ago as the 1860s, the last stages of the American Civil War had revealed that troops who dug trenches were almost immovable. Yet in 1914, the armies massed their men, unfurled their flags, and charged, much as they had in Napoleon's day. Offensive à outrance was their motto, attack to excess. Just three weeks into the war, a young French lieutenant named Charles de Gaulle was shot leading one such charge in Belgium. The enemy's fire was precise and concentrated, he later wrote. Second by second, the hail of bullets and the thunder of shells grew stronger. Those who survived lay flat on the ground, amid the screaming wounded and the humble corpses. With affected calm, the officers let themselves be killed standing upright, but all to no purpose. In an instant, it had become clear that not all the courage in the world could withstand this fire. Ernst Junger, who served Germany with much the same reckless bravery that de Gaulle displayed for France, coined the perfect label for this as the title of his war memoirs, to my mind the finest ever written, Storm of Steel. After the war, it became a commonplace that the de Gaulle's and Jungers had been lions led by donkeys, heroes sent to their deaths by champagne-swilling buffoons who knew little and cared less about the horrors at the front. In reality, though, leaders learned from their mistakes just as quickly as those of earlier ages and rapidly modified their methods. In France, it was obvious by October 1914 that with millions of men crammed into a 300-mile front, continuous lines of trenches from Switzerland to the North Sea were perfectly possible, and once both sides had dug trenches, the overriding question became how to break through them. At first, the answer seemed obvious. Breaking through the enemy's lines, the British commander concluded in January 1915, is largely a question of expenditure of high explosive ammunition. If sufficient ammunition is forthcoming, a way can be blasted through the line. 
If the attempt fails, either more guns must be brought up or the allowance of ammunition per gun must be increased. This put the emphasis on the home front. He who channeled his economy most efficiently into churning out guns and shells, it appeared, would win the day. In every country, production soared as governments took over everything from munitions and transport to food and wages. Women had to be lured out of the home and into fields and factories to replace the men drafted into the armies. Food had to be rationed and distributed. Production had to be rationalized to give the armies just enough of everything they needed. All this meant more bureaucrats, more taxes, and more regulation. Leviathans exploded. But despite it all, neither side could make a decisive breakthrough. Once again, the Red Queen pattern seemed to be at work. The army's offensive powers improved dramatically. Millions of shells were manufactured, tens of millions of horses were coaxed and beaten to drag them to the front. Germany alone lost a million horses during the war, more to exhaustion and starvation than to enemy fire. And artillerymen became more sophisticated, mixing short, intense barrages with long, sustained ones, and firing creeping barrages that moved forward just ahead of advancing infantry. But for every improvement attackers made, defenders found a response. They dug multiple lines of trenches, four or five miles deep. They manned the forward positions lightly, rotating troops in and out of the line to keep them fresh. Most men stayed back out of artillery range, letting the enemy capture the front lines and counter-attacking when the assault outran its artillery cover. The real issue, generals realized as early as 1915, was that Moltke's problem went all the way down. Once battle was joined, commanders could not control their armies. If their men did overrun enemy defenses, hours might pass before headquarters heard about it, and the opportunity to commit fresh reserves and exploit the opening would be lost. Generals were like men without eyes, without ears and without voices, the historian John Keegan observed. In this age of science, both sides turned to technology for ways to beat the Red Queen. Germany led the way, using tear gas in Poland in January 1915. It was not a success. The day was so cold that the gas froze. But when they tried chlorine gas on the Western Front three months later, the results were dramatic. A light breeze carried the poisonous green clouds into trenches full of unsuspecting French and African troops. Chlorine is a nasty way to kill. It burns the lungs, stimulating them to overproduce fluids. Gassed men drown. Although the gas killed only about 200 men, a mere handful by the bloody standards of World War I, thousands more ran away like a flock of sheep, a German officer observed. The route left a gap nearly five miles wide, but unfortunately for the Germans, their own troops were nearly as surprised as the enemy's and failed to push through the opening. By the second day of the attack, all surprise was lost, and because chlorine is soluble, the Canadians who plugged the gap in the line could neutralize it by just tying wet rags over their faces. Gas pervades popular memories of World War I. If you could hear, wrote Wilfred Owen, at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. But to armies that expected it, it was more a nuisance than a game-changer. Less than one in eighty of the war dead died from gassing, and only one war pension in a hundred was gas-related. Britain tried a different technological fix, tanks. H. G. Wells had written a short story titled The Land Ironclads back in 1903, and engineers were already discussing armoured tracked vehicles by December 1914. The internal combustion engine was still in its infancy, and the technical challenges of moving several tons of steel over trenches and shell holes were enormous, but by September 1916 almost 50 tanks were ready to fight. Thirteen of them broke down before the battle began, but the Germans fled at the mere sight of the others, which advanced two miles before they, too, broke down. In late 1917, Britain massed 324 tanks on a five-mile front at Cambrai and pushed forward four miles, a massive advance for World War I, B. 
before they got stuck. British church bells were rung in celebration, but the German line held. Other innovations were less spectacular, but arguably more important. When the war started, artillerymen often had little patience with technicians who wanted to bring too much science to their craft. My boy, this is war, this is practical stuff, one subaltern remembered being told. Forget all that nonsense they taught you at the shop. If it's cold, cock her up a bit. By 1917, though, fire control had improved by an order of magnitude, much of it owed to the war's other great technical advance, aviation. There had been no aircraft at all until 1903, and none was used in war until 1911. But by 1918, 2,000 planes were buzzing above the Western Front, correcting artillery fire, attacking enemy infantry, and even shooting each other down. Yet still the great breakthrough did not come. Despairing, in 1916 generals resorted to making the body count an end in itself. When the Germans attacked at Verdun in February, instead of trying to break through, they aimed to bleed the French white. 700,000 men died in a few square miles of mud over the next nine months. Nor did the British really expect to break through when they attacked along the Somme River that July. Their aim was just to distract the Germans from Verdun. By lunchtime on the first day, 20,000 Britons had been killed, and over the next four months another 300,000 followed them. Germany generally had the better of this war of attrition, killing more men than it lost and doing it more cost-effectively. By one gruesome calculation, Britain, France, Russia and, eventually, the United States spent $36,485.48 for every enemy soldier they killed, while Germany and its allies spent just $11,344.77 per corpse. Where German efficiency broke down, however, was in the realm of strategy. After starting the war with no Plan B, Germany soon had too many Plan Bs. Some generals argued that Germany should concentrate on knocking out Russia. On the Eastern Front, they pointed out, the challenge was not how to break through, there was so much room for manoeuvre that armies regularly did this, but how to sustain advances in a land largely lacking railways and roads. Solving that problem, they suggested, would be much easier than finding a way through the trenches in France. Other generals, though, argued that Russia was a sideshow. The only way to win the war was by breaking the British and the French, whereupon the Russians would fold too. First one faction, then the other, gained the upper hand, dissipating German efforts, and to make things worse, other influential voices hoped to win the war outside Europe. Our consuls in Turkey and India, the Kaiser wrote in 1914, must rouse the whole Muslim world into wild rebellion against this hateful, mendacious, unprincipled British nation of shopkeepers. The jihad went nowhere, but in 1915 the Navy started pressing another global strategy. Since Britain depended even more than Germany on imports, the admirals observed, why not use submarines to close its trade routes? After much back and forth, in February 1917, Germany committed to sinking merchant ships on sight, regardless of what flag they flew. German leaders knew that this would probably bring the United States into the war, but as they saw it, Americans were virtually combatants already. Before the war, Britain had dominated the world system by exporting capital and industrial goods, but now Britain was importing a quarter billion dollars worth of American war materiel every month. Adding insult to injury, much of the money to do this was borrowed on the New York markets. German economists calculated that if they cut this Atlantic lifeline, Britain could only fight for another seven or eight months. Provoking the Americans might lead to defeat, but, they pointed out, doing nothing would definitely lead to defeat. To hedge their bets, however, the Germans came up with the staggeringly bad idea of offering to bankroll a Mexican invasion of the United States. This was the final straw, and in April 1917, the Americans declared war on Germany. This was the moment of decision. The United States was throwing its weight behind Britain and France at the very moment that attrition and a focus on the East 
were beginning to work for Germany. By early 1917, Russia had lost three million dead, one-third of them civilians, and its army was disintegrating. A mutiny in March, known thanks to the old-fashioned Russian calendar as the February Revolution, overthrew the Tsar, and the October Revolution, in November, brought Bolshevik agitators to power. Russians now turned to fighting each other, and Germany bullied the new Soviet Union into surrendering its non-Russian territories. This produced borders uncannily like those that followed the Soviets' final collapse in 1991, except that in 1918, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states received assorted German royals as rulers. German prestige, explained Erich von Ludendorff, Germany's quartermaster general and, by this point, virtual dictator, demands that we should hold a strong protecting hand not only over German citizens but over all Germans. This included Germans in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was now more or less a satellite of Berlin. Had Ludendorff won the war, a greater Germany would have stretched from the English Channel to the Don Basin, which would surely have meant the end of the British Globocop. Russia's collapse freed up half a million Germans to fight in the West before the American flood could arrive. But even more important, the fighting in Russia also showed how to solve the fundamental problem of command and control. I have mentioned several times the military historian Victor Davis Hansen's theory of a Western way of war, stretching from ancient Greece to modern Europe and America, which wins battles with a single magnificent collision of infantry. What the Germans discovered in 1917, though, was a modern system of war fighting, as the strategist Stephen Biddle calls it, in which infantry does just the opposite, not colliding magnificently, but reducing exposure to hostile fire, seeking not concentration and shock, but cover, concealment, and dispersion. This modern way of war again revolutionized military affairs. It tapped into the energies of people's war by pushing initiative down the ranks, into the hands of non-commissioned officers and even individual stormtroops, as Germans called the new kind of soldier. Given proper training, these men could be relied on to exercise their own initiative without officers around to drive them forward. Small groups would sneak across no man's land, rushing through the killing fields by exploiting shell holes, tree stumps, and whatever other cover survived. Stormtroops carried light but powerful weapons, the first submachine guns and flamethrowers, but the modern way of war was not about technology. It was about surprise. Instead of intense shelling, giving the game away, attacks now opened with short blasts of gas, enough to sow confusion among defenders scrambling to fit their masks. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time but not enough to give them time to prepare for what was coming. The stormtroops then infiltrated into the trenches, bypassing well-organized defenders and crawling forward to find command posts and artillery. These they hit hard, decapitating the enemy organization and throwing everything into confusion. For most of the defenders, the first sign of trouble was shooting coming from behind them. By then, a second wave of Germans was already assaulting the strong points left behind by the first, but when all went well, this was not even necessary. Surrounded, getting no orders, and with no idea where the real battle was happening, armies regularly ran away or gave up. A British officer who had been on the receiving end of the new German tactics called the effect strategic paralysis. To attack the nerves of an army, and through its nerves the will of its commander, he learned, is more profitable than to batter to pieces the bodies of its men. The first time the Germans tried stormtroop warfare, at Riga in September 1917, the entire Russian line collapsed. At Caporetto in Italy, six weeks later, the panic, immortalized in Ernest Hemingway's novel A Farewell to Arms, was even more overwhelming. At one point, one German lieutenant, Erwin Rommel, captured 1,500 Italians with the help of just five of his own men. In all, a quarter of a million Italians surrendered, and the Germans and Austrians surged forward 60 miles. These, though, were just rehearsals. 
By the end of 1917, the only thing that mattered was caving in the Western Front before too many Americans arrived. Ludendorff saw no option but to bet the house on breaking the British line, pushing the Globocop's troops back into the Channel ports and driving the French to the negotiating table. In March 1918, he rolled the dice one last time. Just two days into the attack, the British Fifth Army folded. Thousands of men threw away their rifles and ran, leaving thousands more behind them permanently. The Kaiser gave every schoolchild in Germany a victory vacation, but unlike at Riga or Caporetto, this time the defenders kept their heads and rushed reserves into the gap. As the German advance slowed to a crawl, Ludendorff attacked a new section of the line, and in early May the British position was once more critical. With our backs to the wall, the order came down, and believing in the justice of our cause, each one of us must fight on to the end. There must be no retirement. There was, in fact, quite a lot of retirement, but the British again blunted the attacks. Ludendorff made another push, pressing the French so hard that Americans, fresh from the Atlantic crossing, had to be thrown in. The French fell back, recommending that the U.S. Marines follow them, only to receive the immortal reply, Retreat? Hell, we just got here. The position held. Ludendorff had lost. It was now the Germans who buckled under the weight of attrition. Each side lost around half a million men in the spring of 1918, and a horrendous new enemy, Spanish influenza, was raging through both armies. The H1N1 virus probably evolved in crowded army camps in 1917-18 to and killed 50 million to 100 million people by the end of 1919. But while the Allies could replace their casualties, 700,000 Americans were already in France, with twice as many more on the way, Germany could not. The Anglo-Franco-American alliance planned huge new offensives for 1919, talking of parachute drops far behind German lines and armoured breakouts using thousands of tanks, although whether the planes and tanks of 1919 were up to this remains an open question. But in the end, Britain's old Plan B, of starving the enemy into submission, beat these grandiose schemes to the finish line. In the fall of 1918, famine gripped Germany. Soldiers and sailors mutinied, Bolsheviks seized cities. Civil war began. At the front, German soldiers began giving up in huge numbers. Americans netted 13,251 in a single day, and between April and October 1918, the German army shrank by a million men. Ludendorff had a breakdown at the end of September. The Kaiser fired him and then fled into exile. Finally, on November the 11th, the shooting stopped on the Western Front. At 11 o'clock this morning, Prime Minister David Lloyd George told Parliament, came to an end the cruelest and most terrible war that has ever scourged mankind. I hope we may say that thus, this fateful morning, came to an end all wars. Peace without victory. Why was Lloyd George so badly wrong? Some blame the Treaty of Versailles for being too harsh, leaving Germany seeking revenge. Others blame it for being too soft, leaving Germany intact instead of reversing its 1871 unification. Others still blame the US Congress for refusing to ratify the treaty or Britain and France for scheming to exploit it. The truth, though, is much simpler. Real peace required a strong globocop. Germany had not gotten the counterproductive war it wanted, which would have broken up the European alliance against it and crippled the British globocop. But neither had Britain gotten a productive war, restoring its pre-1870 prominence. Britain came out of the war virtually untouched by shot, shell or bomb, with an economy second only to the United States, with the largest fleet in the world, and after gobbling up various German colonies, with an empire that ruled roughly a quarter of the planet. But the price of victory had been ruinous. More than a third of a millennium had passed since Pepys had grumbled that want of money puts all things, and above all things the navy, out of order. But it was even truer in 1919 than it had been in 1661. Britain's debts were twice as large as its gross national product. 
They were smaller than the burden the nation had borne after the wars against Napoleon, to be sure. But in 1815, Britain had been the world's only industrialising economy, and in 1919, it was not. 19th century Britain, its GDP growing by leaps and bounds, had steadily paid down its debt. But, trying to repeat that feat in the 20th century, by slashing spending and raising taxes, only brought on recession. By 1921, British unemployment was over 11%, and inflation passed 21%. Strikes wasted 86 million workdays, and the economy, which had shrunk by nearly a quarter since the war ended, was smaller than it had been in 1906. Deep spending cuts drove the chief of the Imperial General Staff to despair that, in no single theatre are we strong enough. Not in Ireland, nor England, nor on the Rhine, nor in Constantinople, nor Batum, nor Egypt, nor Palestine, nor Mesopotamia, nor Persia, nor India. Unable to fund its fleet, Britain accepted naval parity with the United States in 1922, achieved by voluntarily scrapping more ships than the Royal Navy had ever lost in a battle. We cannot alone act as the policeman of the world, the leader of the Conservative Party conceded. The United States, on the other hand, supported its mega-fleet while spending just 1% of GDP on defence, because American output surged steadily upward in the 1920s, while other economies struggled through boom-and-bust cycles. By 1929, American foreign investment had almost matched Britain's peak level of 1913, and its global trade was worth 50% more. The change since 1914 in the international position of the United States, the New York Times financial editor noted in 1926, was perhaps the most dramatic transformation of economic history. The United States seemed ready to drive Britain out of its job as Globocop, but this was the last thing on most Americans' minds. Some adhered to Thomas Jefferson's hope for peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. Others worried more about avoiding entangling expenses, but others still, including President Woodrow Wilson, dreamed of something completely different. The goal of fighting, Wilson told the Senate in January 1917, must be peace without victory, because victory would mean peace forced upon the loser, a victor's terms imposed upon the vanquished. As Wilson saw it, only a peace between equals can last, meaning that the guarantees exchanged must neither recognize nor imply a difference between big nations and small, between those that are powerful and those that are weak. In place of one mighty empire acting as Globocop, Wilson proposed a League of Nations, a single and overwhelming powerful group of nations who shall be the trustee of peace in the world. On the face of it, this did not look so new. Kant, of course, had talked about something similar, and just a few years before Wilson's speech, the former president, Theodore Roosevelt, had suggested replacing the old-fashioned Globocop with a kind of community Globocop, in which the efficient civilized nations, those that are efficient in war as well as in peace, shall join in a world league for the peace of righteousness, to act with the combined military strength of all of them against any recalcitrant nation. Some even imagined an international air force that would bomb aggressors to the negotiating table. But when the League of Nations took shape in 1919, it looked nothing like this. It had no coercive powers. Its achievements in bringing refugees home, stabilizing currencies, and gathering statistics were extraordinary, but it could not fill the vacuum left by the British Globocop. Many critics suspected that not competing with Britain was in fact the whole point of the exercise. After all, they observed, when Lloyd George declared, I am for a League of Nations, he had added, in fact, the British Empire is a League of Nations. The League's constitution was based largely on British proposals, and one of its first acts was to approve British and French mandates, in effect colonies, in much of the Arab world. The US Congress wanted nothing to do with it, seeing it as just one more entangling alliance. Jawaharlal Nehru, India's future Prime Minister, wrote from a British jail that the League of Nations 
looks forward to a permanent dominance by these powers over their empires, and Lenin denounced it as a stinking corpse and an alliance of world bandits. The only real alternative to a globocop, the Soviets announced in 1919, was communism itself, which would destroy the rule of capital, make war impossible, abolish state frontiers, and change the entire world into one cooperative community. The problem with the communist solution, however, was that the Bolsheviks had been killing from the moment they seized power, and seemed to relish it. Comrade, Lenin wrote to one commissar in August 1918, hang, and I mean hang so that the people can see, not less than one hundred known kulaks, prosperous peasants, rich men, bloodsuckers. Do this so that for hundreds of miles around the people can see, tremble, know, and cry. They are killing and will go on killing the blood-sucking kulaks. Yours, Lenin. P.S. Find tougher people. In March 1919, when Lenin called the League of Nations a stinking corpse, more than five million men were fighting a particularly horrible civil war in the new Soviet Union. This ultimately killed even more Russians, perhaps eight million, counting deaths from famine and disease, than the Germans had done. Britain and France had decided as early as May 1918 that they had to intervene, and serious fighting began on November the 11th, the very day that quiet fell on the Western Front. In 1919, a quarter of a million foreign troops, mostly British, Czech, Japanese, French and American, but including Polish, Indian, Australian, Canadian, Estonian, Romanian, Serbian, Italian, Greek and even Chinese contingents, served on Russian soil. If the League really had been a capitalist conspiracy, Lenin and his henchmen would not have lasted long enough to condemn it. But as it was, with no Globocop overseeing operations, the interventions in the Russian Civil War broke down in disorder. By mid-1920, all forces but the Japanese had withdrawn, and Soviet armies were bearing down on Warsaw. After gobbling up Poland, the Soviets planned to carry communism to Germany, which had just finished putting down its own Bolshevik revolution. For a few weeks in the summer of 1920, it looked as if Lenin's boast that the red flag would sweep away state frontiers might actually come true, but as the Red Army outran its supplies, the Poles rallied and hurled it back. At the end of August, Polish horsemen even won Europe's last big cavalry battle at Komarov. Twenty-five thousand men charged and countercharged, sabers drawn, much as mounted warriors had been doing for the previous two thousand years, but this time they did it with machine guns clattering and high-explosive shells bursting all around them. Over the next few years, the Soviets quietly dropped their talk of world revolution. Sporadic fighting continued over the carcasses of the empires cast down by World War I, but for a while at least, the world seemed to be getting along just fine without a globocop. International trade recovered, and by 1924, incomes in most places were back where they had been in 1914. The world was finally putting the horrors of the war behind it. Between 1921 and 1927, the Dow Jones Index of American stocks quadrupled. Between 1927 and 1929, it almost doubled again, peaking at 381.17 points on September the 3rd, 1929. Ten years later to the day, Britain and France once again declared war on Germany. Death of a Globocop The 19th century world system finally died over the last weekend of October 1929. Despite 85 years of arguments, we still don't know exactly how it started. The 1929 crisis is a substantial curiosity, says the financial historian Harold James, in that it was a major event with truly world historical consequences, the Great Depression, even perhaps the Second World War, but no obvious causes. For whatever reason, Wall Street traders lost their heads on Wednesday, October the 23rd. Four billion dollars of wealth, the equivalent of 53 billion dollars today, evaporated. By Thursday lunchtime, another $9 billion of American riches had evaporated. Then the markets rallied, 
buoyed by an alliance of bankers buying up the shares no one wanted, but on Monday the roof really fell in. By Tuesday afternoon the Dow had lost almost a quarter of its value, and by the summer of 1932 a dollar of stock bought at the market's peak on September 3, 1929, was worth just 11 cents. The decade between September 3, 1929 and September 3, 1939 saw global finance melt down, sweeping away what was left of the integration that had made the 19th century world system work. Into the 1870s and even beyond, Britain had regularly acted as the lender of last resort, accepting that being a Globo credit union was part of the Globo Cop's job. But now there was no Globo Cop. It was every government for itself. One after another, they walled off their economies, raising barriers against competition and financial contagion. The United States alone introduced 21,000 tariffs to keep out imports, and by the end of 1932, international trade had shrunk to one-third of what it had been in 1929. It was this that killed Britain's last pretensions to playing Globocop. Like everyone else, governments in London retreated behind tariffs. Defence spending fell even further, and in 1932 the chiefs of staff admitted that the Navy could no longer defend the empire east of Suez. War, they conceded, would exposed to depredation for an inestimable period, British possessions and dependencies, including those of India, Australia and New Zealand. Not surprisingly, the possessions and dependencies being so exposed reacted badly. The white settler dominions made it clear that London should not take their support for granted if another war came, and India, for so long a central pillar in the world system, began going its own way. Britain opened negotiations with Gandhi's non-cooperation movement in 1930, and in 1935 it made major concessions to Indian political parties. The 1930s collapse shook the British ruling class to its core. It is the virtue of the Englishman, a Cambridge don had written in 1913, that he never doubts. But over the next twenty years this certainty faded fast. Even to its rulers, the whole Globocop exercise was starting to seem just a little bit pointless. The most eloquent doubter was surely George Orwell, an old Etonian whose five-year stint in the Empire's police force in Burma turned him into one of Britannia's fiercest critics. However, he was hardly alone. All over India, he observed, there are Englishmen who secretly loathe the system of which they are a part. Once, he wrote, he had shared a compartment on an overnight train ride with an English officer of the Indian Education Service. It was too hot to sleep, he said, and we spent the night in talking. Half an hour's cautious questioning decided each of us that the other was safe, and then for hours, while the train jolted slowly through the pitch-black night, sitting up in our bunks with bottles of beer handy, we damned the British Empire, damned it from the inside, intelligently and intimately. It did us both good. But when the train crawled into Mandalay, we parted as guiltily as any adulterous couple. The Empire still had its boosters, of course. There are Englishmen who reproach themselves with having governed India badly, one of these admirers wrote. Why? Because the Indians show no enthusiasm for their rule. I claim that the English have governed India very well, but their error is to expect enthusiasm from the people they administer. This fan was Adolf Hitler. The solution to the world's uncertainties, he insisted, was force, not self-doubt, and as the democracies of the 1930s struggled with sluggish growth, faction-ridden ruling coalitions, unemployment and social unrest, it began to look as if he might be right. Violent strongmen, some on the left but most on the right, seized power in Europe, East Asia and Latin America. All made the same bet, that without a Globocop, force was the solution to their problems. In many ways, the Soviet Union was the model for them all. Its leaders seemed to have discovered the secret of success in the uncertain post-war world, that more violence worked better than less violence. Stalin shot tens of thousands of his subjects, locked a million in gulags, shipped millions more around his empire, 
and confiscated so much grain that ten million starved, and, as he did so, the closed, inward-turned, centrally planned Soviet economy grew by 80 percent between 1929 and 1939. This dwarfed the performance of the open-access, globally-linked capitalist economies. Britain expanded by a respectable 20 percent across the same decade, but France managed only 3 percent, and the United States just 2 percent. Cheered by the success of internally directed violence, and undeterred by the fact that he had just had all the best officers in the Red Army shot, Stalin turned violence outward in 1939. He sent troops into Finland, the Baltic states, Poland and Manchuria, and on the last of these fronts the Soviets clashed with an equally aggressive Japan, which, after prospering as a commercial power since the 1870s, had been hard hit by the new barriers to trade in the 1930s. Our nation seems to be at a deadlock, Lieutenant Colonel Ishiwara Kanji observed, and there appears to be no solution for the important problems of population and food, unless, that is, Japan adopted Ishiwara's solution. The development of Manchuria and Mongolia, whose natural resources will be sufficient to save Japan from the imminent crisis. Ishiwara and a gaggle of junior officers went rogue, invading Manchuria, then part of China, in 1931 without any orders to do so. Ishiwara half expected to be court-martialed, but when it became clear that the invasion was going well and that there was no invisible fist to punish them, politicians in Tokyo, themselves drowning in unknown unknowns, also embraced force. When the League of Nations insisted that they withdraw, they instead withdrew from the League. British and American politicians fulminated but did nothing. A Japanese attack on Shanghai in 1932 did shock Britain into dropping the budgeting assumption, in place since 1919, that it would not have to fight a major war within the next decade, but still Britain hesitated to rearm, largely out of fear of stoking inflation. Five years later, Japan struck again, overrunning northern China. Once more, violence paid. With newly conquered markets to sell in and burgeoning armies to provision, Japan saw its GDP grow more than 70% in the 1930s. We really got busy, one munitions worker remembered. By the end of 1937, everybody in the country was working. For the first time, I was able to take care of my father. War's not bad at all, I thought. Japan outdid the Soviets at externally directed violence. After storming Nanjing in southern China in December 1937, Japanese soldiers raped and murdered perhaps a quarter of a million people. We took turns raping them, one soldier confessed. It would be all right if we only raped them, I shouldn't say all right, but we always stabbed and killed them. When a Tokyo journalist recoiled at seeing men hanging by their tongues from hooks, an officer explained things to him. You and I have diametrically different views of the Chinese. You may be dealing with them as human beings, but I regard them as swine. We can do anything to such creatures. Back in 1904, when Halford Mackinder predicted that the struggle between the inner rim, the outer rim and the heartland would dominate the 20th century, he was already worrying that Japan might follow a path like the one Ishiwara recommended. Were the Chinese, he speculated, organized by the Japanese, to overthrow the Russian Empire and conquer its territory, they might constitute the yellow peril to the world's freedom, just because they would add an oceanic frontage to the resources of the great continent, an advantage as yet denied to the Russian tenant of the pivot region. When Mackinder was delivering his famous lecture in 1904, Japan was pressing from the outer into the inner rim, fighting Russia for access to Manchuria, but 35 years later, Manchuria was completely under its control. There was no immediate danger of Japan's invading the heartland, and a tough, undeclared war with Stalin in the summer of 1939 saw Soviet tanks inflict a sharp defeat on the Japanese at Nomonhan. But the conquest of coastal China, to Makinda the prerequisite for conquering the heartland, was moving ahead. Japan seemed to be working from Makinda's script, by taking over Manchuria and China, Ishiwara announced, the Japanese people can become rulers of Asia 
and be prepared to wage the final and decisive war against the various white races. All this was alarming, very alarming, but what worried defenders of the status quo most was, once again, Germany. The Versailles settlement had created a buffer zone of small states in Eastern Europe, but Germany's strategic problem, and opportunities, had not gone away. It was still sandwiched between the Russian heartland and the Franco-British outer rim, and violence seemed as plausible a policy in the 1930s as it had been in the 1910s. Back in 1917, the Kaiser had compared Europe with the ancient Mediterranean. Because Rome's victory over Carthage in the First Punic War of 264 to 241 BC had failed to resolve the two powers' real issues, he observed, a more terrible but also more decisive Second Punic War had to be fought twenty years later. Germany, too, he predicted, would have to fight a Second Punic War. All it needed was a Hannibal, and in 1933 it got one. The Tempest Germany's problem, Hitler told his advisers in 1937, could be solved only by the use of force. This, he argued as early as 1925 in his book Mein Kampf, meant that Germany had to refight the First World War, and this time get it right. Germany's 1914 strategy, Hitler thought, had been basically correct, and in the war to come, the army would once again strike west while marking time in the east. After overthrowing the outer rim powers of France and Britain, Germany would turn on the Soviet Union. At that point, though, Hitler went beyond the thinking of the 1910s. In 1917, Ludendorff had insisted that anywhere that Germans lived, from the Rhine to the Volga, was part of a greater Germany. But Hitler imagined what the historian Neil Ferguson calls a greatest possible Germany, where only Germans lived. This would give the German race Lebensraum, or living space, where sturdy Teutonic farmers would go forth and multiply free from the taint of lesser races. Success, Hitler said, depended on learning two great lessons from World War I and then going beyond them. The first came originally from British officers, who, in 1918, had seen that combining German stormtroop tactics with their own style of massed tank attacks and, insofar as the technology of the day allowed it, close air support, could make trench warfare obsolete. The idea, the maverick military theorist Captain Basil Little Hart explained, was to make the fight more fluid, with success coming, above all, in the follow-through, the way that a breakthrough is exploited by a deep strategic penetration, carried out by armoured forces racing on ahead of the main army and operating independently. Lack of funds and a certain amount of stick-in-the-mudness meant that the interwar British, French, and American armies did little to develop this bold vision, but Soviet generals did pick it up. Organizing tanks into large armored corps for independent operations, they planned to wage what they called deep battle, pushing far behind the enemy front in just the way suggested by Little Hart. But Stalin had most of these officers shot in 1937, and their replacements, understandably, tried to avoid radical ideas that might attract the great man's attention. Only in Germany, where the strict limits imposed by the Treaty of Versailles had left military men with no option but to innovate, did the doctrine of combined arms breakouts, what journalists later labelled Blitzkrieg or Lightning War, really take hold. By the time Hitler started flooding the army with money in the mid-1930s, its leaders had embraced Blitzkrieg and its engineers were building tanks, aircraft and radios that, unlike the weapons of 1918, could withstand the stresses of mobile war. Germany's temporary monopoly on the new tactics gave Hitler a real chance to grab victory before anyone else realized what was going on. Blitzkrieg meant embracing risk and chaos, turning the storm of steel into a true tempest. Bombers and parachutists would sow disorder deep in the enemy's rear, attacking civilians as often as soldiers and choking the roads with refugees. Up at the front, squads of infantry covered by intense artillery fire and swooping dive bombers would probe for gaps in the enemy line, slipping between strong points or turning open flanks. 
tanks and trucks would surge through the openings, and now the real fight would begin. Armoured columns would fan out miles behind enemy positions, racing to overrun command centres before reserves could concentrate, cut off and crush the penetrations. Eventually, the breakthrough would outrun its supplies, but by then a second echelon of armour would have burst through. If necessary, a third would follow, always keeping the defenders off balance, until, sooner rather than later, confusion overwhelmed everything and the enemy's will collapsed. Blitzkrieg worked exactly as advertised. Poland's armies disintegrated before Britain and France could even mobilise, and France itself, which had fought so long and hard in World War I, collapsed completely in May 1940, when a thousand German tanks burst through a carelessly guarded stretch of the front. Three weeks later, Winston Churchill gave the greatest speech of his career, insisting, We shall go on to the end. But when his war secretary secretly gathered senior officers in a hotel room to ask whether their troops could be counted on to continue to fight in all circumstances, the answer shocked him. No one dared, one of the officers recalled, to estimate any exact proportion. Britain, of course, did fight on, but twelve months later Germany looked even closer to winning the war. With more than 4,000 tanks driving east, the Soviet army seemed to be crumbling as abruptly as the French had. The Russians lost this war in the first eight days, the German chief of staff announced. Stalin promptly had a mini breakdown and fled to his country estate, where, on the eighth day, the rest of the Politburo came looking for him. We found him in an armchair in the small dining room, one of them wrote. He looked up and said, What have you come for? He had the strangest look on his face, and the question itself was pretty strange. Stalin, his henchmen realized, thought they had come to execute him before surrendering to the Germans. But the Soviets, too, fought on, because, and this was the second lesson Hitler took from World War I, wars are not lost on battlefields alone. Despite, or because of, his experiences in the trenches as the army collapsed in 1918, Hitler shared the popular view that Germany had never been defeated in the field. It had failed, he was certain, because traitors had stabbed it in the back, from which he drew the conclusion that this time around Germany had to strike the would-be traitors before the war even began. He started with communists, rounded up by the thousands in 1933. Next came rivals on the extreme right, murdered en masse in 1934, and then, on a larger scale still, all groups judged insufficiently German. The main thing, Hitler said in private in 1938, is that the Jews are driven out. The Roman Empire had expelled the Jews from their homeland 2,000 years earlier, and Europeans had periodically persecuted them ever since. But the Nazis, once again, took things further. The Jews' homelessness, Hitler argued, made them the absolute opposite of Germans, who had a sacred bond to the soil. Jewish rootlessness and commercial greed would corrupt the coming thousand-year Reich and must therefore be eradicated. Almost the minute they invaded Poland in 1939, German troops started shooting Jews. When that proved too slow and expensive, they converted trucks to act as mobile gas chambers. Hitler probably took the decision to round up and murder every Jew in Europe in July 1941, soon after he attacked the Soviet Union. Hitler's inner circle, agreeing with their master that Europe's other Untermenschen, subhumans, would also have to go, floated plans to cut off the food supply to Russian cities, starving tens of millions of people to death over the coming winter. This was people's war taken to the extreme, and it made World War II unique. There had been orchestrated massacres in World War I, in Serbia, Belgium, Africa, and above all Armenia, but such calculated barbarism on such a scale was, as Churchill put it, a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalogue of human crime. Not all of Hitler's genocidal plans came off, but the Nazis still murdered at least 20 million civilians. That is why, in the introduction to this book, I raised what I call the What About Hitler problem. If it is true, as I have been claiming, that war has been productive, 
creating bigger societies that pacify themselves internally and generate economic growth, then what about Hitler? His greatest possible Germany would have been the biggest society the continent had seen since the Roman Empire, yet it would also have impoverished most of its subjects and made their lives much more dangerous, the exact opposite of productive war. I suggested in the introduction that the solution to the what about Hitler problem is fairly obvious once we take a long-term perspective on history. Since caging began 10,000 years ago, conquerors have been making wastelands, but they or their successors then faced a harsh choice between turning into stationary bandits and being replaced by new conquerors who would face exactly the same choice. Churchill predicted that if Hitler beat Britain, the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. All the evidence, though, suggests that Hitler's regime would in fact have had to make the same choice between stationary banditry and extinction as every other regime in history. Hitler always recognized that winning the war in Europe would not be the end of his struggle. For a foreseeable period of about one to three generations, he predicted, Eastern Europe would provide scope for the German race to grow, but after that it would need to expand again, probably overseas. At that point, somewhere between the 1970s and the 2030s, Hitler's successors would fight a third world war, in which Germany would crush whatever remained of the British Empire and take dominion over the globe. Perhaps because they were so convinced that traitors rather than the arrival of American troops had cost them victory in 1918, few Nazi leaders ever understood that the real problem for their long-term plans was the United States, not Britain. Nothing else can explain why, just days after Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, Hitler declared war on the Americans rather than hoping that the war in the Pacific would distract them from Europe. What does the USA amount to anyway? asked Hermann Goering, the head of the German Air Force. Churchill, however, saw exactly what it amounted to. Now at this very moment, I knew the United States was in the war up to the neck and into the death, he said, of hearing the news about Pearl Harbor. So we had won after all. Hitler had been making vague plans to attack the United States since 1938 and periodically ordered German factories to start building long-range bombers that could reach New York and great surface fleets to contest the Atlantic, only to cancel the commissions as more pressing problems arose. Whether he would have gotten more serious had he beaten Britain and the Soviets in 1940-41, to we can only speculate. But such speculation is useful, I think, because as soon as we ask this question, we see why the Nazis, like all rulers since productive war began, would quickly have been forced to choose between becoming stationary bandits and being defeated. Had Hitler built bombers and fleets in earnest and tried to wage a transatlantic war, he would soon have run into the same difficulties that Japan encountered in the Pacific. The first was that once the Americans worked out how to survive Blitzkrieg, the struggle would turn into a long, logistical slogging match, and the second, that even with all the resources of an enslaved Europe to draw on, Hitler could not win this. In some ways, Hitler's position was rather like Napoleon's, 135 years earlier. Both men tried to conquer Europe by wedding the modern energies of people's war to an old idea of empire, using violence to unify the European inner rim and then close it off from the commercial open-access orders of the Outer Rim. This, I suggested in Chapter 4, was already a losing strategy when Napoleon tried it around 1805, because the vast wealth being generated by the Atlantic economy meant that real power now came from getting the invisible hand and the invisible fist to work together. Because Britain was doing this, and Napoleon was not, the Emperor never stood much chance of prevailing over the nation of shopkeepers. By the time Hitler re-ran a more extreme, bloodthirsty version of the strategy around 1940, the odds against it were even steeper. It is perhaps no coincidence that Hitler, exactly like Napoleon, was turned back at the English Channel, in the snows before Moscow, and in the sands of Egypt. Both men suffered the same fate, 
because both men were trying to do the same thing. If Hitler had broken Britain, he would just have found himself facing the United States' even bigger and more dynamic open-access order. Like the hunter-gatherers confronting farmers in prehistory, or the stateless societies struggling against ancient empires, the autocrats of the 19th and 20th centuries were on the wrong side of history. Rather than creating the thousand-year Reich that Hitler so often spoke of, a Nazi victory in Europe would have set up a situation very like the real-world Cold War that took shape after 1945. A totalitarian European empire and an open-access American order would have glared at each other from behind fences of nuclear missiles, struggling for influence over Latin America and the carcasses of the old British and French empires. They would have sponsored coups, waged proxy wars, and wooed each other's allies. Nixon might have flown to Tokyo in 1972 to split Japan from Germany, rather than flying to Beijing to split China from the Soviet Union. They might even have had their own Petrov moments. There would have been differences too, of course. Had Hitler won, the European Empire would have been ruled from Berlin, not Moscow, and would have run all the way to the Atlantic, rather than stopping at the Iron Curtain. Hitler and his successors might have been more willing than Stalin and his to risk nuclear war. And without Western Europe in its orbit, the United States would surely have found it harder to prevail. But in the end, the Nazis would still have faced the same core problem as the Communists, of how to compete with a dynamic, open-access, outer-rim order, and been confronted with exactly the same choices. They could have recognized the strengths of the open-access economy and begun imitating it, as mainland China did after Mao's death in 1976, or they could have ignored it and collapsed, as the Soviet Union did in 1989. I will have much more to say about the Cold War in the last parts of this chapter. Here I will content myself with observing that these are the reasons why I conclude that the what about Hitler problem is not really a problem at all. For the theory that I am advancing in this book, that is, not for the people who lived through his reign of terror. Hitler's regime was an extreme case in the annals of atrocity. A Nazi victory would have been a disaster, condemning decades of Europeans to the grip of the Gestapo and the death camps, driving the rate of violent death back up to levels not seen for centuries. But even so, the Nazis would have remained subject to the same iron laws as every other government in history. As the decades lengthened into generations, the need to compete commercially and militarily with the open access order would have forced Hitler's successors to make a choice between defeat and turning into stationary bandits. In the 2010s, I hazard to suggest, Europe might still have been a dark continent where secret police kicked in doors in the middle of the night, but the downward march of violent death rates would have resumed. Hitler could have slowed the civilizing process, but he could not have stopped it altogether. As it was, of course, Hitler did not win. Had he handled the Stalingrad campaign better in 1942, he could still have prevailed, and even in the summer of 1943, when he launched the biggest tank battle in history at Kursk, he still stood a chance. But by then his enemies had learned not only to survive Blitzkrieg, but also to mount their own versions. Committing their enormous economies to total war, they overwhelmed Germany and Japan. Thousand bomber raids pounded the Axis homelands day and night, paralyzing their economies and killing about a million civilians including a 100,000 in Tokyo in a single night. When the German army invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, it needed 600,000 horses to haul its guns and supplies, greatly slowing its advance. But by 1944, the Allied armies were fully motorized. Now it was the turn of veteran German forces to disintegrate as American tanks broke out after the D-Day landings, Operation Cobra, and Soviet armor smashed its way through to the German frontier, annihilating Hitler's army group center, Operation Bagration. With their cities in flames, Hitler shot himself, and Japan's emperor broadcast his first ever speech to his people. The war situation, he conceded, has not developed necessarily to Japan's advantage. With that, the tempest was over. Learning to Love the Bomb 
The Second World War was the most destructive ever fought. When we include those who starved, succumbed to disease, and were murdered in German, Soviet, and Japanese camps, it claimed 50 million to 100 million lives, as compared with 15 million dead in World War I and another 20 million in the civil wars that followed it. World War II turned much of Europe and East Asia into wastelands and cost something like one trillion dollars, as I write in 2013, the equivalent of perhaps $15 trillion, the entire annual output of the United States or the European Union. And yet, in a paradox as striking as any in the history of conflict, World War II also managed to be among the most productive ever fought. That was because the war began the process of clearing away the chaos left by the demise of the British Globocop. This, needless to say, was not the end Churchill had had in mind when he asked for the British people's blood, toil, tears, and sweat. In August 1941, before the United States had even entered the war, he had rushed back from a secret meeting with President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to boast to the cabinet that he had a plain and bold intimation that after the war, the U.S. will join with us in policing the world until the establishment of a better order. But this was not to be. There was a popular saying during the war that Britain provided the time, Russia provided the men, and America provided the money to defeat Hitler. But by November 1943, when Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt held their first group meeting, time was already on the Allies' side. Only men and money now mattered, and Churchill found himself sidelined. Far from sharing global condominium with the United States, Britain woke up from celebrating victory over Germany and Japan to the worst economic hangover in its history. Its debts were much worse than in 1918, its economy completely distorted by war production, and its very food supply dependent on American loans. It was extraordinarily unreal, even absurd and shabby, a left-wing journalist wrote in his diary in December 1945, after spending two days watching Parliament debate the terms of a new American bailout. Speakers took up their position, but the only reality was the fear which none of them dared to express, the fear of the consequences if cigarettes and films and spam were not available from America. Absurd and shabby it might have been, but unreal it was not. Britain had gone broke fighting Germany. To pay its debts, it had to put exports ahead of consumption, and food rationing actually got stricter after 1945. When eggs became freely available in 1950, there was euphoria. What this means to us only an English housewife can understand, one diary records. At last, actually, we could beat up two eggs and put them in a cake, the first time for ten years. Trapped between insolvency and demands to expand the open access order into an expensive welfare state, Britain soon found running its old empire an unaffordable luxury. Back in 1916, a German general commanding Turkish troops defending Iraq against a mostly Indian army fighting for the British Empire had written home that the hallmark of the 20th century must be the revolution of the coloured races against the colonial imperialism of Europe. But it took another world war to fulfil his prophecy. British rule never recovered from its failure to stand up to Japan. The scene at Penang in Malaya in December 1941 was fairly typical. As Japanese spearheads infiltrated past the British fortifications, the European defenders left without firing a shot, abandoning their local allies to the invaders' tender mercies. Out of the dozens of Asian civil servants who had actually run the town on Britain's behalf, only one was even told about the evacuation and he was then turned out of the boat to make room for the British commandant's car. It was, thought a young British woman caught up in the rout, a thing which I am sure will never be forgotten or forgiven. Although two and a half million Indians volunteered to fight for the empire, while only a few thousand joined the Japanese army, often so they could get out of prisoner-of-war camps, the London government nevertheless had no illusions about being able to keep control in the subcontinent after the war ended. It pulled out in indecent haste in 1947, and by 1971 Britain ruled virtually nothing east of Suez, or east of Dover for that matter. Great Britain has lost an empire and has not yet found a role, 
The former American Secretary of State Dean Acheson famously remarked in 1962, but that was not entirely true. The ex-Globo cop in fact transitioned remarkably smoothly to being the main supporter of the new power that had taken its job, probably because Britain really had very few options. Less than a year after Hitler's suicide, Churchill could already see that an iron curtain has descended across the European continent. The war had not been productive enough to install a new Globo cop, but it did set up two new hemispherical cops. During the 500 years' war, Europe had almost conquered the world, and now the Soviet Union and the United States had between them conquered Europe. They had divided the continent down the middle, solving the great strategic problem posed by a mighty Germany forever fearful of being crushed between the outer rim and the heartland by tearing the country in two. Seen in isolation, the First World War had been very much a counterproductive war, crippling the British Globocop, but from the vantage point of 1945, it now looked more like the opening round in a longer productive war, which was moving toward replacing the 19th century Globocop with a much stronger 20th century version. Many thoughtful observers concluded that there would have to be one more great productive war, with the two hemispherical cops fighting it out until just one Globocop remained standing. But one thing stood in the way of this outcome. The bomb. Splitting the atom had changed everything. The biggest artillery bombardments in the world wars had typically lobbed 15 to 20,000 tons of high explosives at enemy trenches over the course of several days, but the individual bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki concentrated these barrages into single blasts and also poisoned the survivors with lethal neutrons and gamma rays. With just two bombs, the United States killed more than 150,000 people. A war between two nations with large nuclear arsenals, in 1986, the peak year, the United States and the Soviet Union had 70,000 warheads between them, was beyond anything that could be imagined. It would be truly counterproductive war, laying lands waste for thousands of years to come. Even Stalin found the thought unbearable. The question, then, was what to do about it. One possibility was that the world would be scared straight. After looking into the abyss, it might finally beat its swords into plowshares. Albert Einstein wrote to the New York Times less than a month after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, explaining that this was the only option. An earnest committee at the University of Chicago issued guidelines for a world government. Hope even flared that the United Nations, the League of Nations' successor, would make war redundant. But all these answers begged the same question. What happens when the nuclear giants fall out? The idea that the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission would control all atom bombs collapsed when the Americans and the Soviets could not agree on inspection protocols, and by 1947 confidence in the power of talk was disappearing. Soviets called the United Nations not so much a world organization as an organization for the Americans. American officials, watching the delegates' antics, dismissed it as the monkey house. Another possibility was that the world might be scared violent. Pushing the lesser evil logic to its horrifying limits, some Americans pointed out that since they had not only atom bombs, but also bombers that could reach enemy cities, while the Soviets had neither, it made sense to fight a one-sided nuclear war now rather than a much worse two-sided one later. Churchill even contemplated a plan, called, quite rightly, Operation Unthinkable, to follow up nuclear attacks by having the recently surrendered German army reinvade Russia. The flaw with this thinking was that during the four years that the United States had the world's only atomic bombs, it did not have enough of them to defeat the Soviets. The Joint Chiefs of Staff calculated in 1948 that if they dropped all 133 of their bombs on Soviet cities, they would kill three million people, a horrifying number, but not enough to shatter a nation that had survived 25 million deaths during World War II. Not until 1952, when American physicists set off a thermonuclear hydrogen bomb with a blast equal to 700 Hiroshimas, 
was the United States in a position to kill tens of millions of communists. But by then, thanks as much to their spies as their scientists, the communists had a bomb of their own. Never one to give up easily, the newly elected president, Dwight Eisenhower, told his National Security Council in 1953 that there was no sense merely shuddering at the enemy's capacity. Rather, we presently really have to face the question of whether or not we would really have to throw everything at once against the enemy. One study he commissioned confirmed that virtually all of Russia would be nothing but a smoking, radiating ruin at the end of two hours. Another, however, pointed out that if Soviet bombers made one-way suicide flights, reasonable behavior for crews whose homes were now radiating ruins, they could drop a hundred atom bombs on American cities and kill about 11 million people. There would be furious dogfights far above the North Pole, and many, perhaps most, of the Soviet bombers would be shot down. But these were still not odds Eisenhower wanted to gamble with, and when the Soviets unveiled genuine long-range bombers in 1954 and their own hydrogen bomb in 1955, the calculus became even less attractive. A fairly standard hydrogen bomb, with a blast equivalent to a million tons of TNT, would kill everyone and level every building within three miles. Up to six miles out, clothes would burst into flames, and people would be tossed through the air at lethal speeds. Eleven miles away, anyone caught in the open could get second-degree burns and radiation poisoning. By the late 1950s, the Soviets had hundreds of these bombs, and the Americans had thousands. Neither scared straight nor scared violent, Americans plumped in 1947 for a middle course, which came to be called containment. As they rightly saw it, the United States was an outer rim power. It had taken the open access order much further than 19th century Britain by renouncing direct rule, other than its rule over the nearly 3.8 million square miles it had conquered within North America, altogether. In fact, most Americans thought of their country as an anti-empire, fighting imperialism in the name of freedom. But even so, as the historian Neil Ferguson has acutely observed in his books Colossus and Empire, the United States' strategic situation after 1945 was strikingly like Britain's a century earlier. Like Britain, the United States ruled the seas, and now the skies too, maintained military bases around the world, and exercised overwhelming economic power. Because it was the leader of a constellation of allies, rather than the ruler of provinces or client kingdoms, it relied more on coups and cooperation with local militaries than on sending gunboats to keep its followers in line, even though this meant that the followers often had at least some freedom to pursue policies that Washington did not like. But the price of opposing the United States on serious matters, as Britain and France discovered when they invaded Egypt without permission in 1956, was higher than its allies were typically willing to pay. Everything was always up for negotiation, but on the whole, the Allies did more or less what Washington wanted, which is why so many people, friends as well as foes, called the post-war world an American empire. Within this alliance empire, peace fell hard and fast. In part, this was because the United States rarely allowed its allies the freedom to fight each other, which, given that most of the world's democracies were in the American empire, largely explains the phenomenon known as democratic peace. But peace also triumphed within national boundaries. The war had done wonders for popular respect for government and revulsion against political violence. The immediate post-war decades were a golden age of law and order. Just one Scandinavian in 5,000 and one Briton in 4,000 died violently between 1950 and 1974, and while the American homicide rate, one in 700, remained higher than Europe's, it had still fallen 50% since the 1930s. The 1950s might have been dull, but they were very, very safe. They were also very, very prosperous. At a great gathering in the woods of New Hampshire in July 1944, Americans had laid the foundation of a new international economic order, to replace the one that died between September the 3rd, 1929 and September the 3rd, 1939, 
and the United States began pouring cash into Europe's devastated economies. Most went to wartime allies, but with the free trade principle taken beyond anything 19th century Britain had tried, vast amounts also went to West Germany, Japan and Italy. By 1951, the United States had given away $26 billion, equivalent to roughly 10% of its annual GDP. It was, observes the strategist Robert Kagan, the perfect capitalist solution to a problem that was strategic as well as economic. Like Adam Smith's butcher, brewer, and baker, the American empire acted not out of benevolence, but from regard for its own interest. The flood of capital into Europe stimulated effective demand for American food and goods, and after a short, sharp depression as economies shifted from war to peacetime production, the American empire enjoyed the biggest, most broadly shared economic boom in history. In Britain, where being allowed to buy eggs had caused such joy in 1950, by 1960 more than a quarter of all families owned a car, and by 1965 it was more than a third. Car ownership remained more than twice as common in the United States, but few Europeans were complaining. Each world war had seen leviathans extending their tentacles deep into civil society so they could mobilize their resources to win, taking responsibility for organizing everything from munitions production to hospitals and child-rearing. After 1918, most voters viewed all this as infringements on their freedoms, electing governments that rushed to shed the burdens of enforcing high tax rates and running their citizens' lives. By 1945, though, many Western Europeans, and some, though not quite as many, Americans, had come to see big government very differently not as a form of oppression, but as a tool of freedom. Big government had won the war against Hitler, and now, perhaps, it could win wars against poverty and injustice. To the horror of many conservatives, voters started electing governments committed to national health services, social security, state-funded university education, state-owned industries, steeply progressive taxation, and legal protections for previously marginalized groups. As empires went, most members of the American version concluded, this was not so bad. Getting to Petrov The American empire had no need to push into the Eurasian heartland, but it did need to protect and expand free markets all around the inner rim, and especially in Western Europe. Its policy of containment meant leaving the Soviets to get on with whatever they liked in their own heartland, but contesting all communist advances into the inner rim. If the United States could not be a globo cop, it could at least be a globo bouncer. From the heartland, predictably, containment looked like encirclement. Almost everywhere the Politburo looked, from Scandinavia to Japan, American allies locked them in, their wealth and freedom tempting inner rim nations into America's orbit, threatening the future of communism. Moscow's ideologues did their best to compete in the War of Ideas, and the various five-year plans generated economic growth that would have been impressive in any earlier age. But from the minute they conquered Eastern Europe, the Soviets had to rely heavily on force, much as the Tsars had before them. Repression made sense for a heartland power. Far from the great flows of oceanic trade and unable to generate as much prosperity as an outer rim empire, the Soviets had a much harder time than the Americans or even the British before them in buying loyalty with higher living standards. At its peak in 1953, the last year of Stalin's life, the Gulag system housed 2.5 million prisoners. Stalin had even briefly reopened the Nazi concentration camp at Buchenwald, killing a further 10,000 or so people there. In two known cases, families had one child executed by Hitler and the other by Stalin. Soviet statistics are notoriously unreliable, but, depressing as the thought is, communist police states do seem to have driven violent crime down to extremely low levels. However, they clearly also made the Soviet Empire's subjects miserable, and the huge spending required to support all the machinery of repression distorted the economy. Soviet living standards did rise, roughly doubling between 1946 and 1960, but American income roughly tripled in the same period. In addition to all these drawbacks, 
The resources lavished on the million Soviet troops needed to occupy Eastern Europe created a distinctly threatening impression on the American side of the Iron Curtain, and with each superpower suspecting the other's intentions, often with good cause, the inevitable outcome was constant conflicts of interest around the inner rim. In the twilight struggle that ensued, fought as much by spies and policemen as by insurgents and armies, the United States and the Soviet Union both discovered, to paraphrase Marx, that while they made their own strategies, they could not always do so in ways of their own choosing. Both superpowers had to work closely with allies, and the tail often seemed to be wagging the dog. Soviets complained that their East German clients dragged them into crises they did not want, and the first Secretary-General of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, formed on a Norwegian initiative in 1949, joked that the alliance was a cynical Western European conspiracy to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. At the other end of Eurasia, the alliance politics were messier still. For years, Mao Zedong had been bombarding Moscow with requests for help in the Chinese civil war, and Kim Il-sung had been demanding permission to invade South Korea. Stalin, worried about provoking Washington, had stalled both men. But when Mao surprised everyone by hoisting the red flag over Beijing in 1949, Stalin found the temptation of expelling the United States from the Pacific inner rim altogether just too tempting. He approved the Korean War in 1950. It took three years, three million dead, and American threats of atomic attacks on China to end the fighting. The United States had hung on in the inner rim, but at a terrible cost, and in 1954 Eisenhower rolled out a new, zero-tolerance version of containment called the New Look, a bizarre choice of name borrowed from Christian Dior's 1947 line of full-skirted fashions. Official explanations were studiedly vague, but it seemed to add up to massive nuclear retaliation against any attack anywhere. Ground forces would be cut to a bare minimum, serving only as tripwires for nuclear weapons. NATO's commander in Europe was blunt. We are basing all our planning on using atomic and thermonuclear weapons in our defense, he wrote. With us, it is no longer, they may possibly be used. It is very definitely, they will be used. So long as the Soviets accepted that war would be suicidal for them, but merely almost suicidal for the Americans, the new look more or less returned the initiative to Washington, at least against Moscow and Beijing, which got the bomb in 1964. But thanks to the strange tail-wagging-the-dog logic of the nuclear standoff, weaker communist countries felt able to take more risks, knowing that the United States would rather lose its arguments with them than be seen as the vicious bully that had gone nuclear against a minnow. In 1954, Eisenhower had to acknowledge that he would not use nuclear weapons against Ho Chi Minh in Indochina. The speed with which the nuclear revolution in military affairs unfolded made stable strategies almost impossible. In 1945, the United States and the Soviet Union had both scooped up as many of Hitler's rocket scientists as they could and set them to work designing intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. In 1957, the Soviets narrowly won the race. Our Germans are better than their Germans, the film The Right Stuff has Khrushchev boast, using one of their first working rockets to fire a 184-pound steel ball, the Sputnik, into orbit. Inside was a radio transmitter, which did nothing but beep, but that was enough to fill Americans with despair. Listen now, NBC warned, for the sound that will forever separate the old from the new. But like nearly everything in this brave new world, the Soviet lead was short-lived. Two years later, the United States also had working ICBMs, and in 1960 both sides mastered the art of launching them from submarines. This ruled out the possibility of a first strike killing enough of the enemy's missiles to prevent him from shooting back, and shifted the calculus again. In the early 1960s, the United States still had a nine-to-one nuclear superiority over the Soviets, and the Department of Defense projected that an American first strike would be able to kill 100 million people, probably bringing down the Soviet Union. 
However, the report went on, a Soviet counterstrike against the bigger cities of the United States and its allies would kill 75 million Americans and 115 million Europeans, bringing down most of the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. The age of mutual assured destruction, with its almost too perfect acronym MAD, had arrived. Massive retaliation now meant that the United States, as well as the Soviet Union, would be committing suicide, which naturally made the new look rather less attractive. Unknown unknowns were returning. In 1961, wondering whether the newly installed president, John F. Kennedy, would really risk New York to save his stake in Berlin, the Soviets pushed harder than usual in the endless confrontation over that divided city. Fear clutched the world as politicians postured and threatened. Finally, the communists compromised and built a wall down the middle of the city, but the next year things got even worse. Why not throw a hedgehog at Uncle Sam's pants, Khrushchev asked, and sent Soviet missiles to Cuba. For thirteen heart-stopping days, the worst-case scenario seemed to have arrived. It was like the 1910s all over again, but this time with doomsday devices. The world woke up with a start to what it had wrought. In the liberal democracies of the American alliance, millions marched in campaigns for nuclear disarmament, sang protest songs, and lined up to see Dr. Strangelove. Coming-of-age-isms, assumption that war was good for absolutely nothing under any circumstances, swept the field. But none of this solved the planet's problem. As in every earlier age, so long as anyone thought that force might be the least bad answer to their problems, or so long as anyone thought that someone else might be thinking that, no one dared forgo weapons, and as with every vicious new weapon since the first stone axe, once the bomb had been invented, it could not be disinvented, Eisenhower's word. If all the warheads in the world were scrapped, they could be replaced in a matter of months, which might mean that banning the bomb would be the most dangerous action imaginable, because a treacherous enemy might secretly rebuild its arsenal and launch a devastating first strike before its rule-abiding rival could make enough bombs to deter it. Despite the runaway success of war and dozens of lesser protest songs in the late 1960s, most people apparently agreed with this logic. No nuclear-armed electorate ever voted in a party preaching disarmament. When the British Labour Party did promise to ban the bomb, it went down to an epic defeat. One of its own members of Parliament called its manifesto the longest suicide note in history. The cold-eyed men who handled the realities of nuclear war looked for more practical solutions. Some of these, such as installing a direct phone line via relays in London, Copenhagen, Stockholm and Helsinki, between Washington and Moscow, were easy. Others, such as reducing the immense stockpiles of warheads, were not. The United States stopped expanding its arsenal in 1966, but the Soviets did not follow suit for 20 years. As one American Secretary of Defense observed, when we build, they build. When we stop, they build. The most difficult step of all was finding strategies to contest the inner rim without bringing on the end of days. The American answer was a new policy of flexible response. Instead of threatening to kill hundreds of millions over any disagreement, the United States would react in proportion to the threat. But how would it decide what was proportionate? This definitional issue quickly raised its head in the wake of the European Empire's retreat from Southeast Asia. Americans agreed that keeping a foothold in the inner rim in this distant corner of the world was not important enough for nuclear war, but was it worth the bones of American soldiers? In his first year in office, Kennedy had grumbled, the troops will march in, the crowds will cheer, then we will be told we have to send in more troops. It's like taking a drink. All the same, he sent 8,000 advisers to South Vietnam. Two years later, there were twice as many. Four years after that, U.S. Marines splashed ashore at Da Nang, and by 1968, half a million Americans were fighting in Vietnam. Putting boots on the ground just brought on a flood of further decisions. Was interning civilians, 
a tried and true method for cutting off supplies to insurgents, proportionate? Yes, the White House decided. What about bombing North Vietnam? Sometimes. Or invading North Vietnam? No, because that might provoke Soviet escalation. Bombing and raiding communist positions in supposedly neutral Cambodia struck President Nixon as proportionate, but many Americans disagreed. Riots broke out. The National Guard shot four dead in Ohio. Consequently, when it came to the bigger step of interrupting communist supplies by building a fortified line across Laos, a militarily obvious move, which South Vietnamese generals argued would cut off the North's front from its rear, no president would say yes. The war dragged on, ultimately killing three or more million people. But despite this unsatisfactory beginning, NATO applied flexible response to Europe too. Here, war would mean the mother of all blitzkriegs. Under cover of the biggest air and artillery bombardment in history, 7,000 Soviet tanks would smash into the thin defensive screen along the inner German frontier, while crack troops arriving by parachute or helicopter sowed chaos a hundred miles to the rear. As the opening battles raged, those NATO planes that survived the initial air raids would strike all the way to Poland to shatter the second, third, and fourth echelons of Soviet armor before they reached the battlefield, while infantry hunkered down to blunt the first wave of Soviet tanks before it could break through the Fulda Gap or across the North German plain. NATO generals pinned their hopes on the apparent lessons of Egypt and Syria's attack on Israel in 1973, when, for a few days, poorly led and trained Arab infantry armed with wire-guided anti-tank missiles, had fought superbly led and trained Israeli tank crews to a standstill. It took less than two weeks for the Israelis to adapt, counterattack, and annihilate the Arab armies, but NATO gambled that their troops could hold out longer, long enough, the hope was, for American forces to rush across the Atlantic, pick up pre-positioned heavy equipment, and drive the Soviets back. This was much the way General John Hackett, a former commander of British forces in West Germany, imagined a war playing out in his widely read 1978 novel The Third World War. In his story, flexible response worked perfectly. After 17 days of conventional battle, the Soviet offensive stalled, and with American troops arriving to stiffen the line and even push back, the Soviets escalated. They launched a single SS-17 missile with a nuclear warhead, destroying Birmingham, England. 300,000 died. NATO responded proportionately with a nuclear strike on Minsk. The unstable Soviet regime then collapsed. I happened to be living in Birmingham in 1978, about two miles from Winston Green, Hackett's Ground Zero, and I did not like his prophecy one bit. But the reality, as the general knew perfectly well, would probably have been much worse. NATO anticipated being the first to go nuclear, using tactical devices, often equivalent to half a Hiroshima, to stop breakthroughs and also to signal that the attack must end. If Moscow ignored the message, bigger bombs, shells and warheads, typically worth half a dozen Hiroshimas, would be used. And if there was still no response by the time Soviet tanks were 60 miles into West Germany, the gloves would come off. Unfortunately, the Soviets showed not the slightest intention of thinking about H-bombs as subtle signals. Their plan called for tanks to reach the Rhine in two weeks, and the English Channel and Pyrenees after another four. To accomplish this, the first echelon would use 28 to 75 nuclear weapons to rip holes in the NATO line, and the second would fire another 34 to 100 during its armoured breakout. Expecting NATO to reply in kind, Soviet troops were equipped to fight on battlefields drenched in chemicals and radiation, concentrating quickly for attacks and then dispersing. West Germany would suffer several hundred Hiroshimas, killing most of the people who lived there. By that point, the ICBMs would be roaring over the North Pole. As Moscow saw it, a few days of total war would devastate both homelands, but once the warheads were used up, Conventional fighting would continue until one side could go on no longer. The official Soviet line was optimistic, 
probably, given what we now know about their atrocious infrastructure and organization, over-optimistic, about winning, but no one was actually looking forward to a war like this. Consequently, amid fierce debates, both superpowers started drifting toward an understanding, dressed up with the name détente, that would allow them to muddle through despite the inadequacy of flexible response as a strategy of deterrence. Talks about limiting nuclear weapons began in 1969, and in the 1970s the Soviets made concessions on human rights. Americans sold them grain and lent them dollars to make up for the mushrooming failures of collective farms and communist economies, and astronauts and cosmonauts joined hands in orbit. It all looked good, but none of it altered the realities. Two semi-global empires with enough firepower to destroy civilization remained locked in a competition over the Inner Rim. The Inner Rim continued to be run largely by unstable, unreliable proxies with their own agendas, and neither side could afford to lose. The strategic tug-of-war surged first one way, then the other. In 1972, President Richard Nixon scored a gigantic coup when Moscow's former client Mao decided that he did not hate the United States as much as he hated the Soviet Union. The strategic net tightened around Russia, but just a year later, the newest Arab-Israeli war wiped out many of the United States' gains. Arab oil producers quadrupled their prices, tipping the American alliance into economic crisis while flooding the oil-exporting Soviet Union with cash. The economic slowdown, anxieties over how to handle nuclear parity with the Soviets, and recriminations over the Vietnam War formed a toxic brew, shattering America's quarter-century-old strategic consensus over containment. Conservatives began arguing that only cutting back welfare spending and the bureaucracies that administered it could revive economic growth, without which containment would not work, and the Watergate scandal convinced many liberals that they did not hate the Soviets as much as they hated Nixon. With political gridlock paralyzing defense policies, the United States stood by as North Vietnam finally overran the South. By the late 1970s, the United States was in retreat everywhere. Communists were winning civil wars, and even an election in Africa and Latin America, as well as hearts and minds in Europe. One Christmas, 1976, I think, one of my uncles, an unemployed steelworker, actually gave me a copy of Mao's Little Red Book. In 1979, non-communist radicals in Iran got in on the game too, hurling the great Satan out of yet another part of the inner rim. The final straw came as the year ended, with the Soviets invading Afghanistan, still a strategic bridge linking heartland and inner rim in South Asia, just as it had been when Russia and Britain had contested it a century earlier. Détente collapsed. The United States rearmed furiously, deploying deadly new cruise missiles in Europe and talking up technologies that would slice through Soviet defences like a knife through butter. Paranoia turned to panic in Moscow in 1982, when Israelis used American-made computerized weapon systems to destroy 17 of Syria's 19 Soviet-made surface-to-air missile sites and to shoot down 92 of its Soviet planes for the loss of three, or six, depending who was counting, of their own. And while any sensible scientist could have told the Soviets that decades would pass before Star Wars, an American system for shooting ICBMs down with lasers, or Assault Breaker, a long-range rocket that scattered masses of computer-guided bomblets to destroy entire armoured divisions before they got to the front line, would actually work, in the febrile atmosphere of early 1980s Moscow, assuming the worst was a way of life. It all came to a head in November 1983, just six weeks after Stanislav Petrov had had to decide whether to believe his own computer algorithm when it said that the Americans were launching their missiles. Convinced that NATO was planning a first strike, the neurotic, diabetic Soviet premier, Yuri Andropov, confined to bed by his failing kidneys, pressured the KGB to find evidence of it. Ever dutiful, his spies reported back that a lot of American and British civil servants seemed to be working late in their offices. The only possible conclusion, the United States must be planning to use an upcoming military exercise in Western Europe as cover for an attack. 
Soviet aircraft in East Germany were armed with live nuclear weapons. Leave was cancelled. Even military weather forecasts were suspended, lest they give something away. Fortunately, the one sure thing in the Cold War was that no one could keep a secret. When I told the British, a senior KGB officer later reminisced to interviewers, they simply could not believe that the Soviet leadership was so stupid and narrow-minded as to believe in something so impossible. Opinions vary as to whether Andropov really was this stupid and narrow-minded, but American fear of Soviet fear reached the point that Reagan felt the need to dispatch General, later National Security Advisor, Brent Scowcroft to Moscow to persuade Andropov to step back from the brink. Once again, millions marched to ban the bomb. Bruce Springsteen released his remake of War. Anyone not worrying about the end of the world was not paying attention. And yet here we are, thirty years on, safer and richer than ever. Against all the odds, and in defiance of the trends of the last ten thousand years, the war to end war, and humanity itself, did not come. For every twenty nuclear warheads threatening our survival when Petrov picked up the phone in 1983, there is now, in mid-2013, just one. The chance of a mega-war killing a billion people in the next few years seems close to zero. How did we make it through these dangerous days? And how long will our luck hold out? These, it seems to me, are among the most important questions anyone can ask. The answers, though, lie in a place we rarely look. 6. Red in Tooth and Claw Why the Chimps of Gombe Went to War Killer Apes and Hippie Chimps January the 7th, 1974 In the early afternoon, a war party from Kasekala slipped unseen across the border into Kahaman territory. There were eight raiders, moving silently, purposefully, on a mission to kill. By the time Godi of Kahama saw them, it was too late. Godi leapt from the tree where he had been eating fruit and ran, but the attackers fell on him. One pinned Godi face down in the mud, the others, screaming with rage, punched and tore at him with their fangs for a full ten minutes. Finally, after hurling rocks at his body, the war party headed deeper into the forest. Godi was not dead, yet, but blood was pouring from dozens of gashes and punctures in his face, chest, arms and legs. After lying still for several minutes, mewling in pain, he crawled into the trees. He was never seen again. This was the first time that scientists had seen chimpanzees from one community deliberately seek out, attack, and leave for dead a chimpanzee from another. In 1960, Jane Goodall had set up the world's first project to study chimpanzees in the wild at Gombe in Tanzania, and for a decade she had delighted readers of National Geographic and viewers of her television specials with stories of the gentle, wise David Greybeard, the canny Flo, the mischievous Mike, and all their chimpanzee friends. But now the chimps were revealed as murderers. Worse followed. Over the next three years, the Kasekalans beat to death all six males and one female in the Kahama community. Two more Kahaman females went missing, presumed dead. Three more, beaten and raped, joined the Kasekalans, and finally the Kasekalans took over Kahama's territory. Godi's death had been the first blow in a war of extermination. News of the Gombe War rocked the world of primatology. The implications, it seemed, were enormous. We humans share more than 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees. When two closely related species behave in the same way, there is always a good chance that they have inherited this trait from a shared ancestral species. Since we only have to go back 7.5 million years, not long to an evolutionary biologist, to find the last common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans, the obvious conclusion seemed to be that humans are hardwired for violence. The 1970s were the golden days of coming of ageism, and, not surprisingly, this finding did not sit well with everyone. Some scholars blamed the messenger. Goodall, they insisted, had caused the war. In her efforts to get the chimpanzees comfortable around humans, she had fed them bananas, 
and competition over this rich food, the critics suggested, had corrupted the chimps' naturally peaceful society and turned it violent. The ensuing debate was just as bitter as the quarrels I described in Chapter 1 over the anthropologist Napoleon Chagnon's account of the fierce Yanomami, but Goodall did not have to wait as long as Chagnon to be proved right. In the 1970s and 80s, dozens of other scientists plunged into the African rainforest to live among apes. My account of the Gombe War and much else in the opening section of this chapter draws on the book Demonic Males that one of these scientists, Goodall's former graduate student Richard Wrangham, co-authored with Dale Peterson. Developing more sophisticated, less intrusive methods of observation, they soon showed that chimpanzees wage war whether humans feed them or not. Even as you read these words, gangs of male chimpanzees are patrolling the boundaries of their territories, everywhere from the Ivory Coast to Uganda, systematically hunting for foreign chimps to attack. They move silently and deliberately, not even taking time to eat. The most recent study, in Uganda, used GPS devices to track dozens of raids and 21 kills made by the Ngogo chimpanzee community between 1998 and 2008, ending in the annexation of a neighboring territory. The chimps' only weapons are fists, teeth, and the occasional rock or branch, but even an elderly chimp can hit harder than a heavyweight boxer, and their razor-sharp fangs can be four inches long. When they find enemies, they fight to kill, biting through fingers and toes, breaking bones, and ripping off faces. On one occasion, primatologists looked on in horror as attackers tore open their victim's throat and yanked out his windpipe. So Lord of the Flies would seem to have gotten it right. The beast is part of us, close, close, close. But as usually happens in new scientific fields, it quickly turned out that things were more complicated. When I brought up the Lord of the Flies theory in Chapter 1, I immediately had to add that a trip across the South Seas to another island, Samoa, put things in an entirely different perspective. There, Margaret Mead found evidence that convinced her that she had stumbled onto a Pacific paradise, where violence rarely reared its ugly head. In a similar way, if we leap 600 miles across the mighty Congo River from Gombe to a different patch of African rainforest called Wamba, it feels as if we have followed Alice through the looking glass into Wonderland. On December the 21st, 1986, the primatologist Genichi Idani was sitting at the edge of a clearing. He was waiting to see a party of apes pass through, but to his astonishment, not one but two parties simultaneously showed up. If Idani had been at Gombe, things might have turned very nasty in the next few minutes. There would have been threatening hoots between the parties, followed by mock charges and branch waving. Under the wrong circumstances, there might have been fighting and death. At Womba, though, none of that happened. The two parties sat down a few yards apart and stared at each other. After half an hour, a female from what the primatologists were calling the P group got up and ambled across the open ground toward a female from the E group. A moment passed, and then the two females lay down facing each other. Each spread her legs. They pressed their genitals together. They started moving their hips from side to side, faster and faster, rubbing their clitorises together and grunting. Within minutes, both apes were panting and shrieking, hugging each other tightly and going into spasms. For a tense moment, both fell silent, staring into each other's eyes, and then they collapsed, exhausted. By this point, the distance between the two parties had dissolved. Almost all the apes were sharing food, grooming, or having sex, Male with female, female with male, male with male, young with old, with hands, mouths, and genitals mingling indiscriminately. They were making love, not war. Over the next two months, Idani and his colleagues watched the P and E groups repeat this scene some thirty times. Not once did they see anything like the violence of the Gombe chimpanzees, but that was because the apes of Wamba were not chimpanzees. Not the same kind of chimpanzees, anyway. Technically, the Womba apes were pygmy chimpanzees, pan paniscus, while the Gombe apes were regular chimpanzees, pan troglodytes. To the untrained eye, the two species are almost indistinguishable, the pygmy variety being just slightly smaller, 
with arms and legs a little longer and thinner, mouths and teeth a little smaller, faces a little blacker, and hair parted in the middle. Primatologists only identified Pan paniscus as a separate species in 1928. The differences between them, though, help us answer the fundamental question of what war is good for and what will happen to humanity in the 21st century. Pygmy chimpanzees, to avoid confusion, scientists usually call them bonobos, journalists often call them hippie chimps, and regular chimpanzees, usually just called chimpanzees without any qualifying adjective, have almost identical DNA, having diverged from their shared ancestor just 1.3 million years ago. Even more surprisingly, the two kinds of apes are genetically equidistant from humans. If chimpanzee wars suggest that humans might be natural-born killers, bonobo orgies suggest we could equally well be natural-born lovers. Rather than pulling out their swords and stabbing at the Gropian mountain, Agricola and Calgacus might have torn off their togas and rubbed their genitals together. Explaining why there was stabbing rather than rubbing in AD 83 will also show us why, after 10,000 years of regularly choosing war over words, we did not go ahead and blow the world to pieces in the later 20th century. It will also hint at how we might maintain this record in the 21st. But it is a long story. 3.8 billion years long, in fact. The Game of Death In the beginning there were blobs. At least, that is what biologists often call them. Short chains of carbon-based molecules held together by crude membranes. These blobs began forming about 3.8 billion years ago through chemical reactions between simple proteins and nucleic acids. The blobs grew by absorbing chemicals, and when they got too big for their membranes, they split into multiple blobs. Each time a blob split, its component chemicals knew how to recombine into new blobs because the ground plan for blobbishness was encoded in ribonucleic acid, RNA, which told proteins what to do. Undramatic as it sounds, this was the beginning of life. Darwin famously defined evolution as descent with modification. RNA, or in complicated life forms such as ourselves, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, copies genetic code almost, but not quite, perfectly, introducing random genetic mutations. Most of these made little difference to the blobs. A few were catastrophic, causing the blobs to break apart, killing them, we might say, and others made the blobs replicate better. Over time, a lot of time, more efficient blobs out-reproduced less efficient blobs. Evolution may be the one thing in the world that is even more paradoxical than war. Natural selection is a competition, but the biggest rewards go to cooperation, resulting, to cut this 3.8 billion year long story short, in the evolution of ever more complex carbon-based life forms that cooperate and compete in extraordinary ways. 300 million years of random genetic mutations produced blobs able to cooperate well enough to form cells, more sophisticated bundles of carbon-based molecules clustered around strings of DNA. Cells outcompeted blobs for access to energy in the Earth's primeval oceans, and by 1.5 billion years ago had become much more complicated. For the previous two billion years, all life had reproduced by cloning, and mistakes in genetic copying were the only source of modification. The new cells, however, could cooperate by sharing the information in their DNA, that is, by sexual reproduction. Sex massively increased the variation in the gene pool, sending evolution into overdrive. By 600 million years ago, some cells were sharing genetic information so thoroughly that they could band together by the millions to make multicellular organisms. Our own bodies contain about 100 billion cells each. The cells in these animals cooperated by taking on different functions. Some turned into gills and stomachs to process energy in new ways, others into blood to carry this energy around the body, and others still into shells, cartilage and bones. By 400 million years ago, some fish found their gills turning into lungs and their fins into feet. They invaded the land. 
The cells in fins or feet did not compete with those in stomachs or bones. Instead, they cooperated to make a creature that could compete more successfully against other clusters of cells to get the energy that all such animals needed. The result was an evolutionary arms race. It took hundreds of millions of years, but some cells specialized to be sensitive to light, sound, touch, taste, or smell, and the resulting eyes, ears, skin, tongues, and noses gave animals information on where to go and what to do. Nerves carried this information to a single point, normally at the front end of the animal, where they knotted together into tiny brains. Animals that became aware of their own bodies, where their skin was, where they themselves ended and the rest of the world began, tended to compete better than those unaware of such boundaries, and those aware of their own awareness competed better still. The brain became conscious of the animal it was lodged within as an individual. It formulated hopes, fears, and dreams. The animal became an I, and mind came into the world. That the blind, undirected process of descent with modification has, over the last three billion years, turned carbon blobs into poets, politicians, and Stanislav Petrov does seem like something of a miracle, and we need hardly be surprised that until Darwin's day, almost every human who ever lived saw the hand of gods behind the wonder of life. But this astounding story also had a darker side. Around 400 million years ago, the mouths of some fish sprouted cartilaginous teeth, sharp enough and set in jaws strong enough to tear the flesh of other animals. These proto-sharks had found a shortcut in the competition for energy. They could steal the energy locked up in other animals' bodies by eating them, and if they bumped into other proto-sharks competing for the same piece of food or the same sexual partner, they could fight. Teeth raised competition to a new level, and other animals responded by growing scales for defense, speed for fleeing, and teeth of their own, or stings, poison sacs, and, on land, claws and fangs, for striking back. Violence had evolved. This did not turn the world into a free-for-all. When one animal runs into another that can fight back, it thinks twice before attacking. Animals that are heavily armed with fangs and claws will growl, bare their teeth, or puff up feathers or fur rather than simply assaulting one another. If bravado fails and the rival does not crawl, run, swim, or fly away, things may reach the point of locking horns or butting heads until one contestant recognizes that it is losing and yields. But tussling like this is a risky business, regularly causing serious injuries, and every species has evolved ways to avoid actual fighting through elaborate signals of submission, such as groveling, presenting bellies or rears, and even urinating with fear. Explaining this behavior will provide the key to making sense of much of the behavior we heard about among our own species in chapters 1 to 5, but to get to the answers, we must turn from biology to mathematics. Imagine, mathematicians say, two animals simultaneously coming across a tasty morsel or available mate. Will they fight? All kinds of factors will play into the decision, and no two animals will act in exactly the same way. Take my own two dogs. One, Fuzzy, thinks everyone is his friend, and he turns every encounter into a frenzy of tail-wagging, sniffing, and licking. The other, Milo, assumes that every other dog, except Fuzzy, is out to get him. There will be snarling, lunging, and straining at the leash. Given the chance, he will bite first and sniff later. And yet, mathematicians observe, Behind the almost infinite variety of animal personalities and actual encounters, there are patterns. Fighting has consequences for the participant's genetic success. The effects can be direct, as when the winner passes on genes by procreating, or the loser drops out of the gene pool by getting injured or dying, but more often they are indirect. A winner might eat, storing energy for procreating later, or win prestige, becoming more attractive to mates and more intimidating to rivals. A loser might go hungry or lose face. Few animals, including humans, calculate quite so coldly when a confrontation gets going. Instead, we are taken over by hormones that have evolved precisely to help us make quick decisions. K. 
Chemicals flood our brains. We panic and run away, wag tails and approach, or see red, the mad blood stirring, said Shakespeare, and lash out in anger. The choices each animal makes, though, affect its chances of transmitting genes to the next generation, and thanks to the relentless logic of natural selection, behaviours that favour transmission gradually replace those that don't. We might think of these confrontations, the mathematicians suggest, as games, and assign points on a league table of genetic success for the different moves an animal might make. Game theory, which is what scientists call this exercise, simplifies reality wildly, but it helps us see how each species, including humans, evolves its own balance between fight, fright, and flight. I will borrow an example from the evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Let us say, he proposes in his best-selling book, The Selfish Gene, that an animal that wins a confrontation picks up 50 points in the race for genetic success, while one that loses gets zero. Getting hurt costs a player 100 points, and a long confrontation that wastes time, which could be more profitably spent eating or mating somewhere else, costs the animal 10 points. If the two animals facing off are doves, not real doves, this is mathematics, so dove is a symbol, standing for an animal that never fights. They will not come to blows. They both want the mate, food or status under dispute, though, so a standoff ensues, with much puffing up and hard staring. This goes on until one bird loses patience and flies off. The winner then gets 50 points, but loses 10 for time wasted, for a net gain of plus 40. The dove that backs down scores minus 10, zero gained and 10 points lost for its time. The average outcome of such face-offs, repeated millions of times over thousands of years, is plus 15 points, the winner's 40 points added to the loser's minus 10 divided by 2. But what if one of the doves is actually a hawk? Again, this is a mathematical hawk, which just means an animal that always fights. The hawk neither stares nor puffs up, it attacks and the dove flees. If every confrontation this hawk gets into is against a dove, the hawk always scores 50 points, with no points lost because no time has been wasted, much more than the plus 15 a dove averages with its strategy. The result? Hawkish genes spread through the dovish population. But now the paradox of evolution kicks in. As the number of hawks increases, it becomes more likely that a hawk will find itself facing another hawk rather than a dove, and both will attack. One hawk will win, plus 50 points. For simplicity's sake, I will assume it is unhurt. And the other will be wounded, losing 100 points. The overall yield, 50 minus 100, shared between the two animals, is minus 25 points. In this situation, the remaining doves do rather well. Because they always flee, they always score zero points, which is a lot better than the minus 25 that the hawks are making. Dove genes start spreading back through the population. The scoring system Dawkins deployed in this game means that the gene pool will drift toward a sweet spot, what biologists call an evolutionarily stable strategy, at which five out of every twelve animals act like doves and the other seven like hawks. Random mutations, luck, and all kinds of other forces constantly push the actual numbers away from this balance, only for the game of death to pull them back again. Each species, including our own, will have outliers, its fuzzies and milos, but most members are somewhere in the middle, nudged by the game of death toward the evolutionarily stable strategy, with its own distinctive form of violence. The abstract game of death lays bare the principles behind the use of force in every kind of animal. It suggests that our own violence, like that of other creatures, must be an evolutionary adaptation, descended with modification from the habits of ancestors millions of years ago. But at the same time, game theory also shows us the peculiarities of human violence. We regularly kill rather than just chase off enemies. Since winners who fight to the death face more risks than winners who accept submission, killers should on average get lower payoffs from the game of death than non-killers. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, 
and so does he who recognizes signals of submission and lets the loser go. So why, we have to ask, when Gaudi jumped out of his tree at Gombe in 1974 and ran for dear life, did the Cassic Islands chase him, pin him down, and beat him to death? Why did they go on to kill the rest of the Kahaman males? Why have chimpanzees embraced lethal violence as part of their evolutionarily stable strategy? And why have we? A little help from my friends. Part of the answer is obvious. The attack that killed Gaudi differed in one crucial way from the abstract experiments of game theory. It was eight against one. The Kahaman chimp never stood a chance, and his attackers knuckle-walked away with barely a scratch on them. One of the Kasakalans was so old that his teeth were worn down to stumps, but at those odds he happily joined in the bloodbath. Eight-to-one attacks are a special kind of violence, only possible for animals that can cooperate to form gangs. It has taken an awful lot of evolution to produce this blend of cooperation and competition. Three and a half billion years ago, some blobs evolved to cooperate so well that they could become cells, which could compete for energy more effectively than crude blobs. Around 1.5 billion years ago, some cells worked together so well that they could reproduce sexually, generating more mutations and offspring than asexual cells. By 600 million years ago, some of these complex cells were cooperating so much that they formed multicelled animals, with yet more advantages in the competition to pass on their genes. But only in the last 100 million years have some of these animals raised cooperation still higher, forming multi-animal societies. Biologists call these organisms social animals. All birds and mammals are at least slightly social, in that mothers and their young form strong bonds, but a few dozen species go well beyond this. They form permanent communities, with anywhere from dozens to billions of members, each one of whom has his or her own functions in a larger division of labor. Only social animals can form gangs and engage in an activity like killing Gaudi. Humans, the cleverest animals on earth, are highly social. So too are dolphins, killer whales, and non-human apes, which also stand out for brain power. But before we jump to the conclusion that braininess causes sociability, we should bear in mind that ants, arguably the most sociable animals of all, are also among the stupidest. Although ant cooperation reaches such heights that biologists call their colonies superorganisms, with millions of insects acting together as if they made up one giant animal, ant experts also call these superorganisms civilization by instinct because individual ants have such sketchy mental lives that the knot of nerve endings in an ant's head barely counts as a brain at all. Ganglion is the preferred term. Some 10,000 species of ants are known, and far more wait to be classified. Some of these species are very peaceful, while others fight constantly. Just as some cells in an animal's body turn into blood while others become teeth, some female ants in each colony turn into reproductive queens, while others become sterile workers, and in warlike species some also grow up to be soldiers. Without ever really thinking about what they are doing, they wage savage wars driven by smell. Since there are so many kinds of ants, there are many different patterns, but one of the commonest is that soldier ants smell the workers in their colony by tapping them with their antennae which function rather like our noses. If foragers go out in the morning but do not come back, the absence of their smells triggers a response that sends the soldiers rushing out to confront whatever is detaining the foragers. After about one-fifth of the soldiers have marched out, the remaining four-fifths react to the new chemical balance in the air by staying put as a reserve in case some other ant colony should exploit their absence to seize the unoccupied nest. If the expeditionary force finds that enemy ants are killing the missing foragers, it does not just rush to attack the foe. Instead, the soldier ants do more tapping and smelling, and if this tells them that they outnumber the enemy, they charge, clamping their jaws around the hostile ants' abdomens and breaking them in two. If the odds seem balanced, they will have a standoff, 
waving their feelers, and if they sense that they are outnumbered, they run home. When the imbalance in numbers is extreme, the stronger force might storm the weaker's nest, massacring its queen and soldiers and carrying off its babies to raise as slaves. Biologists draw three broad conclusions from this. First, since some species of unintelligent ants and some species of highly intelligent apes wage lethal gang warfare while other species do not, powerful brains are neither necessary nor sufficient for this kind of behavior. Second, we can conclude that sociability is necessary for lethal gang warfare because only sociable animals can form gangs, cooperating to attack enemies at such unfair odds that they can safely fight to the death. The third conclusion, however, is that sociability by itself is not a sufficient cause for lethal violence because some species of sociable apes and ants do not form murderous mobs. For animals to make killing part of their evolutionarily stable strategy, some other factor must be driving up the payoff from lethal aggression, and the natural histories of ants and apes suggest that this secret ingredient is territory. When animals have valuable territories to compete over, the payoff from killing enemies rises. Each time the chimpanzees of Kasekala raided into Kahama during the Gombe War, the Kahama chimps retaliated by raiding back into Kasekala. If the Kasekalans had scared Gotti but let him get away on January 7, 1974, they could have been confident he would have joined the next raid against them. But if they killed him, they could be certain he would not. And if they killed all the Kahaman males, they could take over their land and surviving females. Here we confront one of the biggest paradoxes of war. Territoriality drove up the payoff from killing for those ants and apes sociable enough to be able to do it safely, but when, at the end of the Ice Age, population growth and farming began caging human societies in the lucky latitudes, this extreme version of territoriality pushed our ancestors into productive war, which raised the payoffs from not killing defeated enemies. Instead, societies that recognized signals of submission and absorbed losers became safer and richer and outcompeted their rivals until, eventually, one of them turned into a globocop. I will return to this odd outcome toward the end of the chapter. For now, though, I want to focus on the facts that, for all their differences, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans are all sociable and territorial, and all descend from a shared ancestor, usually called protopan, from the Greek words for ancestral ape. Clearly, this ancestral species had the potential to develop wildly different evolutionarily stable strategies. Something happened seven or eight million years ago to set chimpanzees and humans on the road to violence. Then, around 1.3 million years ago, something else happened to push bonobos away from using violence against their own kind, although they do hunt monkeys for meat, and in one disturbing case, several adult bonobos were seen to cannibalize a dead bonobo baby, with the baby's mother leading the way. Finally, in the last 10,000 years, yet another development made us humans react to caging by becoming less violent. But what? Planet of the Apes I want to look first at the chimpanzee-bonobo split, which, study of the two apes' DNA tells us, began around 1.3 million years ago. This makes it much more recent than the human protopan split, dating back some 7.5 million years. Unfortunately, though, we know less about it, because fossils do not survive well in the tropical rainforest where it happened. This forces us to work with indirect lines of evidence. DNA analysis suggests that as recently, on an evolutionary scale, as two million years ago, the now extinct protopans roamed over a central African rainforest the size of the continental United States. But nothing lasts forever, and as the climate fluctuated over the following half million years, a great inland lake in East Africa burst its banks. The water flowed north and west toward the Atlantic, turning into what is now the mighty, mile-wide Congo River. Impassable to apes, this split Protopan's kingdom in two. By 1.3 million years ago, apes north of the Congo were evolving into chimpanzees, 
and those south of the river into bonobos. The forests on either side of the river were not wildly different, and apes in both places ate mostly fruit, seeds, and, when they could catch them, monkeys. South of the Congo, however, the apes that eventually evolved into bonobos expanded their diet by eating young leaves and shoots. Their bodies adapted to this diet, growing teeth with long, shearing edges to tear up their greens. Bonobos do not find leaves and shoots as tasty as fruits, seeds, and monkey meat, but leaves and shoots are more plentiful, and they keep bonobos full between real meals. Leaves and shoots, says the biological anthropologist Richard Wrangham, are bonobo snack food. Just why bonobos fill up on these snacks, and chimpanzees do not, remains controversial, but in their book, Demonic Males, Wrangham and his co-author Dale Peterson suggest that it is because gorillas, who also eat shoots and leaves, went extinct south of the Congo, but hung on north of it. This left the southern branch of Proto-Pan without competitors for shoots and leaves, and so any random genetic mutation that made it easier for an ape to eat this extra food flourished. The mutations spread through the gene pool, and Proto-Pan began evolving into bonobos. North of the river, however, Proto-Pan still lived alongside gorillas, and since no hundred-pound Proto-Pan that challenged the proverbial four-hundred-pound gorilla for a leaf would last long enough to pass on its genes, chimpanzees did not evolve to eat these foods. Other primatologists suggest different explanations, such as small differences between the two sides of the Congo in climate or the concentration of good foods, which might have made growing new kinds of teeth and adapting to new foods worthwhile for bonobos but not for chimpanzees. Eventually, as techniques improve and data pile up, scientists will surely answer this question. For our purposes, though, what really matters is not the cause of the divergence in diets, but its consequences, because, unlikely as it may sound, snacks sent bonobos down the path toward peace and love, while chimps took off along the hard road of violence. Because they can fill up on leaves and shoots when they cannot find fruits and their other favorite foods, bonobos can travel in large, stable groups, typically about 16 animals. Chimpanzees, however, regularly have to split up into very small groups of two to eight animals, because they cannot find enough fruit to feed larger parties. Godi's disastrous decision to strike off on his own in 1974 was entirely typical for a chimpanzee, but would have been very eccentric for a bonobo. The result, of course, is that bonobos almost never find themselves outnumbered eight to one. But that is not all. Chimpanzee groups also tend to split up in very specific ways when they go foraging. Males can travel faster than females, especially females burdened with babies, and so males often head off in single-sex groups. Female chimps, however, often resort to foraging individually, because they move too slowly to cover enough ground in a day to find enough food to support a bigger group. All this is in striking contrast to the snack-rich bonobos. As well as being large and stable, their foraging parties normally have roughly equal numbers of males and females. At this point, the absence of snacks in chimpanzee land turns ugly. Groups of half a dozen males are regularly running into isolated females. The males do not always rape the females, but it happens with alarming regularity. At these odds, females have no real chance of fighting off attackers. What fighting does take place instead tends to be among the males over who gets access to the female. Over the last million-plus years, male chimpanzees have evolved two very specific features because of their inability to subsist on snacks, hawkishness, and huge testicles. Because rape is always an option, males who will fight are more likely to pass on their genes than males who will not, and because females often end up having sex with multiple males in a single day, males who have large testes to pump out the biggest possible load of sperm, increasing the odds of being the lucky fellow who fertilizes the egg, have a reproductive advantage over those who do not. So important is this quirk of ape evolution that biologists have created an entire subfield called sperm competition theory. On average, chimpanzee testicles weigh a whopping quarter pound, while gorillas, 
despite having bodies four times as big, have testicles weighing just an ounce. This is because each alpha male gorilla monopolizes a harem of females and faces little competition from other gorillas' sperm. Bonobos have huge testicles too, because male bonobos, like male chimpanzees, are locked in competition to impregnate females who have multiple sexual partners. Unlike what goes on among chimps, however, bonobo sperm competitions are almost entirely non-violent. Males rarely outnumber females, and if a male courts his intended too aggressively, other females are likely to gang up on him, chasing him away with hoots and threats. Female chimpanzees do sometimes cooperate against rapists, but nowhere near so effectively. Male bonobos win the sperm competition not by fighting each other, but by making themselves agreeable to females. One of the best methods, it seems, is to be a good son. Bonobo mothers use their friendships among the females to make sure that their own sons find girlfriends. In the land of the bonobos, mama's boys finish first. Across a million or so years, the payoffs of dovishness soared among bonobos. The meek inherited the rainforest, and bonobos of both sexes evolved to be smaller, more delicate, and just plain nicer than chimpanzees. In all my experience, Robert Yerkes, the founding father of primatology, said of Prince Chim, the first bonobo in captivity, I have never met an animal the equal of Prince Chim in approach to physical perfection, alertness, adaptability, and agreeableness of disposition. Whether Prince Chim felt the same way about Yerkes, who locked him up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and trained him to eat with a fork at a miniature table, we will never know. The Naked Ape The evolutionary paths that led to Chim and Yerkes branched about 7.5 million years ago. Around then, apes living at the edges of the great central African rainforest began evolving away from Proto-Pan and toward us, the only animals with the capacity to cage their own beast. Once again, food seems to have been at the centre of things. Because fruit trees thin out in these dry borderlands, giving way first to mixed woodland and then to open savannas, apes had to find new things to eat if they were to live there. Since adversity is the mother of evolutionary invention, all kinds of genetic mutations flourished as the apes adapted. Anthropologists have given these creatures wonderful exotic names. Sahelanthropus, north of the rainforest, Ardipithecus, east of it, and different kinds of Australopithecus all around it. But I will call them collectively proto-humans. To the non-expert eye, proto-human bones look much like any other apes, but great changes were underway. Over a few million years, molar teeth grew bigger and flatter, thickly coated with enamel. This made them ideal for crunching up hard, dry foods, and chemical analysis shows that the foods in question were tubers and the roots of grasses. These are good sources of carbohydrates and are available even in dry spells when the above-ground parts of plants shrivel up, if apes can dig them up and chew them. Any mutation that made paws nimbler would therefore make proto-humans fatter, stronger, and probably better at fighting too, and altogether more likely to spread their genes through the population. The anatomy of ankles and finds of actual footprints left by proto-humans taking strolls through soft ash and mud that then hardened into stone show that the shift was underway by four million years ago. Proto-humans had begun walking on their hind legs, freeing up their front legs to turn into arms. These creatures were certainly still very different from us, however. They were only four feet tall, probably covered in hair, and still spent a lot of time in trees. They rarely, if ever, made stone tools and certainly could not talk, and it is a fair bet that the males still had testicles on the chimpanzee bonobo scale. But however ape-like they were, they more than made up for it by mutating toward bigger and bigger brains. Four million years ago, the average Australopithecus sported 22 cubic inches of grey matter, less than modern chimpanzees, which typically have 25 cubic inches. By three million years ago, this had increased to 28 cubic inches, and another million years after that to 38. Today we average 86 cubic inches. It might seem self-evident that big brains are better than small ones, 
But the logic of evolution is more complicated. Brains are expensive to run. Our own typically make up 2% of our body weight, but use up 20% of the energy we consume. Mutations producing bigger brains only spread if the brain tissue that is added pays for itself by bringing in the extra food it needs. In the middle of the rainforest, this was rarely the case, because apes did not need to be Einsteins to find leaves and fruit. In the dry woodlands and savanna, however, brain power and food supply rose together in a virtuous spiral. Smart woodland apes dug up roots and tubers, which paid for bigger brains. The even smarter apes this produced figured out better ways to hunt, and meat paid for even more of the expensive grey cells. Armed with all this brain power, proto-humans went straight to work on inventing weapons. Modern chimpanzees and bonobos have been known to use sticks and stones to catch food and hit each other, but by 2.4 million years ago, proto-humans had already realized that they could bash pebbles together to make sharp cutting edges. Telltale marks show that they used these choppers, as archaeologists call them, to slice meat off animal bones, although so far we have found no signs that they used them to slice each other. Biologists conventionally treat the combination of brains over 38 cubic inches and the ability to make tools as the threshold at which apes became homo, mankind in Latin, the genus to which we, homo sapiens, wise man, belong. And over the next half million years, homo began looking and acting much more like us. Around 1.8 million years ago, in the space of a few thousand generations, the blinking of an evolutionary eye, average adult height shot up above five feet. Bones became lighter, with jaws that protruded less and noses that protruded more. Sexual dimorphism, the size difference between males and females, declined toward the range we find among modern people, and proto-humans shifted permanently from tree to ground living. The label that biologists use for these new creatures is Homo augusta, working man, chosen to reflect their skill at making tools and weapons. Some of these can be quite beautiful, made from carefully selected stones and finished with delicate touches from wood and bone hammers, all of which required careful coordination, forward planning, and, of course, bigger brains still, 53 cubic inches by 1.7 million years ago. Homo augusta paid for its huge head with a peculiar trade-off. Its guts got smaller. Earlier proto-humans had rib cages that flared out at the bottom, like those of modern apes, to accommodate enormous intestines, but Homo augusta's ribs were more like ours. This left less room for yards of digestive tubing, which poses a difficult question for anthropologists. Apes have huge bowels so they can digest the fibrous raw plants they live on. Smaller guts would mean that Homo agaster was extracting less energy from its food, but its bigger brain called for more energy. So what was going on? The answer, we can be fairly certain, is that Homo agaster was the first proto-human that could make fire at will and used this new skill to cook. Cooking makes food easier to digest, which made enormous intestines, along with the huge flat teeth and powerful jaws earlier proto-humans had needed to chew up raw tubers, roots, and grass, redundant. All now disappeared. This, Richard Wrangham suggests in his marvellous book Catching Fire, was as much of a turning point in the evolution of human violence as snacks were for bonobos. Any time a chimpanzee catches a monkey or finds a particularly tasty breadfruit, Wrangham has observed from his many years in the rainforest, males materialize from all around, and fighting frequently breaks out. Even sweet-natured bonobos find it difficult to enjoy a morsel of monkey brain without being besieged by jostling beggars. It is hard, Wrangham observes, to imagine how either kind of ape could have cooked food without it all being stolen, in which case this adaptation would not have paid off and would not have spread through the population. This forces us to conclude, Wrangham suggests, that when cooking caught on, it did so as part of a package deal with another great change, the shift from living in large, sexually promiscuous troops, like chimpanzees or bonobos, to male-female pair bonding. When chimpanzees and bonobos look for food, it is every ape for itself, 
with males and females active as both hunters and gatherers. Among modern human hunter-gatherers, though, men typically do nearly all the hunting and women nearly all the gathering, and they then share the food with each other and their offspring. The details vary according to where in the world people live, but in pretty much every hunter-gatherer society, woman's work includes cooking and man's work includes threatening or even attacking anyone trying to steal the couple's food. This raises the costs of theft, changing the evolutionarily stable strategy. Families replace troops as the foundation of society, with elaborate rules of sharing and etiquette evolving to take care of the elderly, orphans and others without their own home and hearth. These changes must have revolutionized proto-human As our ancestors shifted from ape-like sex lives to pair bonding, proto-men's best strategy for passing on their genes shifted too, from fighting their way to the front of the line and flooding proto-women with semen toward skill at courting and providing. If Homo Augusta males still had quarter-pound testicles, they would have been as much of an expensive luxury as enormous intestines. Proto-men still faced sperm competition from seducers and rapists and could not get away with gonads as tiny as alpha male gorillas, but by modern times our testes had shrunk to just 1.5 ounces. Along with huge scrotums, proto-men also lost a rather revolting feature of bonobo and chimpanzee penises, a little spur on the side that works to scoop any old deposits of semen out of a partner's vagina before inserting a new one. The fact that bonobos and chimpanzees both have these spurs strongly suggests that our last shared ancestor had them too, and that proto-humans lost their spurs because they no longer needed them. In their place, proto-men grew supersized phalluses. The average human erection is about six inches long, but chimpanzees and bonobos manage just three inches, and gorillas a meagre inch and a quarter. Proto-women returned the compliment by growing breasts that looked like mountains compared with the molehills on other apes. These anatomical peculiarities led Desmond Morris, a one-time keeper of primates at London Zoo, to conclude in his famous book, The Naked Ape, that humans are the sexiest primate alive. This was 50 years ago, before primatologists had discovered what bonobos get up to. Remarkably, zoologists cannot seem to agree on why human breasts and penises ballooned. The inability of 20th century science to formulate an adequate theory of penis length, Jared Diamond dryly muses, is a glaring failure. But the obvious guess is that shifting from fighting for mates to courting them put a high priority on sending signals of sexual fitness, both to the opposite sex and to same-sex rivals. What better way to do that than by flaunting ostentatiously enormous organs? By 1.3 million years ago, the point at which bonobos and chimpanzees began diverging, proto-humans had already evolved very, very far from other apes. Just how that affected strategies of trauma, though, remains controversial, because we currently have nowhere near enough fossil skeletons to get a sense of how many proto-humans were bludgeoned, stabbed, and otherwise done to death. To date, only one body dating back more than a million years bears traces of lethal trauma, and even that is not a certain case of deliberate killing. Only in the last half million years, when skeletons became much more common, do we find unambiguously fatal wounds. But given the similarities between the ways chimpanzees and modern humans fight, we can make some fairly secure speculations. In both populations, violence is overwhelmingly the preserve of young males, who are likely to be bigger, stronger and angrier than females or old males. There is a saying that when you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, and to young male chimps and humans, wrapped in muscles and soaked in testosterone, many problems look like ones that force will solve. Primatologists tell us that males commit well over 90% of assaults among chimpanzees, and policemen tell us that the human statistics are very similar. Young males, human or chimpanzee, will fight over almost anything, with sex and prestige as the major flashpoints, and material goods a rather distant third and they are most likely to turn homicidal when they get together in gangs that outnumber their enemies. 
Evolutionists cannot at this point prove that humans and chimpanzees inherited the practice of lethal male gang violence from proto-pan, but it is certainly the most economical conclusion. If that is right, we should probably also conclude that starting about 1.8 million years ago, pair bonding made fighting less useful than courting as a mating strategy among Homo ergaster, but did not reduce its value as a way to deal with rival communities of proto-humans. Bonobos, by contrast, began evolving in an entirely different direction 1.3 million years ago, as female solidarity reduced the payoffs to male violence across the board. Pair bonding might actually have reduced the scope for bonobo-like group solidarity among proto-women. As archaeologists excavate more skeletons, the details will become clearer. But the one thing we can already be certain about is that the proto-humans' new evolutionarily stable strategy was hugely successful. Homo went forth and multiplied as no ape had done before. Over the course of a thousand centuries, our ancestors spread across much of Africa, and a thousand centuries more of gradual extensions of their grazing ranges took them as far as what we now call England and Indonesia, the earliest skeleton with signs of violence in fact comes from Java. They moved into environments utterly different from the East African savanna, and, predictably, mutations flourished. Almost every year now brings an announcement that archaeologists or geneticists have discovered yet another new species of proto-human in Asia or Europe. By half a million years ago, one of these proto-human variants, known after its original find spot in Germany as Heidelberg Man, had evolved brains almost as big as ours, and over the next few hundred thousand years, Neanderthals, also named after an original find spot in Germany, actually grew brains bigger than ours, albeit flatter, with some areas therefore less developed. One or both species might have communicated in ways we would call speech, and they definitely found new ways to kill, using resin and sinews taken from other animals to attach stone spearheads to wooden shafts. Archaeologists have found enough Neanderthal skeletons to know that they were very, very violent. At least two skulls bear healed traces of non-fatal stabbings. Stone spearheads are common on Neanderthal sites, and head and neck traumas even more so. The closest parallel to Neanderthal bone breakage patterns comes in fact from modern rodeo riders, but since there were no bucking broncos a hundred thousand years ago, we probably have to assume that Neanderthals got hurt fighting. Possibly all these fights were against their prey, but since their prey sometimes included other Neanderthals, the evidence of occasional cannibalism is overwhelming, it is hard not to suspect that the big-brained Neanderthals were the most violent of all the great apes. Clever, well-armed, and extraordinarily strong, two leading archaeologists describe them as combining the physique of a powerful wrestler with the endurance of a marathon runner. By 100,000 BC, they had extended their range from Central Asia to the Atlantic. But then along came us. 2.7 pounds of magic. Inside your head is a little piece of magic. Nothing else in nature can compare with the 2.7 pounds of water, fat, blood, and protein pulsing away inside your skull, guzzling energy and fairly crackling with electricity. 400 million years in the making, this brain sets us apart from every other animal on earth and has changed everything about the place of force in our lives. Archaeologists and geneticists agree that this miracle of nature took on its fully modern form in Africa somewhere between 200,000 and 50,000 years ago. This was a time when new twigs were sprouting off the proto-human branch of the Tree of Life with particular vigour, perhaps because an extremely unstable climate kept changing the payoffs in the games of life and death. It was a wild ride. Temperatures 200,000 years ago were distinctly cooler than today's, on average perhaps three degrees Fahrenheit lower. But then, amid many wild zigs and zags, they tumbled into a genuine ice age. By 150,000 years ago, the world was 14 degrees Fahrenheit colder than today. Mile-thick glaciers blanketed much of northern Asia, Europe, and America, 
tying up so much water that the sea level fell 300 feet below what we are used to. No one could live on the glaciers, and the vast arid steppes around their edges, where winds howled and dust storms raged, were little better. Even near the equator, summers were short, water was scarce, and low levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide stunted plant growth. Humans that looked just like us, with high domed skulls, flat faces and small teeth, first walked the earth in these years. Excavated fossil remains and DNA studies both agree on this, suggesting that the first modern humans evolved in East Africa between 200,000 and 150,000 years ago. The odd thing about the earliest finds, though, is that while these great apes chipped stone tools, hunted and gathered, and fought and mated, little we find on their sites is very different from what we find on sites belonging to Neanderthals or other proto-humans. Just why this is remains hotly debated, but it was not until after the world had warmed up for a few millennia and then crashed into another ice age that humans started acting like us as well as looking like us. Beginning between 100,000 and 70,000 years ago, odd things start turning up on archaeological sites. People were now decorating themselves, something previous proto-humans did not do. They collected eggshells and spent hours chipping and grinding little disks out of them. Using just a pointed bone, they would drill a hole through the middle of each disk and string hundreds together in necklaces. They swapped these ornaments with each other, sometimes trading them across hundreds of miles. Proto-humans were acting a lot less proto and a lot more human. They gathered ochre, a kind of iron ore, and used it to draw bold red lines on cave walls and probably on each other's bodies. At Blombos Cave in South Africa, someone even scratched simple geometric patterns onto a little stick of ochre 75,000 years ago, making it not just the oldest known work of art, but also a work of art used for making other works of art. People coaxed their fingers into producing tiny tools, lighter and subtler than anything seen before, and then used some of the tools as weapons. The oldest known carved bones include fish hooks, and among the oldest known stone bladelets, as archaeologists call the tiny tools, are arrowheads and javelin points. Bird and fish bones from caves along Africa's southern shores show that people used these devices to kill prey that had previously been beyond their reach. Remains of their shoulder and elbow joints suggest that Neanderthals, for all their fierceness, could not throw very well, let alone shoot arrows. Like Neanderthals, early Homo sapiens also occasionally ate their own kind, using stone blades to carve the flesh off meaty long bones and stone hammers to crack bones to extract marrow and the tastiest treat of all, the miraculous human brain. A steady trickle of bashed-in skulls uncovered by archaeologists strongly suggests that humans were killing each other, but we have to wait until 30,000 years ago to find decisive evidence. This comes not from mutilated skeletons, but from the famous paintings that Homo sapiens began leaving on cave walls in northern Spain and southern France. These are things of exquisite beauty. None of us could paint like that, Picasso is supposed to have said when he first saw them. After Altamira, all is decadence. However, some of them have a dark side too, showing unmistakable scenes of humans shooting each other with arrows. Archaeologists excavating sites between 100,000 and 50,000 years old occasionally find objects that look distinctly modern, such as jewellery or art, but sites younger than 50,000 years almost always include such artefacts. People were doing new things, finding new ways to do old things, and inventing multiple ways to do everything. From Cape Town to Cairo, pre-50,000 BC sites all look rather alike, with much the same kinds of finds used in much the same kinds of ways. Post-50,000 BC sites, however, vary wildly. By 30,000 BC, the Nile Valley alone hosted half a dozen distinct regional styles of stone tools. Humans had invented culture, using their great, fast brains to weave webs of symbols that not only communicated complex ideas, Neanderthals and perhaps even Homo ergaster could do that, 
but also preserved them through time. Modern humans, unlike any other animal on earth, could change how they thought and lived in ways that accumulated, with one idea leading to another and mounting up across the generations. Culture is a product of the biological evolution of our big, fast brains, but culture itself also evolves. Biological evolution is driven by genetic mutations, with the mutations that work best replacing those that do not across thousands or even millions of years. Cultural evolution, however, moves much faster, because, unlike the biological version, it is directed. People face problems, their little grey cells go to work, and ideas come out. Most ideas, like most genetic mutations, end up making little difference to the world, and some are downright harmful. But over time, ideas that work well outcompete those that do not. Imagine, for instance, that you were a young hunter in the Nile Valley 30,000 years ago. In my made-up game of death earlier in this chapter, I used doves as symbols for animals that never fight, and hawks for those that always fight. Here, I will use sheep to represent people who follow the herd, and goats for those who don't. Our young hunter is a goat, certain that he knows best, and he thinks up a new design for arrowheads. Let us say that his version has longer tangs, so that it will stay lodged in the flank of a wounded antelope better than the old style. To his astonishment, though, his sheepish associates pooh-pooh his idea, telling him that the ancestors didn't need long tangs, so neither do we. Like fight and flight in the dove and hawk game, innovation and conservatism both have costs and benefits. Innovators pay a price. It takes time to learn to make new arrowheads and to use them properly, costing, let us say, ten points, and, perhaps more seriously, going against the way things have always been done might lose them respect, minus twenty points. Other men might not want to cooperate on hunts with someone so quirky, in which case the goatish inventor might actually end up with less meat, despite having better technology, another minus ten points. In the end, he might just let the whole thing drop. Unless, that is, the gains outweigh the losses. If his arrowheads really do produce more kills, he not only gains weight by eating more, say plus twenty points, but also can gain prestige by sharing antelope steaks generously, plus twenty-five points. Such a successful man might get more sex, a further plus ten points, which will put the balance firmly in the black, at plus fifteen points. Over several generations, he might spread his ingenious, goatish genes through the little hunter-gatherer group, but cultural change will overtake biological change long before that happens, because the other men in the band will simply copy his arrowheads. The inventor's tally of points and luck with the ladies will then decline, but perhaps not quite back to zero, because now everyone is eating better. Unless, of course, the hunter's new technology is so effective that it kills off all the antelopes, setting off new chains of consequences. Like the dove and hawk game, this is fun to play. We can make the story branch off in all kinds of directions, because even small changes in the payoffs produce big changes in the results. But the point, as with the earlier game, is that in real life the sheep and goat game is played over and over, with different results each time. If the costs of going against tradition are high in the inventor's band, the arrowhead will not catch on. But if it really is a better arrowhead, people in other bands will also think of it, and before long it will catch on somewhere else. Goatish bands might then out-hunt sheepish ones, forcing the latter either to switch arrowheads after all, or change their diets, or fight the innovators or, in an uncaged landscape, they could just move away. Culture wars of this kind are uniquely human. Although some other animals can be said to have cultures, particularly chimpanzees, among whom each community does things slightly differently from its neighbours, none seem to be capable of cumulative cultural change. The evolutionary consequences of culture have been a bit like those of the rise of sexual reproduction 1.5 billion years ago, where sex sped up genetic mutation, culture sped up innovation. Both mechanisms vastly increased the diversity of outcomes, 
allowing cells or humans to cooperate and compete on a bigger scale. Armed with brains powerful enough for cultural evolution, modern humans conquered the world. A few Homo sapiens had drifted out of Africa just before 100,000 years ago, when culture was still a fragile flower, and perhaps because of this these early emigrants only got as far as what we now call Israel and Arabia. There they lived alongside Neanderthals, although not necessarily happily. The oldest known fatality from a spear thrust, around 100,000 years ago, was one of these pioneers. But a second wave, which broke out of Africa about 70,000 years ago, took the full package of modern human behavior with it and spread across the planet 50 times as fast as the proto-humans who had left Africa nearly 1.6 million years earlier. Culture gave the new migrants huge advantages over proto-humans. When modern humans arrived in Siberia 30,000 years ago, for instance, it was even colder than it is now. But unlike other animals, they did not have to wait millennia while their genes evolved toward hairiness to keep them warm. Instead, they invented bone needles and gut threads and sewed fitted clothes. There might have been conservatives who preferred traditional, ill-fitting skins to this new look, but the first winter either changed their minds or killed them. This process explains not only why there is so much cultural variety around the world, slight variations in local conditions, combined with the random generation of good enough ideas, produced countless different evolutionarily stable strategies, but also why there is so much similarity. Competing cultures tend to converge on a few winning strategies. And as well as being humanity's best tool for adapting to new environments, culture was the greatest force for transforming those environments. It transformed them so much, in fact, that all the proto-humans in the world went extinct. It is unsettling to think about what this involved. On the one hand, there is no hard evidence that our ancestors actively drove proto-humans extinct, and DNA analysis hints that there might have been cooperation between species. The Neanderthal genome, sequenced in 2010, shows that Homo sapiens and Neanderthals mixed their body fluids sufficiently often that 1 to 4 percent of the DNA of everyone of Asian or European descent comes from Neanderthal ancestors, while 6% of the DNA in Australian Aboriginals and New Guineans comes from Denisovans, a kind of proto-human that was only discovered in March 2010. On the other hand, we have no way to tell how many of these couplings were rapes, or whether, when we find smashed Neanderthal skulls, the hand that wielded the murder weapon belonged to another Neanderthal or to a Homo sapiens. But whether or not modern humans hunted down their rivals, it is all too easy to imagine how our inventiveness would have made life impossible for slower-witted kin who needed the same food. Whatever the chain of cause and effect, it is a depressing coincidence that as our kind of humans spread, every other kind fled. By 25,000 years ago, Neanderthals had retreated to a few inaccessible caves at Gibraltar and in the Caucasus Mountains, and by 20,000 years ago they were gone altogether. Other kinds of proto-humans hung on, on isolated islands, until 18,000 BC, and people claim to see yetis even today, but all the hard evidence says that we are alone and have been since the coldest point of the last ice age, 200 centuries ago. This was just the beginning of the ways culture would transform the planet. I spent a page or two in Chapter 2 talking about how, when the most recent Ice Age ended around 9600 BC, plants multiplied madly and animals, including humans, ate them and multiplied madly too. For all animals except humans, these good times lasted only a few generations, until their own numbers outran their increased food supply and hunger returned. The humans in the lucky latitudes, though, were able to respond by evolving culturally, domesticating plants and animals to increase their food supply. When I talked about the beginnings of agriculture in Chapter 2, I called it one of the two or three great turning points in human history, in part because the new and crowded farming landscapes made it harder for losers in the game of death to run away. This turned territoriality into caging, 
But whereas territory gave ants and apes reasons to fight to the death, caging had more complicated effects on us. In fact, it created the new evolutionarily stable strategy that I have been calling productive war. This rewarded people who kept killing until their rivals lost their will to resist, but beyond that point it rewarded people who accepted their defeated enemies' signals of submission rather than slaughtering them. Cultural evolution turned killers into conquerors, ruling over larger, safer, and richer societies. Chimpanzees do incorporate some defeated enemies into their own communities, as the Kasakala chimps did with the last surviving Kahaman females at the end of the Gombe War in 1977. But chimpanzees lack the flexible brain power for cumulative cultural evolution. There are no simian cities or ant empires because communities that grow too large break apart, rather like the carbon blobs in the early Earth's oceans. This, in fact, was how the Kasakala and Kahama chimpanzee bands originally emerged. When Jane Goodall set up her research station at Gombe in 1960, there was only one community of chimps, but this grew and then split in two in the early 1970s. Humans, by contrast, can organize themselves to live in larger and more complex groups without having to evolve biologically into a whole new kind of animal. In the increasingly competitive caged world of the post-Ice Age Lucky Latitudes, bigger communities could generally outcompete smaller ones, but holding big groups together required leaders to foster internal cooperation so that the group could compete better against outsiders. So it was that Leviathans became part of the human evolutionarily stable strategy. Once again, we can see a pale shadow of human behavior among chimpanzees who fight less often when they live in communities with a well-established alpha male than in bands where the hierarchy is unsettled, and like human leaders who turn into stationary bandits as they pursue their self-interest, really entrenched alpha males can be surprisingly impartial and even altruistic toward the weak. The extreme case may be Freddy, a supremely secure alpha male chimp in the Tai forest in West Africa. The wildly popular Disney nature documentary Chimpanzee shows Freddy feeding and caring for an orphaned baby chimp named Oscar, even though this cost Freddy time that he would ordinarily have spent patrolling the borders with other adult males. According to the film, though, all ended well, with Freddy's troop seeing off a raid by the neighboring community, whose chief, the villainous Scar, had failed to prevent rifts from growing among his followers. Like so many great leaders, most famously perhaps Abraham Lincoln, Freddy set an example of cooperation that perhaps helped his team of rivals work together well. Yet Freddy will not be founding a dynasty that steadily drives down rates of lethal violence in the Thai forest. To do that, he and his troop would need to evolve biologically into animals that, like humans, can evolve culturally. Alpha male chimps cannot reorganize their societies to build on their predecessors' accomplishments any more than they can foster revolutions in military affairs. Only we can do these things. And these things, as we heard in chapters 1 to 5, are precisely what we have done in the last 10,000 years. We have made bigger societies that constantly revolutionize their military affairs. Fortifications, metal arms and armor, discipline, chariots, massed iron-armed infantry, cavalry, guns, battleships, tanks, aircraft, nuclear weapons. The list goes on and on, with each advance allowing us to wage ever fiercer wars. But to compete in these conflicts, our bigger societies have also had to find ways to get their members to cooperate better, which has pushed them toward stationary bandits, internal peace, and prosperity. In this peculiar, paradoxical way, war has made the world safer and richer. The Pacifist's Dilemma In The Better Angels of Our Nature, perhaps the best book on the modern decline of violence since Norbert Elias's civilizing process, the psychologist Steven Pinker illustrates his arguments about the increasing peacefulness of Europe and North America since A.D. 1500 with a game that he calls The Pacifist's Dilemma. The basic format is much like the hawk and dove and sheep and goat games that I played earlier in this chapter. 
Pinker assumes that any time there is a dispute to be resolved, the payoff of cooperating is plus five points for each player. The payoff of attacking an unsuspecting player and just taking what you want is plus ten points, while the cost of suffering such an attack is a disproportionate minus one hundred points. If you have ever been mugged, that will make sense. As we might expect, the fear of losing one hundred points is enough to make everyone trigger happy, even though the payoff when both players attack is minus fifty points all around. Both players get hurt, and neither gets what he or perhaps she wants. Everyone would like the plus five payoff from cooperating, but settles for the minus fifty of fighting to avoid getting the minus one hundred of being mugged. And yet, over the past few centuries, fighting has been declining, and the world has been drifting toward plus five. As Pinker points out, the logic of the game of death means the only possible explanation is that the payoffs have changed over time. Either the rewards of peace or the costs of fighting, or both, have risen so much that the number of situations in which force pays off has shrunk. And we have responded by using force less and less often. The changes those of us now in middle age have seen during our own lifetimes are frankly quite remarkable. A few years ago, while I was directing an archaeological excavation in Sicily, the topic of fighting came up one evening over dinner. One of the students on the dig, a big strapping lad in his early twenties, commented that he couldn't imagine what it would feel like to hit someone. I thought he was joking until it became clear that almost no one at the table had ever raised a hand in anger. For a moment, I felt as if I had stepped into an episode of the Twilight Zone. I had hardly been a wild child, but there was no way I could have gotten through high school back in the 1970s without throwing the occasional punch. Admittedly, students from Stanford University may be near one extreme of the non-violent spectrum. Psychologists call such people weird. Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, but even so, they belong to a broader trend. We are living in a kinder, gentler age. Pinker suggests that five factors have changed the payoffs from violence, making force less attractive. First, he says, comes our old friend Leviathan. Governments have become stationary bandits, penalizing aggressors. In his pacifist's dilemma game. Even quite a small penalty of minus fifteen points would push the payoff from winning a fight down from plus ten to minus five points, which would be less than the plus five average from being peaceful. This would soon have Leviathan's subjects burying the hatchet. But government, Pinker argues, was just the first step. Commerce has also increased the payoffs from peace. If gains from trade were to add one hundred points to each player's payoff whenever they both chose cooperation over fighting, Pinker observes, the resulting score of plus one hundred and five points would dwarf the plus ten that anyone would score by winning a war, let alone the minus fifty he would suffer from a war that dragged on without victory. And then, Pinker says, there is feminization. In every documented human society. Males are responsible for nearly all the violent crime and war making. Throughout history, men and male values have dominated, but in the last few centuries, beginning in Europe and North America, and then spreading around the world, women have been increasingly empowered. We have not gone as far as bonobos, among whom females keep aggressive males in their place, but Pinker suggests. Feminism has reduced the payoff from violence by making machismo look ridiculous rather than glorious. If he speculates, eighty percent of the payoff from successful violence is psychological, then the growing importance of feminine values would drive the gains from victories down from plus ten to plus two points. This is well under the plus five points that everyone gets for being peaceful. And would quickly turn pacifism into the new evolutionarily stable strategy. Nor is that all. Since the 18th century Enlightenment, Pinker goes on to suggest, empathy has become increasingly important. I feel your pain is not just New Age nonsense. Seeing other people as fellow humans has raised not only the psychological payoffs from helping them, but also the costs of hurting them. 
If choosing peaceful cooperation gives each player just an extra five points worth of pleasure, it would raise both sides' payoff from working together to plus ten points, and then any reduction at all for guilt from causing pain would drive the payoff of aggression down below plus ten points. Peace, love, and understanding would win the day. Finally, Pinker suggests, science and reason have also changed payoffs. Since the 17th century scientific revolution, we have learned to view the world objectively. We understand how the universe began, that the earth goes around the sun, and how life evolved. We have found the Higgs boson and even invented game theory. Knowing that cooperation is more rational than using force must raise the psychological payoff from the former while reducing the payoff from the latter. It is hard to disagree with any of Pinker's points, but I think we can actually go further. In the introduction to this book, I suggested that long-term global history is one of our most powerful tools for making sense of the world, and I now want to suggest that by limiting his focus to Western Europe and North America in the last 500 years, Pinker actually saw only part of the picture. If we instead look at the entire planet across the last 100,000 years, we find that the story is simultaneously more complicated and much simpler than Pinker suggests. What makes the story more complicated is that the Euro-American decline in violence in the last half millennium was not a one-time event. In chapters 1 and 2, we heard that rates of violent death also fell in the age of ancient empires, tumbling by the end of the first millennium BC to perhaps just one quarter of what they had been 10,000 years earlier. Between AD 200 and 1400, rates of violence then rose again in Eurasia's lucky latitudes, where the bulk of the world's population lived, chapter 3, before a second great pacification, the one Pinker focuses on, began, chapters 4 and 5. Well before 1900, the risk of violent death had fallen even lower than in the days of the ancient empires, and since then it has just carried on sliding. What makes the story simpler than Pinker's, however, is that when we compare the ancient and the modern periods of declining violence and contrast them with the intervening medieval period of rising violence, we find that we only need one factor, not five, to explain why violence declined. That factor, you will probably not be surprised to hear at this point in the book, is productive war. Pinker recognizes that a state that uses a monopoly on force to protect its citizens from one another may be the most consistent violence reducer. But the reality seems simpler to me. For 10,000 years, productive war has always been the prime mover in reducing violence, creating bigger societies ruled by leviathans, which, to survive in competition with other leviathans, have to turn into stationary bandits that punish unauthorized violence. Pinker's other four factors, commerce, feminization, empathy, and reason, are always consequences of the peace brought by productive war, not independent causes in their own right. This is most obvious in the case of commerce. In ancient times, and again after AD 1500, the invisible hand increased the benefits of commercial cooperation, but only because the invisible fist had already raised the costs of using force. Whether we look at the ancient Roman, Han, and Mauryan empires, or the early modern European ones, the fist always preceded the hand. When the fist failed in Eurasia after about AD 200, and steppe nomads overwhelmed the ancient empires, the hand failed with it. Only when European ships and guns conquered the oceans did global trade take off, reaching dizzying heights in the age of the 19th century Globocop. When the Globocop faltered in the early 20th century, trade contracted and violence surged, and as we will see in Chapter 7, the installation of a new Globocop since 1989 has driven a new age of commercial expansion. The long-term pattern is clear. Leviathan raises the costs of force, making peace pay off better than violence, and the more peaceful that conditions become, the easier it is for commerce to flourish, increasing the payoffs to be won by cooperating. 
Empathy and rationalism were also consequences of productive war in ancient as well as modern times. Enlightened eighteenth-century gentlemen panning pamphlets arguing that universal sympathy was bringing about perpetual peace regularly appealed to Roman writings to justify their idea, for the very good reason that Roman gentlemen had often held very similar views. But in neither case was empathy or rationalism a prime mover in the decline of violence. As we heard in chapters 1 and 2, the non-violent messages of Confucianism, Buddhism, Stoicism, and Christianity won mass followings only after the wars of conquest that created the Han, Mauryan, and Roman empires had passed their peaks. Similarly, Europe's 18th and 19th century age of empathy and rationalism came after the worst parts of the five hundred years' war had already passed. These intellectual movements justified and explained worlds that Leviathan was already making safer, rather than themselves creating peace. And as we heard in chapter 3, when the Leviathans collapsed in the first millennium AD and violence returned, no philosophical system was able to stop it. Feminization is even more clearly a consequence rather than a cause of the decline of violence. The empowerment of women played little part in the ancient decline and is hard to spot in the modern version until the 19th or even the 20th century, by which time Leviathan had already driven rates of violent death lower than ever before. Perhaps it is only when societies are so pacified that violent death falls below 2% that women become sufficiently empowered to challenge male aggression. This was never consistently achieved anywhere before about A.D. 1750 to 1800, but the moment this level was reached, in Europe and some of its settler colonies, we begin to see signs of feminization. Sticking with the payoffs Pinker assigned in the pacifist's dilemma, plus five for each player when he cooperates, plus ten for winning a fight, minus 100 for losing a fight, and minus 50 all around when both sides fight, I now want to look at how the game might play out. The 15-point penalty that Leviathan imposes on aggressors makes cooperation much the best game in town. The result is that productive war drives violence down, and as this happens, Pinker's other four factors also come into play, acting as multipliers. First, peace encourages commerce. This was clearly happening in several of the ancient empires by 200 BC and in modern Europe by AD 1700. And even a much smaller bonus than the huge 100-point bump that Pinker suggested would make a big difference. It only takes 10 points to give peaceful merchant societies a payoff of plus 15, far ahead of the next best option of minus 5, for winning a fight and then being punished by Leviathan. Pinker does not suggest a score for rationality, but does have empathy yield five points for the peacemakers. If we share these five points between rationality and empathy, the payoff for being peaceful goes up to plus 20, and when rates of violence fall really low, as they were doing in Europe by 1800, feminization kicks in and makes force even less attractive. The whole process depends on Leviathan's being strong enough not only to punish its own subjects, but also to defend them, because, of course, the game of death that Leviathan is playing with its subjects is nestled into other games that Leviathan is playing with its neighbors. A Leviathan that wins productive wars, picking up plus ten points each time, will eventually dominate its neighborhood, swallowing up its former rivals. It will turn into something like the Roman Empire, within which trade, empathy, and so on, flourish on a much larger scale. Eventually, it may even become a globocop. Reality, of course, is messier than simplifying games such as the pacifist's dilemma. In the late 19th century, as we heard in Chapter 5, the globocop ran into unanticipated feedback loops as its success in running an international system made everyone richer which stimulated new industrial revolutions, which then created rivals that undercut the Globocop's ability to punish rule-breakers. By 1914, several players had concluded that the payoffs from using force had risen back above the payoffs from peaceful cooperation, with catastrophic results. 
and then things got worse. In the 1930s, the pacifists' dilemma abruptly morphed into a game of hawk and dove. Most European governments, traumatized by the bloodletting of World War I, consistently pursued peace at any price, which left the field free for Hitler to turn hawkish. He almost won the game in 1940, again in 1941, and a third time in 1942, before the British, Soviets, and Americans finally figured out how to play. Once that happened, of course, the game's unforgiving logic could only lead one way, and by 1945 the Allies had beaten Hitler at his own violent game. Most of Europe and East Asia were in ruins, about a hundred million people were dead, and the United States had the bomb. Payoffs now changed out of all recognition, because nuclear weapons began driving the penalty for using force up toward infinity. According to the cold rules of the game, even without a single Globocop to impose penalties, force could only have positive payoffs if it was applied so timidly in insurrections, coups, and limited wars that it did not provoke a violent countermove. If either superpower did anything that challenged the other's survival, both would lose the game. Logic therefore demanded that force become obsolete, and, following the logic, the Soviets and Americans managed for decade after decade not to go to war. But the problem, as Ronald Reagan memorably put it, was that having two nuclear-armed hemispherical cops instead of one globocop was like having two Westerners standing in a saloon aiming their guns at each other's heads permanently. Everything would be fine, so long as neither gunslinger ever had a bad day. Getting Past Petrov Game theory got its big break in the incongruously beautiful setting of Santa Monica, California. Realizing in the early 1950s that the game of death had taken an alarming turn, the American government outsourced to the Rand Corporation the job of figuring out, objectively and scientifically, how to avoid blowing up the world. Rand's solution was to lure away from Ivy League universities one brilliant mathematician after another and set them to calculating the payoffs from every conceivable move in the game. These chalkboard warriors were a quirky crowd of geniuses. The best known today is John Nash, the hero, if that is the right word, of the best-selling book and film A Beautiful Mind. Nash had proved that payoffs could be set up so that bitter rivals would work their way toward a mutually satisfactory balance, what mathematicians call a Nash equilibrium, without resorting to force. This suggested that nuclear deterrence really should work, so long as the people playing the game remained steely-eyed and rational. Nash's own judgment, however, did not inspire confidence. He began hearing voices had his security clearance revoked after he was arrested for indecent exposure in a men's room, and then turned into a schizophrenic recluse. Fortunately, the men who made the decisions about nuclear war and peace were less brilliant but more grounded than Nash. But in the absence of a globocop, and with unknown unknowns thicker on the ground than ever before, even someone as stolid as Dwight Eisenhower soon found himself losing sleep, drinking milk for his ulcers, and suffering heart troubles that put him in the hospital. The tiniest miscalculation or accident could mean the end. In theory, in games played on a blackboard over and over again, deterrence made perfect sense, but in reality the fate of the world hung on the snap judgments of men like Petrov. Deterrence lacked stability, and without that, there can, of course, be no evolutionarily stable strategy. Throughout history, the only stable solution to the game of death has always been for someone to win it, meaning that the only way to get past moments like Petrov's was for one hemispherical cop to defeat the other. The Cold War's arms race, proxy wars, spies and coups, were all attempts to find a game-changer, a gradual or sudden shift in the balance of power that would bring the other side to its knees, or prevent the other side from bringing us to our knees. In the early 1980s, many Soviet strategists began worrying that precision weapons would undo them. The expression, revolution in military affairs, 
was in fact coined by Soviet analysts to describe this new technology. They were right, although not in the way they expected. The American computerization of war changed the military balance in Europe enough for Moscow to start exploring ways to fight without going nuclear. But hindsight has revealed that what mattered most about Star Wars, Assault Breaker, and the other newfangled weapons was that countering them would be really, really complicated and costly. The Soviet economy could churn out tanks, Kalashnikovs, nuclear warheads and ICBMs, but could not rise to, or pay for, the computers and smart munitions that promised to dominate 1990s battlefields. This leap in the costs of war came at the worst possible time for Moscow. Much of the Soviet success in the 1970s had been paid for by oil exports, driven to sky-high prices by war and revolution in the Middle East. But between 1980 and 1986, the cost of a barrel of oil fell by almost 80%, wiping out much of Moscow's disposable income. Adding to the Kremlin's woes, while the productivity of American workers surged by 27% between 1975 and 1985, and that of Western Europeans by 23%, Soviet citizens' output grew just 9%, and their Eastern European subjects only performed 1% better. Communist farms were so inefficient that productivity barely rose at all. Consequently, grain imports, especially from the United States and Canada, more than doubled, paid for largely by huge loans from banks in the American alliance. One debt crisis followed another. Force, Clausewitz famously insisted, is the means of war. To impose our will on the enemy is its object. Therefore, Clausewitz concluded, we should not hesitate to kill if that seems like the best way to break the enemy's will to resist, but when killing is not the best way, we should not waste our time doing it. The brilliance of the grand strategy of containment that the United States unveiled in the late 1940s was that it recognized this. Most of the time, American policymakers rejected the dovish claim that two hemispherical cops could coexist indefinitely, and most of the time they also rejected the hawkish counterclaim that victory would come if the United States just waged its proxy wars more aggressively. Instead, they followed a middle course that played to America's strengths. The United States had inherited Britain's mantle as the great outer rim power, and with it Britain's role as a liberal leviathan, promoting free markets, elections, and speech. The way to leverage liberal strength, American strategists realized, was to wage liberal war, using freedom as a weapon to undermine the Soviets' will to resist. The United States could only wage this kind of war if it had an invisible fist to back up the invisible hand, and so, divisive and distasteful as this was, Washington had to keep building hydrogen bombs, fighting proxy wars, and cozying up to dictators. But through it all, American leaders had to remember that bombs, battles, and brutality would not by themselves deliver victory. That could only be delivered by the Soviet Empire's own subjects, as they waited in line at the store, cursed at cars that would not start, and bought Bruce Springsteen LPs on the black market. Little by little, the invisible hand would choke the will out of communism. The plan was hardly a secret. As early as 1951, the American sociologist David Reisman had both mocked and celebrated it in a short story called The Nylon War. In it, the Pentagon top brass sells liberal war to the White House by explaining that, if allowed to sample the riches of America, the Russian people would not long tolerate masters who gave them tanks and spies instead of vacuum cleaners. The President agrees. The Air Force rains stockings and cigarettes from the Russian skies, and communism collapses. The reality was, of course, not so simple. But, little by little, Stalin and his successors came to understand the importance of stockings. A year after Reisman's story came out, the Soviet premier told China's foreign minister, jokingly, the transcript says, that the main armament of the Americans is nylons, cigarettes, and other goods for sale. No, the Americans don't know how to wage war. Before the decade was out, however, 
The Soviets had learned that the only way to win the Nylon War was for their own ideologues to push back, denying the truth of American claims and highlighting capitalism's unfairness. Thanks to the fact that nuclear weapons meant that a shooting war would effectively be suicide, the Soviets never seriously considered the path chosen by hundreds of rulers in earlier times, who had responded to economic decline by attacking their more prosperous neighbors and taking their rich provinces or trade routes. Instead, Soviet leaders let the liberal war of attrition grind on until it broke their empire apart. The Politburo let this happen, not because the apparatchiks had all been listening to war, but because they knew force could not solve their problem. Invading West Germany or South Korea would not make the Soviet Empire as rich and productive as the American. It would just bring on Armageddon. For 30 years, the Soviets managed to paper over most of the cracks, convincing many of their subjects, and even some outsiders, that the empire was flourishing. But by the 1980s, this was no longer possible. By then, egg rationing and the other indignities of 1940s austerity were just distant memories for most Western Europeans. But in Eastern Europe, it was all too easy to feel that they were on their way back. It was a struggle to get basic things like washing powder, a Polish nurse remembered. I had to wash my hair with egg yolks because there was no shampoo. If we didn't have information about life elsewhere, that would have been different. But we were conscious of the way other people lived. And if anyone still had doubts that the Soviet bloc was losing the economic war, the meltdown of the Chernobyl nuclear reactor swept them away in 1986, flooding Ukraine with radiation and exposing the incompetence and dishonesty of the Soviet regime in a way that could not be covered up. We can't go on like this, Mikhail Gorbachev had confessed to his wife in 1985, just hours before he was appointed Soviet Premier. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and Gorbachev, recognizing that the Soviet Empire's will to resist was ebbing away, staked everything on one big bet. He would restart economic growth by promoting restructuring, perestroika, and transparency, glasnost, while, at all costs, avoiding recourse to violence which could only end badly. Many Americans assumed that this must be another clever move in the game of death, so clever, in fact, that they could not quite figure out what the Soviets might be trying to do. I was suspicious of Gorbachev's motives, National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft later confessed. My fear, he explained, was that Gorbachev could talk us into disarming without the Soviet Union having to do anything fundamental to its own military structure, and that, in a decade or so, we could face a more serious military threat than ever before. There were times when it looked as if Scowcroft might be right. In October 1986, Reagan and Gorbachev sat across a table in Reykjavik and actually started talking about banning all nuclear weapons. This threw American defense experts into a panic. The Soviets might be terrified of NATO's new high-tech arsenal, but Americans— who knew that few of these wonder weapons were yet in service, were equally terrified that without nuclear deterrence, their conventional forces in Europe would be hard-pressed to hold off the much larger Soviet armies. Gorbachev, however, was not trying to trick anyone, and it slowly became clear that he really was serious about playing the game without using force. No one knew what to make of it. Did we see what was coming when we took office in January 1989, George Bush the Elder later asked, admitting, No, we did not. And if Bush had somehow seen how 1989 would turn out, and had claimed in his inauguration address that before his term ended he would oversee the collapse of the Soviet Empire and Russia's retreat to the borders Germany had imposed on it in 1918, everyone would have thought that this arch-realist, former CIA director, had gone completely mad. For more than 40 years, the United States had been scheming, plotting, and killing, all to break the Soviets' will. But when the end game finally arrived, it took everyone by surprise. A few months after Bush's inauguration, an official committee in Hungary concluded that the country's 1956 rebellion against the Soviets had been a popular uprising against an oligarchic system of power which had humiliated the nation. 
In Stalin's day, such a report would have been equivalent to a collective suicide note. Even under Khrushchev or Brezhnev, the consequences could have been serious. But not only did Gorbachev not have anyone shot, he tacitly signaled agreement. Encouraged, in June 1989, the Hungarians gave a retrospective public funeral to a former premier whom the Soviets had shot. 200,000 mourners turned out, but still Moscow made no move. Without consulting anyone, the Hungarian prime minister announced that budgetary problems prevented him from renewing the barbed wire along the border with Austria, and since the old wire violated health and safety rules, it would have to be rolled up. A hole, hundreds of miles wide, was about to appear in the Iron Curtain. In a panic, East German communists asked the Kremlin to intervene, only to be told, we can't do anything. Any amount of concession, Gorbachev reasoned, was better than risking the collapse of the whole Soviet system by using force. Not everyone agreed, and in December, Romania's thuggish dictator Nicolae Ceausescu had his troops shoot demonstrators. The country rose against him, the Soviets did nothing, and on Christmas Day he and his wife were themselves shot. East German communists, scrambling and bungling almost as badly, lurched in the other direction and threw open the gates of the Berlin Wall. East Germans rushed west, West Germans strolled east, all kinds of people danced on top of the wall or took hammers to it, and nothing happened. How could you shoot at Germans who walk across the border to meet other Germans on the other side? Gorbachev asked the next day. The policy had to change. The events in Romania suggested that Gorbachev was right, but by the summer of 1989 the Soviets probably had no winning moves left. Changing one policy just led to irresistible pressure on the next policy. Less than three months after the Berlin Wall came down, East Germany's Prime Minister told Gorbachev that the two Germanys wanted to merge into one. This could only happen, Gorbachev replied, if the unified Germany were demilitarized and neutral. A proposal was put to the Americans, but Bush refused to withdraw the quarter of a million American personnel in West Germany. Gorbachev pulled his 300,000 troops out of East Germany anyway, and the new reunited Germany joined NATO. With the benefit of hindsight, it is perhaps not surprising that once the Germans, Poles, Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, Romanians and Bulgarians had walked away from the Soviet Empire, the Estonians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Belarusians, Ukrainians, Armenians, Georgians, Azeris, Chechens, Kazakhs, Uzbeks, Turkmen, Kyrgyz, Tajiks and Mongolians would follow. What does still seem remarkable, though, is that the Russians themselves decided that they wanted nothing more to do with their own empire and announced their withdrawal from the Soviet system. On Christmas Day 1991, Gorbachev signed a decree formally dissolving the Soviet Union. By playing the game without violence, Gorbachev got a bad payoff, but the only obvious alternative, using force to hold the Eastern Europeans down and to resist any American effort to roll back the empire, would have paid off much, much worse. Russia had been defeated, getting shoved unceremoniously out of the inner rim and even out of much of the heartland, but at least this had happened with barely a shot being fired. Five hundred million lives had been on the line during Petrov's moment of truth in 1983, but when the end of the Cold War finally came, fewer than three hundred people actually died. The United States had won the greatest and most unexpected triumph in the history of productive war. The world had a new Globocop. 7. The Last Best Hope of Earth American Empire, 1989 to... Can't get there from here. Monday, November the 26th, 2012, was a modern miracle. For an entire day, in fact, from 10.30 on Sunday night until 10.20 on Tuesday morning, not a single person was shot, stabbed, or otherwise done to death anywhere in New York City. There had been no such day since comprehensive data collection began in 1994, at which point the Big Apple averaged 14 killings each day. 
In fact, we have to go back more than 50 years, to a time when records were spotty and the city had half a million fewer people, to find another day without violent death. All in all, in 2012, just one New Yorker in 20,000 died violently, probably an all-time low. New York is not, of course, the only place in America. In Chicago, murders rose by one-sixth in 2012, while San Bernardino, California, where half the homeowners owe more than their houses are worth and the city government has gone bankrupt, saw killings jump 50 percent. Lock your doors and load your guns, the city attorney advised. And as 2012 drew to a close, a psychopath in Newtown, Connecticut, gunned down 20 schoolchildren, six staff members, his own mother, and then himself. Yet New York was more typical than Newtown. Despite the nightmarish exceptions, the nation's murder rate fell in 2012. In fact, New York is fairly typical, not just of the United States, but also of much of the world. Homicide is in general retreat. Roughly one human in every 13,000 was murdered in 2004. By 2010, the figure had fallen to just over one in every 14,500. Deaths in war went the same way. Interstate wars, typically the biggest and bloodiest conflicts, almost disappeared. Civil wars in the wake of state failures continue. In 2012, civil war killed about one Syrian in every 400, but the statistics suggest that these conflicts are becoming rarer too. Averaged across the planet, violence killed about one person in every 4,375 in 2012, implying that just 0.7% of the people alive today will die violently, as against 1-2% to of the people who lived in the 20th century, 2-5% to in the ancient empires, 5-10% to in Eurasia in the age of steppe migrations, and a terrifying 10 to 20 percent in the Stone Age. The world is finally getting to Denmark, and Denmark itself, where just one person per 111,000 was murdered in 2009, representing a lifetime risk of violent death of just 0.027 percent, gets more Danish every day. Most wonderful of all, for every 20 nuclear warheads in the world in 1986, when Bruce Springsteen re-recorded War, there is now only one. Fifty years ago, Strategic Air Command, charged with delivering nuclear weapons, was at the cutting edge of the U.S. Air Force. Nowadays, most Air Force officers consider going into the nuclear branch career suicide. Nor is that the end of the good news. As has happened so often across the last few thousand years, Falling rates of violence have gone hand in hand with rising prosperity. When the United States took over as undisputed global cop in 1989, the average human being generated just over $5,000 of wealth. By 2011, the most recent year with complete data, that had doubled. Asia had benefited most, with coastal China, parts of Southeast Asia, and a few regions in India going through their own industrial revolutions. These fueled the greatest migration of peasants into cities in history, lifting more than two billion people out of absolute poverty, defined by the World Bank as surviving on less than a dollar per day. Latin America, Africa, and Eastern Europe initially went backward thanks to debt crises, the AIDS epidemic, and post-communist collapse, respectively, but all have gained ground since 2000. The world is getting not just safer and richer, but also, as inequalities between the continents decline, fairer. Even more remarkable, however, is the explanation for all this good news, argued throughout this book, that productive war has made the planet a better place. This is a paradoxical, counterintuitive, and frankly disturbing notion, and as I mentioned in the introduction, not one that crossed my mind before I started studying the long-term history of war. But the evidence of archaeology, anthropology, history, and evolutionary biology seems conclusive. Violence evolved 400 million years ago as a way to win arguments, initially between proto-sharks that wanted to eat other fish and other fish that did not want to be eaten. It has been a hugely successful adaptation, and almost all animals now use it. Some have even evolved to use violence collectively, 
and when territory is involved, this violence can be lethal. War has come into the world. Human history is one of the shorter twigs on the evolutionary tree, but it is by far the most unusual. We alone can evolve culturally as well as genetically, responding to changes in the payoffs from the game of death by altering our behavior rather than waiting thousands of generations for natural selection to change us. Because of this, since the end of the last ice age, we have found ways to use violence that, paradoxically, have lowered the payoffs from using further violence. When the world warmed up after 10,000 BC, animals and plants of all kinds reacted by reproducing. For most species, hard times returned when hungry mouths outran food supplies, but in the lucky latitudes, humans solved this problem by evolving culturally and becoming farmers. Farming had its costs, but it also supported many more people, and the resulting crowding created caging. For chimpanzees, and probably for Ice Age humans too, territoriality meant that the highest payoffs in the game of death came from killing competing groups, but caging meant that incorporating defeated enemies into larger societies paid off better still. Incorporation is a bland word for a process that included so much plunder, rape, enslavement, and displacement, but because competition rewarded conquerors who turned themselves into stationary bandits, the long-term result of all this violence was pacification and rising prosperity. By 3500 BC, stationary bandits were evolving into genuine leviathans, able to raise taxes and punish recalcitrant subjects. The process began in what we now call the Middle East, because that was also where farming had begun, and it was therefore the place where caging and competition had gone furthest. But over the next few thousand years, most of the lucky latitudes moved the same way. Each region in the old world's lucky latitudes went through a similar sequence of revolutions in military affairs, although for reasons we heard in chapter 3, and above all the absence of horses, the sequence in the new world differed somewhat. First came fortifications, as an answer to endemic raiding. Attackers responded by learning how to besiege walls they could not climb. Next, in Eurasia, came bronze for offensive weapons and defensive armor. Then there was discipline, to persuade wild young men to attack despite the danger and to stand their ground against murderous enemies. By 1900 BC, herders on Eurasia's steppes learned to harness horses to chariots, bringing speed and fluidity to battlefields. By 1200 BC, warriors around the Mediterranean found ways to fight back, but in the first millennium BC, the initiative shifted toward masses of iron-armed infantry which conquered huge empires all across Eurasia's lucky latitudes. Each revolution was a race between offense and defense, but, as I have insisted throughout this book, war was never a case of what evolutionists call the Red Queen effect. The race did not leave everyone in the same place, because it transformed the societies that ran it. Every revolution required leviathans to get stronger, and stronger leviathans drove down rates of violent death still further. Nor do the facts fit comfortably with the theory of a unique Western way of war, invented by the Greeks in ancient times and raising European fighters above everyone else in the world. In reality, people all across the lucky latitudes invented a single productive way of war, and what it produced was stronger leviathans, safety, and wealth. In the first millennium BC, people got to Chang'an, Patilaputra, and Teotihuacan, as well as Rome. Another theme in this book, though, is that everything in war is paradoxical. By the end of the first millennium BC, Eurasia's productive wars were reaching what Clausewitz called a culminating point, at which behavior that previously produced success started delivering disaster. The ancient empire's expansion increasingly entangled them with the steppes. Here, highly mobile horsemen could cover vast distances and strike into the empires almost at will, but the great infantry armies that had created the empires struggled to survive at all on the arid grasslands. From China to Europe, cavalry came to dominate the battlefield, and for more than a thousand years, from roughly AD 200 through 1400, 
the lucky latitudes and steps were locked in a terrible cycle of productive and counterproductive wars. For every productive war that produced bigger, safer, and richer societies, a counterproductive war broke them down again. Leviathans lost their teeth, rates of violent death rose, and prosperity fell. One day, not too far away, physical anthropologists will have studied enough skeletons to put precise numbers on these rates, but for the time being we have to rely on the impressionistic evidence that I reviewed in chapters 1 to 3. For prehistory, we can combine analogies from 20th century Stone Age societies with the small but growing body of skeletal evidence. But for the ancient empires and the age of steppe migrations, we have to rely largely on the society's own literary accounts. I argued in chapters 1 and 2 that these writings make it almost certain that the ancient empires reduced rates of violent death, and in chapter 3 that rates rose again after about AD 200. But at the moment there is, frankly, no way to know precisely how much they rose and fell. My own estimates, that the risk of violent death was in the 2 to 5 percent range in the ancient empires, rising to 5 to 10 percent in the times of feudal anarchy, will doubtless be proved wrong as evidence accumulates, but that, it seems to me, is how scholarship is supposed to work. One researcher makes conjectures, another comes along and refutes them, putting better conjectures in their place. But if nothing else, I hope this first stab at putting actual numbers on the table will provoke others to disprove them by collecting better data and devising better methods that reveal where I went wrong. The story only moves on to a firmer numerical footing in the middle of the second millennium AD, when Leviathans, especially in Europe, once again revived as guns closed the steppe highway and long-distance shipping opened up the oceans. Both inventions were made in East Asia, but perfected in Western Europe, where they broke the cycle of productive and counterproductive wars. The reason for this, I suggested in Chapter 4, once again had more to do with geography than with a Western way of war. On the one hand, Europe's political geography, with lots of small kingdoms constantly at war, rewarded societies that built better guns. On the other hand, Europe's physical geography, the fact that it was twice as close as East Asia to the Americas, made it easier for Europeans than for Asians to discover, plunder, and colonize the New World. Europeans began their 500 years' war on the world not because they were more dynamic or more wicked than anyone else, but because geography made it easier for them than for anyone else. The 500 years' war forced Europeans to reinvent productive war because the sheer size of the societies their conquests produced changed the rules of the game. In an age of intercontinental empires, they discovered, the wealth of nations could be increased most not by plundering or even taxing downtrodden subjects, but by using state power to make as many people as possible, as free as possible, to trade in bigger and bigger markets. Beginning in northwestern Europe, relentless competition forced Leviathans to embrace open access order, which brought the market's invisible hand and government's invisible fist into harmony. Britain, after stumbling into an industrial revolution in the 1780s, emerged as the first Globocop, its ships, money, and diplomats policing a worldwide order. But although rates of violent death fell to new lows and prosperity climbed toward new highs, even the Globocop had a culminating point. The Pax Britannica produced so many rivals that the Globocop could no longer do its job. After 1914, the worst wars in history overthrew it, only for the United States to emerge as victor 75 years later, at the head of an even bigger open access order, producing even lower rates of violent death and even more wealth. This is a big story, only visible if we look at all of human history across the entire planet, and pursue all four of the approaches, personal, military historical, technical, and evolutionary, that I identified in the introduction. This alone, I suggest, will show what war has been good for, and what the costs have been. The answer to the question in this book's title is both paradoxical and horrible. War has been good for making humanity safer and richer, 
but it has done so through mass murder. But because war has been good for something, we must recognize that all this misery and death was not in vain. Given a choice of how to get from the poor, violent Stone Age to peace and prosperity, few of us, I am sure, would want war to be the way, but evolution, which is what human history is, is not driven by what we want. In the end, the only thing that matters is the grim logic of the game of death. Looking at how that logic has played out since the end of the Ice Age, it seems obvious where it should take us next. We have moved from bands of foragers via leviathans to a globocop. The next step, surely, should be to a world government that drives the payoffs from violence down to zero. Everyone should get to Denmark, and, despite all the horrors in its pages, this book should have a happy ending after all. Almost as happy, in fact, as the ending of Norman Angel's Great Illusion, which I mentioned at the start of Chapter 5. In 1910, when that book appeared, there had been no major great power wars for 95 years. Across that period, global incomes had doubled, and in Europe at least, the murder rate had halved. The implication, Angel and his admirers concluded, was that a world without war was just around the corner. It was not, but the great illusion remains worth reading anyway, because the reasons Angel was wrong apply to our own age too. As we heard in Chapter 5, the 19th century's march toward Denmark was unsustainable. The better the Globocop did its job, the more rivals it created, and the more rivals it created, the more difficult its job became. Some suggest that history is repeating itself. The American Colossus bestrides the world in the 2010s even more completely than the British version bestrode it in the 1860s, but the United States seems to be rerunning the United Kingdom's experience. The better that Washington keeps global order, the richer and stronger its potential rivals become. Unknown unknowns are proliferating, and gamblers are already taking chances. The closer we get to Denmark, the further away it seems. The first time I ever visited New England, a lifetime resident told me an ancient joke about the orneriness of the region's residents. A tourist, in most versions from New York, gets hopelessly lost in darkest Massachusetts, or perhaps Maine. After driving in circles for an hour, he stops to ask directions. A wizened local reflects on, but then rejects, one possible route after another. Finally, with a weary shake of his head, he tells the tourist, You can't get there from here. Unhelpful advice, to be sure, but it might be a better description of the world we live in than Angel's upbeat interpretation. Perhaps we face not a Red Queen effect, but a tortoise and hare effect. By running very fast, humanity has gotten somewhere. Rates of violent death have fallen, and prosperity has risen. But although we keep getting closer to Denmark, we will never quite get there from here. The hare races forward, but the tortoise always crawls just a little farther ahead, creating new rivals, new unknown unknowns, and perhaps even new storms of steel. So much for the happy ending. In this final chapter, I want to suggest that neither Angel's happy ending, nor the New Englander's unhappy one, is actually much of a guide to the shape of things to come. Angel's idea that economic interconnection makes war unthinkable was wrong a hundred years ago, and it is still wrong today. But so too is the New Englander's claim that we can't get there from here. We seem to be making the worst of all possible worlds for ourselves. On the one hand, it will be even less stable than the 1870s to 1910s, when the previous Globocop was in decline. On the other, its weapons will be even deadlier than those of the 1940s to 80s, when the United States and the Soviet Union threatened humanity with mutual assured destruction. Despite the steady decline in rates of violent death over the last 40 years, and despite the unlikeliness of a new world war in the mid-2010s, the next 40 years promise to be the most dangerous in history. But if we step back from the details and look at the coming decades in the same way that we looked at the long-term history of violence in chapters 1 to 6, 
rather different parts of the picture come into focus. In spite of everything, this broader perspective suggests, we really might get there from here, even if there is not where we expected. Venus and Mars For many years, the U.S. government regularly published a pamphlet called the Defense Planning Guidance, summarizing its official position on grand strategy. Most guidances were rather bland documents, but in February 1992, just two months after the Soviet Union dissolved, the committee charged with drafting a new guidance did something outrageous. It told the truth. What it drafted was a how-to guide for Globocops. While the United States could not assume responsibility for righting every wrong, it conceded, we will retain the preeminent responsibility for addressing selectively those wrongs which threaten not only our interests, but those of our allies or friends, or which could seriously unsettle international relations. This meant accomplishing one big thing. Our first objective is to prevent the re-emergence of a new rival, either on the territory of the former Soviet Union or elsewhere, that poses a threat on the order of that posed formerly by the Soviet Union. This requires that we endeavor to prevent any hostile power from dominating a region whose resources would, under consolidated control, be sufficient to generate global power. These regions include Western Europe, East Asia, the territory of the former Soviet Union, and Southwest Asia. Promptly leaked to the press, the draft set off a political firestorm. What it was talking about was literally a Pax Americana, complained the future Vice President Joe Biden, which won't work. Chastened, the Department of Defense toned down the final version, but whatever we call it, a Pax Americana is precisely what the United States has been pursuing for the last 20-odd years, several of them with Joe Biden in the White House. The lesson that politicians should have learned from the Pax Britannica was that an American version would work, at least for a few decades. Overall, the American experience since 1989 has been strikingly like Britain's in the late 19th century, and even the apparent exceptions are of the kind that only goes to prove the rule. The most extraordinary of these apparent exceptions is surely Western Europe, the first of the four potential problem spots that the 1992 planners worried about. The parallels between this region's experiences with the British and the American Globocops are obvious enough. In the later 19th century, Western European economies prospered in markets guaranteed by the British Globocop, and a wealthy, powerful Germany became Britain's deadliest rival in the 1890s. In the later 20th century, Western Europe's economies once again flourished in markets guaranteed by the American Globocop, and plenty of politicians, in Europe even more than in the United States, became alarmed that the reunited Germany would continue rerunning the historical script. People say, it is a terrible thing that Germany is not working, one French official half-joked. But I say, really? When Germany is working, six months later it is usually marching down the Champs-Élysées. But that did not happen. Instead, Western Europe moved in a direction that, at first sight, seems to challenge not only the analogy between American and British global power, but also virtually every argument in this book. Far from turning into a rival to the Globocop, Western Europe has almost entirely renounced force as a policy tool. A truly astonishing thing is happening. For the first time in history, huge numbers of people, 500 million so far, are coming together to form a bigger, safer, richer society without being forced to do so. It has been an epochal transformation, albeit a quiet one. I spent my first 27 years living through it, assuming for the sake of argument that we count Britain as part of Western Europe, without realizing that it was happening. Nothing, in fact, used to make me turn the TV off quite as quickly as yet another announcement from the bureaucrats in Brussels about what I was allowed to eat or drink and what size container it would come in. But I, as well as the millions of others who shared my lack of interest in all things European, was very wrong. Dullness was the whole point of the European community, 
as it was called until it rebranded itself as the European Union in 1993. Old-fashioned leviathans had used violence to create political unity, and then used politics, and, when necessary, more violence, to create economic unity. But Western Europe now turned history's most successful formula around. In committee meeting after committee meeting, its unsung heroes spun a web of rules and regulations that bound its members together in an economic unit, and then began using economics to create a political unit. The final goal, the former head of the German Bundesbank explained in 1994, is a political one. To reach any type of political unification in Europe, a federation of states, an association of states, or even a stronger form of union. In this agenda, the economic union is merely an important vehicle to reach this target. This was simultaneously the dullest and most daring trick that statesmen had ever attempted, and for 15 years after the signing of the crucial treaty at Maastricht in 1992, it seemed to be working. Europe remained a mosaic of independent states, but from Ireland to Estonia, most Europeans shared a single currency and central bank, accepted rulings from a European court and parliament, and crossed borders without passports. Until 2010, at least, the tedious path of consensus building really did seem to be getting Europe there from here. At that point, however, the countries that had adopted the euro as their currency plunged into a debt crisis or, more accurately, a balance of payments crisis between the highly productive North and the less productive South, and discovered the limits of a rules-based union. An old-style leviathan could have used force to solve the problems, as Britain did when it sent gunboats to extract debt payments from Greece in 1850. But in the new Europe, no German tanks would be rolling through the streets of Athens to restore fiscal discipline. Relying on the invisible hand of the market rather than the invisible fist of military power to enforce its rules, the European Union seemed to be teetering on the brink of an abyss. In late 2011, the Swiss bank UBS worried publicly about a descent into violence. Almost no modern fiat currency monetary unions, their analysts observed, have broken up without some form of authoritarian or military government or civil war. Sobering stuff. And yet, as I write, in mid-2013, the much-criticized policy of masterly inactivity, doing just enough to keep indebted countries afloat, but no more, does seem to be averting disaster. Despite skyrocketing unemployment, violent street protests, and political crisis, Greece has hung on within the Eurozone, and despite mounting pressure on Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Italy, and even France, none has collapsed. Far from breaking Europe apart, the crisis may yet become an opportunity to push political centralization further. Without shooting anyone, Europe's administrators might succeed where Napoleon and Hitler failed. The Nobel Committee recognized this in 2012 by awarding its peace prize to the entire European Union. And well they might, the EU's citizens murder each other less often than any other people on earth. Its governments have abolished the death penalty, and it has abandoned war within its borders and almost given it up beyond them, too. Europeans outside the EU still sometimes see positive payoffs from force, as Russia showed in its five-day war against Georgia in 2008, but within the EU few seem to agree. The EU's common security and defence policy does recognize the right to use force, but only Britain and France have done so, and always to restore peace in collapsing former colonies. Even when there were clear humanitarian arguments for military action, as in Kosovo in 1999, Western European governments moved with a caution that often infuriated their American partners. The surreal face-off between Sweden and Belarus in 2012 when a Swedish plane parachuted 800 teddy bears onto Minsk, each clutching a little sign saying, Free speech now, and Belarus counterattacked by firing the generals in charge of its border patrol and air force, might be more typical of the new European way of war. In 2003, 
Opinion pollsters found that only 12% of French and Germans thought that war was ever justified, as against 55% of Americans. And in 2006, respondents in Britain, France and Spain even told pollsters that the warlike Americans were the greatest threat to world peace. On major strategic and international questions today, the strategist Robert Kagan concluded, Americans are from Mars and Europeans are from Venus. The growing contrast between European and American attitudes to violence has occasioned much comment, but there is no mystery about it. Europeans are from Venus because Americans are from Mars. Without the American Globocop protecting the peace, Europe's dovish strategy would be impossible. But on the other hand, without European dovishness, the United States could not afford to go on as Globocop. If the European Union had acted more hawkishly over the past 15 years, the costs of countering it would already be undermining the American position, just as the costs of countering Germany undermined the British Globocop a hundred years ago. Mars and Venus need each other. Between 1945 and 1989, the best way for Western Europe to play the game of death was by being warlike enough to help deter the Soviet Union, but not so warlike as to alarm the Americans. Disagreement over exactly where that sweet spot was partly explains France's departure from NATO's unified command structure in 1966. Since 1989, though, Facing no serious security risks at all and being able to rely on the United States to punish any and all hawks, Western Europe has become even more dovish. Disagreement over which hawks needed punishment partly explains the spike in European anti-Americanism in 2003. The result? Unlike British governments a century ago, American administrators have never had to worry that their money and protection were nourishing European rivals that would challenge their ability to act as a globocop. Europe's move toward Venus has not, of course, abolished the tensions between the Outer Rim, the Inner Rim, and the Heartland that Mackinder identified a century ago. Since the 17th century, British grand strategy has revolved around engaging with the wider world, while preventing any single power from dominating continental Europe. We have no eternal allies, and we have no perpetual friends, said Lord Palmerston, the Foreign Secretary, in 1848. Only our interests are eternal and perpetual. Following this logic, he would have understood why Britain stayed out of the Eurozone, will hold a referendum on European Union membership by 2017, and is sometimes markedly less Venusian than its neighbours. Eastern Europeans also have doubts about Venus. Caught along the line separating the heartland from the inner rim and lacking natural barriers to protect them from their mighty German and Russian neighbours, they too find that centuries-old strategic concerns have not gone away. Like Britain, several East European governments seek to balance their fears of a German-dominated European Union by leaning even more toward the American Globocop. The paradox of power being what it is, however, the United States does not want its best friends leaning too far away from the European Union because that would threaten the calm that America needs if it is to do its job. Western Europe has not transcended the game of death. Rather, it has played the game skillfully, reaping the rewards offered to doves by the presence of a globocop that punishes hawks. Nor has the United States become a rogue nation, it too has played the game skillfully, reaping the rewards of European dovishness to maintain its position as Globocop. The European Union richly deserved its 2012 Peace Prize, but when the Nobel Committee gave the 2009 prize to Barack Obama, it might have done better to award it to all American presidents since 1945. Collectively, they have made Europe's experiment possible. America's Boer War If Western Europe is the region where the United States has done best at avoiding creating a rival, Southwest Asia has some claims to be the one where it has done worst. The United States has fought three wars here, four if we count the 2012 airstrikes on Libya, since the Berlin Wall came down, and we will be lucky to get through the 2010s without fighting a fourth or fifth. 
In this region, the similarities between the problems of the new and the old Globocops are especially strong. That is true even though Southwest Asia's strategic significance has changed out of all recognition across the last hundred years. In Mackinder's time, the Ottoman and Persian empires mattered most to the Globocop because they lay astride its communications through the Suez Canal to India. From the Caucasus to the Hindu Kush, British and Russian explorers and spies jostled for decades in what Kipling called the Great Game. Russian armies swallowed up what are now the stands of Central Asia. British redcoats swallowed, but could not keep down, Afghanistan. What changed the Great Game into the version we now play was, of course, oil. For decades after the world's first well was sunk at Titusville, Pennsylvania, in 1859, the United States remained the center of production, but drilling started in Southwest Asia in 1871, and Russian pioneers soon struck black gold at Baku in Azerbaijan. Western oil men followed, with a British speculator buying up rights to two-thirds of the oil in Persia in 1901, and Standard of California opening the first Saudi oil field in 1933. Production boomed in the 1960s to meet American, European, and Japanese demand, and by the mid-1970s, oil was sucking more than $400 million of outside money to the shores of the Persian Gulf every day. Western newspapers went wild with stories of Arab millionaires buying up historic landmarks, but on the face of it, there was little danger that America's success in creating a free market for the oil it needed would also create a Southwest Asian rival. With their tiny middle classes, restricted educational systems, and endemic corruption, not even the richest oil-producing countries of the 1960s were in any position to have their own industrial revolutions or create diversified modern economies. Because of this, oil money did not empower broad citizenries, as American aid had in Europe after World War II. Instead, it flowed largely into the hands of narrow elites, whose repression, dishonesty, and incompetence provoked growing anger. The United States, anxious to keep the sources of its oil out of Soviet clutches, found itself propping up dictators, juntas, and absolutist kings. Critics regularly charged that it was now running the same kind of informal empire that Europeans had used to dominate the Middle East in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Oil oligarchs tried to channel popular discontent into nationalism and hatred of Israel, but mullahs and ayatollahs did much better at hijacking the rage to serve Islamic fundamentalism and, of course, hatred of Israel too. Few Islamists saw the United States as their primary enemy, and even during the Iranian hostage crisis, some Americans still hoped to befriend the religious radicals, improbable as it now seems, Time magazine named Ayatollah Khomeini as its 1979 Man of the Year. But the revolutionaries quickly discovered that there was no way to fight American puppets without fighting America too, and before 1979 was over, Iran had branded the United States the Great Satan. Unintended consequences abounded as the Globocop tried to manage this angry new Islam. Far from the Persian Gulf's oil fields, American aid proved crucial to sustaining Afghan resistance against the Soviet occupation of the 1980s, but instead of earning goodwill, this just created a well-armed, battle-hardened legion of Arab jihadists. These men, ready to wage holy war against any foe, exploited the chaos left by the struggle against communism to turn Afghanistan into an Islamist safe haven. Worse was to come. Back in the heart of oil country, the United States rushed troops to the Gulf in 1990 to protect Saudi wells after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Given that Saddam had spent the 1980s waging war on revolutionary Iran, brutally repressing Islamists inside Iraq, and trying to develop nuclear weapons, Washington's move ought to have won Arab hearts and minds. But the presence of unbelievers on Arabia's sacred soil instead made many Muslims suspect American motives even more. The 1991 Gulf War and the tight sanctions that followed stopped Iraq from becoming the kind of Southwest Asian rival that the drafters of the defense planning guidance had feared. But over the next decade, American strategists, 
and almost everyone else, were blindsided by the way radical Islam mutated. All the forces shaking up the Muslim world, oil money, opposition to Arab rulers, jihad in Afghanistan, outrage at Americans in Saudi Arabia, unending hostility toward Israel, came together in one man, Osama bin Laden. Under your supervision, he wrote in an open letter to Americans in 2002, the governments of Muslim countries, which act as your agents, attack us on a daily basis. You steal our wealth and oil at paltry prices because of your international influence and military threats. This theft is indeed the biggest theft ever witnessed by mankind in the history of the world. Your forces occupy our countries. You spread your military bases throughout them. You corrupt our lands, and you besiege our sanctities to protect the security of the Jews. By this point, bin Laden's organization, Al-Qaeda, had declared war on the United States on behalf of all Muslims and killed 3,000 Americans. Since the late 1990s, Al-Qaeda has presented the Globocop with a new kind of rival. In most ways, it is much weaker than the nation-states that the drafters of the 1992 guidance worried about. If Al-Qaeda or an affiliate gets hold of a nuclear weapon, it could potentially kill a thousand times as many people as it murdered on September the 11th. But a nuclear-armed Iraq could have done, and should it arise, a nuclear-armed Iran may yet do, much worse. Southwest Asian governments with tax revenues and plenty of space to hide their weapons can amass hundreds of warheads rather than one or two. They can build missiles able to deliver death as far away as Europe, should they so desire. Given a few more years and the right friends, nowhere on earth would be safe. Al-Qaeda, however, cannot do this unless it finds a state sponsor, and it will never pose the kind of threat to the American Globocop that Germany and the United States posed to the British Globocop a century ago. Al-Qaeda does, though, very much resemble a different kind of threat that the British world system also faced in the late 19th century. Then, as now, terrorism and religious fundamentalism were popular responses to the Globocop. Anarchists and Islamists both enjoyed an earlier golden age between the 1880s and 1910s, their bullets and bombs carrying off czars and presidents. Muhammad Ahmad, known to the British as the Mad Mahdi, created an old-time al-Qaeda in Sudan. In 1883, his followers massacred to the last man a 10,000-strong Egyptian army and its British leader, and the following year they took Khartoum and killed another British general. Britain did not overthrow Islamist rule in Sudan until 1899 and kept troops there until 1956. Bin Laden had a lot in common with the Mad Mahdi, but was much more dangerous because he had a real plan. Knowing that al-Qaeda could never directly threaten the United States' survival, he instead crafted a two-part, indirect approach. His first step was to use violence to overthrow any government, from Algeria to Indonesia, that he judged insufficiently Islamist, what al-Qaeda calls the near enemy, thus creating a caliphate of all the faithful. The second, to entangle the United States, the distant enemy, in wars it could not afford and did not understand, until it tired of propping up non-Islamist regimes. Then, al-Qaeda's number two man explained, history would make a new turn, God willing, in the opposite direction against the empire of the United States and the world's Jewish government. As I write, in mid-2013, it looks as if history is failing to take this turn. Far from overthrowing the near enemy, Al-Qaeda has inspired fear and loathing all across the Middle East by murdering more Arabs than Americans. Its affiliates may be able to profit from disorder in Libya and Syria, but Afghanistan, Sudan and Somalia, which all had Islamist regimes before bin Laden's war began, have since shed them, and the countries where Islamists have put serious pressure on governments – Algeria, Mali, Yemen, Pakistan – all lie well outside the strategically crucial, oil-rich Gulf region. Only Pakistan, with its nuclear arsenal, poses a real threat to global order. A stable Afghanistan is not essential. A stable Pakistan is essential, President Obama's former special advisor on the region liked to say.
The United States' grand strategy against al-Qaeda's war on its near enemy was to defang the Islamists' appeal by promoting democratic reforms, to send forth the news, President Bush, the younger, said, from Damascus to Tehran, that freedom can be the future of every nation. The establishment of a free Iraq at the heart of the Middle East, he insisted, will be a watershed event in the global democratic revolution. Arguably, the fall of tyrants in Tunisia, Libya, Egypt and Yemen since 2011 has vindicated this strategy, although, as Bush himself recognized, modernization is not the same as westernization. Representative governments in the Middle East will reflect their own cultures. Freed from authoritarian rulers, Arab voters consistently elected Islamists, but, as I write, the consequences are still unclear. In Egypt, the army abandoned a dictator to his fate in 2011, but overthrew an elected Islamist president two years later. In Libya, Islamist extremists took root during the civil war that ended Gaddafi's rule and, using weapons looted from his regime, spread jihad into Mali. Syria, much like Somalia and Lebanon before it, has disintegrated into a land of warlords, some of them just as violent as al-Qaeda. Overall, the emerging post-Arab spring world looks somewhat democratic but highly unstable. It is largely Islamist, largely poor, badly governed, mistrustful of America, and even more mistrustful of Israel. It is hard to know who, out of Bush and bin Laden, would have liked it less. The second part of al-Qaeda's plot, to suck the United States into so many ruinous wars that it would turn its back on the vast Islamic inner rim, started well. Bin Laden judged rightly that by hitting the United States so hard in 2001, he would leave Americans no option but to invade Afghanistan to root him out. This saddled the United States with its longest ever war, and while the American decision to make an invasion of Iraq part of its response to terrorism was hardly a direct response to the events of September the 11th, the march on Baghdad was precisely the kind of overreaction that bin Laden had hoped for. Where bin Laden went disastrously wrong, though, was in thinking that an overcommitted United States would either bankrupt itself or back away from Southwest Asia. Instead, it stayed the course, killed bin Laden, and largely managed to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda. Barack Obama's definition of the goal. The cost of doing this, though, was to be dragged into yet another set of problems, strikingly like those the British Globocop wrestled with a century earlier. The war the United States got when it invaded Iraq in 2003 was, in a remarkable number of ways, a kind of rerun of the Boer War that Britain fought against the South African Republic and Orange Free State between 1899 and 1902. The Boer and Iraq wars were both preemptive, launched to head off future aggression. In both 1899 and 2003, critics often blamed war on an unholy alliance of self-interested politicians and businessmen greedy for natural resources, gold and diamonds in South Africa, oil in Iraq. The politicians leading the two globocops into war, however, often saw themselves as humanitarians, not materialists, fighting to protect the downtrodden, Shiites and Kurds in Iraq, black Africans in the Boer War. But regardless of which interpretation held the most truth, Britain and the United States both found that their decisions to use force divided opinion at home and turned old allies against them. Where the Boer and Iraq wars differed most was in their opening stages. In 2003, the United States overwhelmed Iraq's army, while in 1899 Britain blundered into defeat after defeat, sending soldiers in closed ranks across open terrain into withering artillery and rifle fire. Within 18 months, though, the British had enough boots on the ground to bludgeon the Boer armies to pieces, only to find, as the Americans would do 103 years later, that their foes melted away and became insurgents. The British army in 1900 and the American in 2003 were built to fight conventional wars, and at first both found counterinsurgency heavy going. For the British, it meant chasing tiny detachments, which the Boers called commandos, across vast stretches of veld. 
We live in momentary expectation of the order, saddle up, one officer recalled. Many a time we did saddle up, but however quick we might be, we were never quick enough. In a similar mood more than a century later, a U.S. Marine told his newly arrived commanding officer, Sir, we patrol until we hit an IED, then we call in a medivac and go back, and then we do it again the next day. Both armies learned quickly. New commanders, Herbert Kitchener for the British, David Petraeus for the Americans, worked out counterinsurgency strategies and got the upper hand. But both Globocops paid a price for this success because the obvious way to fight irregular enemies was to turn to what Vice President Dick Cheney called the dark side, and this was highly unpopular at home and among allies. The United States spied on its own citizens, detained prisoners indefinitely, and denied them the protection of the Geneva Conventions. It tortured some of its captives and shipped others to countries that recognized no restraints at all, and even after these methods were renounced, targeted killings by remotely piloted aircraft continued to excite opposition. But compared with Britain's treatment of South Africans, Americans never got very dark at all. Kitchener burned thousands of farms, shot the insurgents' cattle, and herded their families into concentration camps. Roughly a quarter of the detainees, overwhelmingly women and children, died of disease and starvation. Overall, despite missteps, the United States handled its version of the Boer War much better than the British handled the original, squandering far less blood and gold and inflicting less pain. Of roughly 1.5 million American troops who served in Iraq, fewer than 5,000 died. Britain sent similar numbers to South Africa, but lost 22,000, mostly from disease. Roughly one Iraqi civilian in every 300 died violently during the American occupation, the vast majority at the hands of other Iraqis and foreign militants in sectarian fighting. But Britain was ten times as murderous, killing one South African in 30 during the Boer War. America's war was also more cost-effective, the final bill, after the interest on borrowing is paid off, may be about $2.4 trillion, or roughly one-sixth of the U.S. GDP in 2011, but Britain's £211 billion tab for the Boer War represented one-third of its 1902 GDP. In the end, Britain and the United States both won their Boer Wars, but to do this, both had to define down what victory meant. Britain drove South Africa's pre-war leader Paul Kruger into exile, only to hand over much of what he had wanted to post-war South African governments run by former insurgents. Similarly, the United States toppled Saddam, only to see Iraqis elect governments with strong ties to the insurgents and Iran. The lesson seems to be that it is easy for a globocop to get into a boar-type war in a resource-rich part of the inner rim but difficult, divisive, and expensive to get out again. A determined Globocop will probably always be able to win a Boer War, but a Globocop that makes a habit of fighting Boer Wars will probably not hang on to its job for long. Britain learned these lessons and avoided further Boer Wars. Time will tell whether the United States can follow the same path. On the positive side, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates are in general retreat, and American dependence on Persian Gulf oil is declining. Thanks to greater efficiency and booming domestic production, American energy imports in 2014 should be smaller than at any time since 1987. But on the negative side, the Afghan war looks likely to end even less satisfactorily than the Iraq war. The Arab Spring has spawned economic collapse, and, particularly in the diplomatic debacle over Syria in September 2013, damaged American credibility, and Iran is close to acquiring nuclear weapons, which, Henry Kissinger warned during the darkest days of the Iraq War, would be one of the worst strategic nightmares that America could imagine. Since then, tight sanctions, assassinations of scientists, and fiendishly clever cyber attacks have driven Iran to the negotiating table, but they cannot undo the nuclear advances it has already made. If Iran ever puts a live warhead on a missile, it risks war with Israel and perhaps with the United States too. But it does not need to go that far, 
because it can probably bully and blackmail its neighbours simply by being known to be capable of going nuclear at short notice. Possibly the United States and Southwest Asia would learn to live with this, just as the United States and Northeast Asia have, so far, lived with a nuclear North Korea. Equally possibly, though, an almost nuclear Iran would send wealthy neighbours, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, rushing to the almost nuclear threshold too. At that point, Israel and or the United States might well feel that another preemptive war, the mother of all Boer Wars, would be less bad than the risk of a Middle Eastern nuclear war. Currently, Southwest Asia consumes almost one-sixth of the American military budget. Given the continuing threats from terrorism, Islamism and the Iranian nuclear program, plus, at least in the short term, the continuing importance of the region's oil, this seems unlikely to fall any time soon, even assuming that the United States avoids another Boer War. Such costs will perhaps be bearable if Southwest Asia remains America's major military focus, but of all the uncertainties in the coming decade, this seems the least certain of all. The Inevitable Analogy When it comes to predicting the nature and location of our next military engagements, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates told West Point cadets in 2011, our record has been perfect. We have never once gotten it right. But that has not stopped military men from trying. Plans, after all, have to be made and weapon systems procured. And in the 1990s, with the Soviet Union gone and the number of interstate conflicts falling, one expert after another concluded that there would be no more big wars. The struggles in Iraq and Afghanistan after 2001 seemed to confirm this prognosis. From here on out, it would be counterinsurgency all the way. So it was that when I had an opportunity in early 2012 to visit the U.S. Army National Training Center at Fort Irwin, California, I found myself in the middle of a mock Middle Eastern village, complete with mosques and Arab-speaking actors. I joined a party on an unfinished, wind-blown rooftop to watch troops trying their hand at taking Afghan elders to a meeting, only for make-believe jihadists to ambush them in the alleys. A bomb went off in a trash can with a deafening blast. Snipers opened up from windows and hillsides. A Humvee broke down, blocking a crucial intersection. It was unbelievably loud, dusty and confusing, but the convoy finally fought its way out. Fort Irwin, a chunk of the Mojave Desert as big as the state of Rhode Island, is the last place American troops go before deploying overseas. For more than 30 years, it has been a barometer of American thinking about coming engagements. Had I shown up in 1980, when the center opened, I would have seen long-range shootouts between hundreds of tanks, skies full of fighters, and entire infantry battalions storming drab replicas of central European towns. But that all changed in 2005, when concerns about counterinsurgency took over. All the fake apartment blocks were torn down, except for one ersatz town, saved for old time's sake. In their place, the imitation minarets and madrasas that I saw rose from the sand. If I get a chance to make another visit any time soon, the scenery in the Mojave Desert will have changed yet again. Counterinsurgency was the face of battle while the Globo Cop was strong enough to deter all rivals from trying anything else. But how much longer, the army is now asking, will that hold true? Hoping for the best, but planning for the worst, the centre is bringing back the tanks. Middle Eastern mock-ups are making way for a range of scenarios, from blitzkrieg breakthroughs to gunfights with gangsters. The new settings could represent almost any place, from Syria to South Korea, but major wars are definitely back on the army's agenda. Despite the Globocop's travails in Southwest Asia, it is increasingly looking as if the region where it is failing most seriously at preventing the rise of strategic rivals is actually East Asia. Along the continent's outer rim, the chain of islands from Japan to Jakarta, the struggle has generally gone well. In some ways, in fact, developments in outer rim East Asia have been very like those in Western Europe. Japan, like West Germany, was demilitarized and occupied in 1945, 
and then partially remilitarized and admitted to world markets under American supervision. South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore all followed suit, turning into economic giants. But even in the 1980s, when Japan was booming even faster than West Germany and its holdings of U.S. Treasury bonds had reached enormous heights, American anxiety about having created a Japanese rival remained muted. East Asia's inner rim, however, has been a different story. The People's Republic of China controls not only thousands of miles of inner rim coastline, but also a great swath of the Eurasian heartland, putting it in much the same position that Germany would have been in had it won either of the world wars. For two millennia, this setting made China one of the world's biggest economies, but since the Industrial Revolution, it has left the nation dependent on importing natural resources and exporting finished products through the Outer Rim. Every year, five trillion dollars in goods passes through the South China Sea, investing not just the Strait of Malacca, but also tiny specks of rock, such as the Spratly and Paracel Islands, called the Nansha and Shisha Islands in Chinese, with huge strategic significance. By the time Mao Zedong seized power in 1949, it looked as if the successive Outer Rim Globocops had encircled China with island chains that could strangle its economy. Mao's initial response was to seek drastic remedies. In his first five years, he tried to loosen the Globocops' grip by sending millions of men to fight in Korea and threatening to invade Taiwan, but in both cases, American nuclear blackmail persuaded him to back down. Next, he decided to ignore geopolitics and to jumpstart a Chinese industrial revolution by sheer willpower. However, when he commanded peasants to switch from farming to backyard ironworking, 20 million starved. Undeterred, Mao proclaimed a cultural revolution, urging younger communists to tear down everything old, including the economy, before building a utopia fueled by nothing more solid than Mao Zedong thought. Once again, disaster ensued. Things got so bad by 1972 that Mao felt compelled to signal his openness to change in the grandest possible way. For some time, Richard Nixon had been angling to bring China and the United States closer together to oppose the Soviet Union. Now, to general astonishment, Mao invited America's former red-baiter-in-chief to Beijing. This was the week that changed the world, Nixon grandiloquently announced, but in fact, it was only after Mao was safely dead that saner councils really prevailed in China. By that point, in the late 1970s, China's economy needed to grow by 8% every year for decades to avoid famines even worse than the ones it had already endured. Recognizing this, Deng Xiaoping opened China to the world economy. Since China could not break the island chains by force, it had virtually no navy, and the vast People's Liberation Army, old-fashioned at the best of times, had come to collapse during the Cultural Revolution. This meant making nice with the Globocop. Deng's policies unleashed environmental devastation and rampant corruption, but they also delivered the goods. During the 1990s, a staggering 150 million farmers fled the impoverished interior for factories near the coast, effectively creating a new Chicago every year. Moving to a city typically raised a worker's income by 50%, and because the new urbanites still needed to eat, those who stayed on the farm and sold food to the cities also saw wages rise by 6% per year. By 2006, China's economy was nine times bigger than it had been when Mao died 30 years earlier. But this was just the beginning. 14,000 new cars were hitting China's roads every day in 2006, and nearly 53,000 miles of new roads were being built for them to drive on. By 2030, officials estimated, these cars and roads would bring another 400 million peasants into the cities, and to accommodate them, China would erect more than half of all the homes being built on the planet. Between 1976 and 2006, China's share of the world's economic output more than tripled, from 4.5 to 15.4 percent. Across the same years, the American share declined, and although the United States was still ahead, producing 19.5 percent of the world's GDP, 
there was no denying that the Globocop now had a rival. The United States let China become such a rival for the same reason that the United Kingdom let Germany and the United States itself become rivals in the late 19th century. It made the Globocop richer too. In fact, China's rise was an extraordinarily good financial deal for America. Because Chinese imports were so inexpensive, most American workers saw their living standards improve, even though their wages were stagnant, and because China lent much of its profits back to the United States by buying a trillion dollars worth of treasury bonds, Americans never ran out of money to keep buying Chinese imports. As a final touch, cheap Chinese goods exerted deflationary pressures that prevented cheap Chinese credit from setting off rampant inflation. Everybody won. So mutually rewarding was the relationship between the Globocop and its Asian friend that the historian Neil Ferguson and the economist Moritz Schulerich christened it Chimerica, a marriage of China and America. What made the name so apt, though, was that Chimerica was also a chimera, a dream from which the world would eventually wake up. In economics, as in strategy, every action has a culminating point, beyond which, Clausewitz observed, the scale turns and the reaction follows. The scale was already turning by 2004, when Business Week magazine announced that the China price had become the three scariest words in U.S. industry, and the turn was complete by 2008, when economic logic reasserted itself and Western asset bubbles burst. In April 2009, with the bottom of the abyss still not in sight, the leaders of the world's 20 biggest economies met in London to craft a response. Their best hope, one of their British hosts suggested, was that a joke doing the rounds of the meeting would turn out to be true. After the Tiananmen Square crisis in 1989, capitalism saved China. After 2009, China saved capitalism. Be careful what you wish for, the saying goes. China's part in helping to save capitalism made the China price into the scariest three words for American diplomats as well as industrialists. China has become a massive body in the financial firmament, and its economic gravity is pulling the Western Pacific into a sinocentric orbit. Before 2009 was over, South Korea, Japan, and even Taiwan had all made very public overtures to Beijing. Vital links in the island chain around China were close to snapping. The big question was what this would mean for the Globocop. Not much, said Beijing, which, since 2004, had been describing China's growing influence as a peaceful rise. China, it insisted, was joining, not challenging, the American world system and would accept its rules. And just in case peaceful rise still sounded alarming, Beijing softened its image still further in 2008 by changing the label to peaceful development. This, spokesman explained, was part of an ancient Chinese strategic culture rooted in Confucianism. Rather than using force to resolve disputes, China had always relied on virtue, showing by its humane example that cooperation would make everyone better off. Americans have often made similar claims about their own policies. As long ago as 1821, John Quincy Adams argued that the United States made its mark on the world through the benignant sympathy of her example. But despite these fine words, the United States has regularly resorted to force and throughout history, in fact, geopolitical shifts on the scale of China's takeoff have always been accompanied by massive violence. Europe's rise between the 15th and the 19th centuries had involved a 500 years war, and the shift in the economic center of gravity from Europe to North America between 1914 and 1945 set off a storm of steel. Perhaps this time will be different, but if drawing the Western Pacific into a sinocentric orbit also means drawing the region out of the American orbit, the consequences for the Globocop could be fatal very like, perhaps, those Britain would have suffered if Germany had defeated France in 1914 and shut it out of a Western European customs union. China's leaders are neither uniquely virtuous, as the Confucian argument implies, 
nor uniquely vicious, as their shriller critics sometimes suggest. They are just like leaders throughout the world and throughout history, but that is precisely what makes the situation alarming. China, like everyone else, has to play the game of death. Since the 1980s, it has mostly played the game well, which means, as it always means, being dovish when that works and hawkish when it does not. Far from substituting Confucius for Mackinder, China is, in the words of the journalist Robert Kaplan, an uber-realist power. Recognizing its military weakness, diplomatic isolation, and strategic vulnerability, for a generation after Mao's death, China avoided confrontations while pouring money into military modernization. Between 1989 and 2011, spending grew almost sevenfold, while the American defense budget, despite vast outlays on the global war on terror, grew by just one quarter. The inevitable analogy, says the strategist Edward Lutwak, is between China today and Germany in the 1890s. But while both countries spent massively to turn industrial might into military might, China's spending has been smarter than Germany's. Kaiser Wilhelm challenged the United Kingdom directly by building a battleship fleet, but China is challenging the United States asymmetrically. Chinese investment has gone mostly into submarines, mines, and short-range ballistic missiles. These cannot contest American dominance of the oceans, but they can make the waters right around China too dangerous for the United States to operate in. According to one senior Chinese advisor, Beijing is looking for more strategic space in the western part of the Pacific, so that American strategic weapons will not be able to pass through the Yellow Sea and the East China Sea. Success may be close. War games played by the Rand Corporation in 2009 suggested that already by 2013, China would be able to win an air war over Taiwan. Its thousands of missiles would quickly suppress land-based Taiwanese fighters, and with American planes forced to operate from carriers deployed out of missile range over the horizon, in military speak, or from distant Guam, a mainland invasion of Taiwan would stand a good chance of success. None of this would matter if China could rely on economic gravity to resolve all disputes in its favor, but strategy being what it is, that is not happening. By 2010, China's growing power had so alarmed its neighbors that some were banding together to stand up to the giant. Predictably, as dovish behavior stopped yielding results, China turned more hawkish. The series of standoffs with Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and even India followed. Around one uninhabited atoll after another, aircraft buzzed each other, frigates were blasted with fire hoses, and fishermen were arrested. China ready for worst-case Diayu scenario, the Global Times, more or less an organ of the China Communist Party, warned. In mid-2011, as governments all around the Pacific Rim weighed their options, I had the good fortune to be invited to Canberra for a meeting of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Seen from Canberra, the dilemmas were particularly acute. When the rest of the West had fallen into recession in 2009, Australia had not, largely because China's continued hunger for its coal and iron fueled a mining and commodities boom. By 2011, the country was unique among rich nations in being in its 20th straight year of economic growth. To many Australians, this suggested, as the Institute's director, Major General Peter Abigail, put it, that Australia will at some stage need to make a choice between its primary economic partner, China, and its primary security partner, the United States. During the darkest days of the global financial crisis, Australia had already hinted at what its choice would be. The government's judgment, a defence white paper had announced in 2009, is that strategic stability in the region is best underpinned by the continued presence of the United States. But the problem, as Australian journalists mercilessly pointed out, was that the official thinking was a mess. After insisting on the primacy of Australia's security partner, the bulk of the white paper was about how to stay in its economic partner's good graces. 
The meeting I went to had been called to try to straighten out this muddle before the government published its next defence white paper. The discussion was open and engaged, ranging from the nature of strategy to urbanisation and energy, but through it all there was a palpable discomfort in the room. Every option seemed to bring more costs than benefits. A split with its economic partner would ruin Australia. A split with its security partner would leave Australia unable to stand up to China. And if, miracle of miracles, Australia managed to keep all these balls in the air, a continuing mining boom would ruin it anyway by distorting its economy. Personally, I left Canberra even less certain about what would happen next than I had been when I arrived, but behind the scenes more important conversations were going on. At first, these conversations also seemed to be more decisive. Forsaking ambiguity, the Australian government announced that Australia and the United States are seeking to align their respective force postures in ways that serve shared security interests. In November 2011, Barack Obama flew to Canberra. Let there be no doubt, he told the Parliament, in the Asia-Pacific of the 21st century, the United States of America is all in. We will allocate the resources necessary to maintain our strong military presence in the region. We will keep our commitments. Over the months that followed, discussions much like those in Canberra went on all along the island chains. One government after another followed Australia's lead and stiffened its spine. A flurry of collective security agreements followed, and some nations made major policy shifts. Myanmar turned its back on China and embraced Washington and democracy. Japan talked of rearming and even of fighting China over the Senkaku Islands. But no sooner had these new certainties taken shape than they began dissolving. In May 2013, Australia's new defence white paper abandoned the recent tough talk and cut back military spending sharply. Whereas the Chinese saw the previous plan as a red rag, Rory Medcalf of Sydney's Lowy Institute for International Policy observed, it is tempting to caricature Australia's new strategy as raising a white flag. This, apparently, was just the conclusion that the People's Liberation Army did reach. U.S. power, its newly appointed deputy chief of staff told a Communist Party newspaper, is on the decline and leading the Asia-Pacific is beyond its grasp. Perhaps I was right to be confused in Canberra. Nothing is clear in the Western Pacific because the fog of unknown unknowns is denser here than anywhere else on Earth. And yet it is here that the most important decisions have to be made. If we get China wrong, one Washington insider admitted, in 30 years that's the only thing anyone will remember. Breaking the Chains the worst way the United States could get China wrong is the same as the worst way that Britain could have gotten Germany wrong a century ago, by getting into a war with it. To experts in Washington, the most easily imaginable military scenario is that China might grab the Senkakus, Spratlys, Paracels, or some similarly isolated piece of real estate, perhaps in the hope that a weak American response would lead its allies to desert it, breaking the island chains. However, hardly anyone thinks this scenario will actually happen. In 2011, Foreign Policy magazine asked a group of experts to rate the likelihood of a Sino-American war in the next decade on a scale from 1, impossible, to 10, certain. No one gave a score above 5, and the average was just 2.4. Non-experts agree. That same year, the Pew Research Center found that only 20% of Americans saw China as the greatest international threat, although that did represent a doubling since 2009, and China scored higher than any other country. In second place, with 18%, was North Korea. The reason this island-grabbing scenario seems so unlikely is that despite China's military buildup, American dominance remains overwhelming. Aggression would call down on China a counteroffensive that American planners call air-sea battle. The United States has well-developed plans for cyber war and would open with a massive electronic strike, paralyzing China's power grids and finances, blinding its satellites and surveillance, 
and jamming its command and control systems. Crews and ballistic missiles guaranteed to land within five or ten yards of their targets even after flying thousands of miles would crater China's military runways and annihilate its surface-to-air defences. Virtually undetectable stealth planes, B-2 bombers, F-22 fighters, and eventually F-35s too, would streak deep into the interior, flattening missile launch pads. China would lose the initiative within hours, and while American admirals might still hesitate to sail close to the Chinese coast, their naval aircraft and missiles would sink any Chinese ship foolish enough to put to sea and would pulverize any breach in the island chain. Experts in Beijing seem to agree that island grabbing would be unwise. In fact, they suggest, the real security risk is not a speculative Chinese attack, but a preemptive American one. In the 1950s, American presidents sent tanks to the Yalu River and twice threatened nuclear war. Even the level-headed Premier Hu Jiantao sometimes felt besieged, observing in 2002 that the United States had strengthened its military deployments in the Asia-Pacific region, strengthened the U.S.-Japan military alliance, strengthened strategic cooperation with India, improved relations with Vietnam, inveigled Pakistan, strengthened a pro-American government in Afghanistan, increased arms sales to Taiwan, and so on. He suggested that they have extended outposts and placed pressure points on us from the east, south, and west. To some Chinese generals, the harsh logic of the game of death seems to be encouraging the United States to exploit its military lead while it still can, launching an unprovoked attack on its rising rival to win itself another generation as Globocop. That, though, is surely the least likely future of all. Globocops, like real cops, pay huge reputational costs for brutalizing the innocent. Democratic Globocops pay higher costs still, and when the intended victim is also the Globocop's banker, as China is for the United States, beating him up becomes a truly terrible idea. The Pax Americana, like the Pax Britannica before it, is as much a diplomatic and financial balance as a military one, and winning a preemptive war would hurt the Americans almost as much as the Chinese. If anyone gained from such a war, it would probably be Russia, the fourth region that the drafters of the Defense Planning Guide worried about back in 1992. For a decade, their fears of Russian revanchism seemed misplaced because the country fell off an economic cliff. Output declined by 40% in the 1990s and real wages by 45%. The government defaulted on its debts in 1998 and living standards tumbled so far that in 2000 the average Russian died younger than his or her grandparents. Russia hung on to the world's biggest nuclear arsenal, but it was not even clear whether its missiles still worked, and its soldiers put up a wretched showing against Islamists in Chechnya. But since the 1990s much has changed. Fueled by oil and gas exports, GDP per person doubled between 2000 and 2012. The Kremlin has announced a $600 billion modernization of its submarines and missiles, and it is carving a smaller, nimbler expeditionary force out of the ruins of the old Red Army. Russia remains much less threatening than the Soviet Union, and may become less threatening still if, as the World Bank expects, its oil revenues fall after 2015. But even so, if American aggression pushed China into Russia's arms, that would be among the worst of all possible outcomes for the Globocop. A Russo-Chinese axis controlling the Eurasian heartland and a great stretch of its inner rim would be Mackinder's worst nightmare. For some years, Russia and China have been cooperating loosely to block American plans in Syria, Iran, Pakistan and North Korea, but the two countries' differences over Russian arms sales to Vietnam and India, Chinese access to Russian oil and gas, and competition in mineral-rich Kazakhstan and Mongolia have so far obstructed anything deeper. Far from buying itself more time to act as a globocop, if the United States was to beat China on the battlefield, it would overshoot the culminating point of its strategy, leaving Beijing with nowhere to turn but Moscow and bringing on just the strategic disaster it was trying to avert.
The obvious conclusion to draw is that despite all the sabre-rattling and policy pivoting since 2009, the costs of using force are prohibitively high for everyone involved, and the payoffs equally low. It is hard to imagine anyone starting a great power war in East Asia in the 2010s, just as it was hard to imagine anyone doing so in Europe back in the 1870s, when the British Globocop began showing the first signs of losing its grip. It took another 40 years of relative decline, in which Britain's economy grew more slowly than those of its rivals, before anyone was willing to push matters all the way to the brink. And that, I would suggest, is the historical analogy that we need to worry about. If the 40 years between the 2010s and the 2050s do unfold, like the 40 between the 1870s and the 1910s, they will be the most dangerous in history. There is, of course, no guarantee that history will repeat itself. Much could change in the next four decades. Chinese growth might stall, as Japan's did in the 1990s. Or the American economy might get new legs, invigorated perhaps by its ongoing revolution in extracting gas and oil from shale and tar sands. This promises, or threatens, environmentalists decry the dirtiness of the new fracking technology, to release vast supplies of energy from what once seemed unprofitable sources. Some economists also suggest that a third industrial revolution in nanotechnology and three-dimensional printing will boost American productivity even more dramatically. The United States might then confound its critics, as it has often done before. Plenty of people wrote America off back in the 1930s, only to see it come back and defeat the Nazis in the 1940s. Others wrote it off again in the 1970s, only for it to defeat the Soviets in the 1980s. Who is to say that the United States will not continue the 40-year cycle, recovering from its 2010s woes to get the better of China in the 2020s? Current trends, however, make such sunny prognostications look rather unlikely. Chinese growth will probably slow over the next few decades, but most economists think it will nonetheless remain faster than American economic expansion. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, for instance, foresees Chinese growth coming down from 9.5% in 2013 to 4.0% in 2030, but in no year, it predicts, will the American economy expand by more than 2.4%. The Congressional Budget Office is gloomier still, setting a ceiling for American annual growth of 2.25% in the 2020s, and some financial analysts foresee long-term American growth averaging just 1-1.4% to per year. Most predictions expect China's economy to outgrow America's sometime between 2017 and 2027, probably in 2019, and almost certainly by 2022, says The Economist. According to the accountants at PricewaterhouseCoopers, China's GDP will be 50% bigger than the United States in the 2050s, while the OECD's economists think the gap will be more like 70%. And by that point, both sets of experts agree, India's economy will also be catching up with, or overtaking, America's. One of the reasons that American military dominance is so overwhelming in the mid-2010s is that the United States not only has a bigger economy than China, roughly $15 trillion versus $12 trillion in 2012, calculated at purchasing power parity, but also spends more of it, 4.8% versus 2.1%, on preparing for war. But that, too, is changing. Chinese military investment, after more than doubling between 1991 and 2001, and then tripling again in the next decade, will probably slow in the 2010s, but American spending will actually shrink. After failing to find a plan to deal with its $16.7 trillion debt mountain, $148,000 per taxpayer, the American government imposed across-the-board cuts on itself in March 2013. Military spending, which stood at $690 billion in 2012, was capped at $475 billion. By 2023, 
it will be lower in real terms than it was in 2010. It will take China decades to catch up with the American military budget. In 2012, the gap was $228 billion at purchasing power parity, and even then it will probably not have wiped out the lead in morale, command and control, and all-round effectiveness that American forces have built up across a century of preeminence. But that, perhaps, is not the most important point. Britain ceased to be an effective globocop long before any individual foreign power could have beaten its navy in a straight fight, and much the same fate awaits the United States as soon as it can no longer afford armed forces powerful enough to intimidate everyone at once. The 2010s, warns Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution, will probably force dramatic changes in America's basic strategic approach to the world, and while hardly emasculating the country or its armed forces, the cuts would be too risky for the world in which we live. The most significant threat to our national security, the outgoing chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff warned in 2010, is our debt. But this, in fact, understates the problem in two big ways. First, debt is just a symptom of the deeper issue of American relative economic decline. And second, the United States' economic problems threaten the entire world's security, not just its own. If the downward trend of the last 60 years continues for another 40, the United States will lose the economic dominance it needs to be a globocop. Like Britain around 1900, it may have to farm out parts of its beat to allies, multiplying unknown unknowns. To the rising powers of the 2010s and probably the 2020s too, any move that risks war with the United States smacks of madness. But the payoffs may look very different to the rising powers of the 2030s and 2040s. Absent an American economic revival, the 2050s may have much in common with the 1910s, with no one quite sure whether the globocop can still outgun everyone else. The Years of Living Dangerously We are headed into uncharted waters, warns the National Intelligence Council in Global Trends 2030, the 2012 edition of the Strategic Foresight Report that it presents every four years to the newly elected or re-elected American president. The real issue in the 2010s, they suggest, is not just that the United States has failed to prevent the emergence of a new rival. It is that the great power politicking that worried the drafters of the defense planning guidance 20 years ago is in fact just the tip of a much bigger iceberg of uncertainty. Deep below the surface, says the Council, are seven tectonic shifts playing out slowly across the coming decades. The growth of the global middle class, wider access to lethal and disruptive technologies, the shift of economic power toward the east and the south, unprecedented and widespread aging, urbanization, food and water pressures, and the return of American energy independence. Not all of these will work against the Globocop's interests, but at the very least seem likely to complicate its job. Nearer the surface, the Council sees six game-changers, questions regarding the global economy, governance, conflict, regional instability, technology, and the role of the United States. Any of these could blow up at any point, rearranging the geopolitical landscape in a matter of weeks. And right on the waterline, says the Council, operating on even shorter timescales, comes a bevy of black swans, everything from pandemics through solar storms that cripple the world's electricity supply to the collapse of the euro. The unstable years between 1870 and 1914 had uncertainties of their own, but, the Council points out, we have now added an entirely new challenge, climate change. Of the 100 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide that humans have pumped into the air since 1750, a full quarter was belched out between 2000 and 2010. On May the 10th, 2013, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere briefly peaked above 400 parts per million, its highest level in 800,000 years. 
Average temperatures rose 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit between 1910 and 2010, and the ten hottest years on record have all been since 1998. So far, the effects have been fairly small, but the worst impacts have come in what the Council calls an arc of instability. The news from this crescent of poor, arid, politically unstable but often energy-rich lands is mostly bad. Water flow in the mighty Euphrates River, which irrigates much of Syria and Iraq, has declined by one-third in recent decades, and the water table in its drainage basin dropped by a foot each year between 2006 and 2009. In 2013, Egypt even hinted at war if Ethiopia went ahead with a giant dam on the Nile. Extreme weather will roil the ark with more droughts, more crop failures, and millions more migrants. It is a recipe for more Boer Wars. The greatest uncertainty, though, is that climate change is an unknown in the fullest sense. Scientists simply do not know what will happen next. In 2013, NASA reported that the five-year mean global temperature has been flat for a decade. This might be good news, meaning that temperatures are less sensitive to carbon levels than climatologists had thought, in which case global warming might stay at the low end of the estimates, adding just one degree Fahrenheit between 1985 and 2035. Or it might be bad news, meaning that the carbon-climate relationship is more volatile than had been thought, in which case temperatures will suddenly spike up from their 2002 to 12 plateau. Few scientific debates have so much strategic significance, but in what might be a sign of more uncertainty to come, budget cuts forced the CIA to close its Center on Climate Change and National Security at the end of 2012, just days before the Global Trends 2030 report was published. But in spite of all this doom and gloom, the National Intelligence Council remains relatively optimistic about the outlook as far forward as 2030, the end point of its study. The Globocop will probably face mounting financial pressures, but will still be able to do its job. Consequently, while major powers might be drawn into conflict, we do not see any tensions or bilateral conflict igniting a full-scale conflagration. Further, the potential death toll from great power conflicts is currently declining. There are no longer enough nuclear warheads in the world to kill us all. An all-out nuclear exchange in the mid-2010s might kill several hundred million people, more than World War II, but much less than the billion-plus whose lives hung in the balance when Petrov had his moment of truth. And as the 2010s go on, the scale of possible slaughter will probably fall further. All the great powers, except China, plan more nuclear reductions, and in 2013 the United States ruled out any possibility of short-term rearmament by putting its new Los Alamos plutonium production facility on hold because of money problems. As well as getting scarcer, warheads have gotten smaller. The bomb is a 70-year-old technology, invented in an age when explosives tossed out of the back of a plane were lucky to land within half a mile of what they were aimed at. Multi-megaton blasts solved the targeting problem by leveling entire cities. But today, when precision-guided munitions can strike within a few feet of their intended victims, these huge, expensive hydrogen bombs look like a solution to a problem that no longer exists. Accurate, low-yield nuclear warheads or even smart conventional bombs, have largely replaced them. Even more remarkably, the computers that make smart bombs possible are also giving us anti-missile defenses that actually work. There is still a long way to go, and no shield could currently hold off a serious attack by hundreds of missiles equipped with decoys and countermeasures, but in 16 tests since 1999, the U.S. ground-based mid-course defense system hit half of the ICBMs sent against it. In November 2012, Israel's Iron Dome system did better still, shooting down 90% of the slower, short-range rockets fired from the Gaza Strip. In the next decade or two, 
the computerization of war will go much further, and, initially at least, almost everything about it will make war less bloody. When the Soviet Union tried to suppress Afghan insurgents in the 1980s, it shelled and carpet-bombed their villages, killing tens of thousands of people. Since 2002, by contrast, the United States has handed over more and more of its own counterinsurgency in that country to remotely piloted aircraft. Like precision-guided missiles, drones, as they are commonly called, are cheaper than alternative tools. About $26 million for a top-of-the-line MQ-9 Reaper, as against an anticipated $235 million for an F-35 fighter, and kill fewer people. Estimates of civilian deaths from drone strikes in Afghanistan and Pakistan have become a political football, and vary from the low hundreds to the low thousands, but even the highest figures are much lower than the carnage any other method of going after the same targets, say by using special forces or conventional air raids, would have produced. By 2011, Air Force drones had logged a million active service flight hours, flying 2,000 sorties in that year alone. The typical mission involves drones loitering 15,000 feet above a suspect, unseen and unheard, for up to three weeks. Sophisticated cameras, which account for a quarter of the cost of an MQ-1 Predator, record the targets every move, beaming pictures back through a chain of satellites and relay stations to Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. Here, two-person crews sit in cramped but cool and comfortable trailers. I had the opportunity to visit one in 2013, for hour after hour, watching the glowing monitors to establish the suspect's patterns of life. Much of the time, the mission goes nowhere. The suspect turns out to be just an ordinary Afghan, falsely fingered by an angry or hyper-vigilant neighbor. But if the cameras do record suspicious behavior, ground forces are called in to make an arrest, usually in the dead of night, to reduce the risk of a shootout. If alert insurgents, woken by the roar of helicopters and Humvees, creep or run away, leakers and squirters, Air Force pilots call them, a drone sparkles them with infrared lasers, invisible to the naked eye, but allowing troops with night vision gear to make arrests at their own convenience. The mere possibility of attracting drones' attention has hamstrung jihadists. The best plan, an advice sheet for Malian insurgents warned in 2012, was to maintain complete silence of all wireless contacts and to avoid gathering in open areas, hardly a recipe for effective operations. Drones have become the eyes and ears of counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, and in about 1% of missions they also become its teeth. Tight rules of engagement bind Air Force crews, but when a suspect does something clearly hostile, such as setting up a mortar in the back of a truck, the pilot can squeeze a trigger on a joystick back in Nevada, killing the insurgent with a precision-guided Hellfire missile. In Pakistan and Yemen, where the United States is technically not at war, the CIA has separate secret drone programs. With different rules of engagement and fewer options to use ground forces, these probably use missiles and bombs more often than the Air Force, but here too, civilian casualties fell sharply between 2010 and 2013. Drones are the thin end of a robotic wedge, which is breaking apart conventional fighting done by humans. The wedge has not widened as quickly as some people expected. In 2003, a report from the U.S. Joint Forces Command speculated that between 2015 and 2025, the joint force could be largely robotic at the tactical level. But neither has it gone as slowly as some naysayers thought. It is doubtful that computers will ever be smart enough to do all of the fighting, the historian Max Boot argued in 2006, leading him to predict that machines will only be called upon to perform work that is dull, dirty, or dangerous. The actual outcome will probably be somewhere between these extremes, with the trend of the last 40 years toward machines taking over the fastest and most technically sophisticated kinds of combat accelerating in the coming 40. At present, drones can only operate if manned aircraft first establish air superiority, 
because the slow-moving robots would be sitting ducks if a near-peer rival contested the skies with fighters, surface-to-air missiles or signal jammers. Flying a drone over Afghanistan from a trailer in Nevada is an odd, out-of-body experience. I was given a few minutes on a simulator at Creech Air Force Base. Because the delay between your hand moving the joystick and the aircraft responding can be as much as a second and a half as the signal races around the world through relay stations and satellite links. Better communications, or putting the pilots in trailers in theatre, can shorten the delay, but the finite speed of light means it will never go away. In the Top Gun world of supersonic dogfights, milliseconds matter, and remotely piloted aircraft will never be able to compete with manned fighters. The solution, an Air Force study suggested in 2009, might be to shift from keeping humans in the loop, remotely flying the aircraft, to having them merely on the loop. By this, the Air Force means deploying mixed formations, with a manned plane acting as wing leader for three unmanned aircraft. Each robot would have its own task, air-to-air -air combat, suppressing ground fire, bombing, and so on, with the wing leader monitoring the execution of certain decisions. The wing leader could override the robots, but advances in AI, artificial intelligence, will enable systems to make combat decisions and act within legal and policy constraints without necessarily requiring human input. Unmanned jet fighters are already being tested, and in July 2013 one even landed on the rolling deck of an aircraft carrier, one of the most difficult tasks a human Navy flyer ever has to perform. By the late 2040s, the Air Force suggests, technology will be able to reduce the time to complete the OODA, Observe, Orient, Decide and Act, loop, to micro or nanoseconds. But if, when, we reach that point, the obvious question will come up. Why keep humans on the loop at all? The answer is equally obvious, because we do not trust our machines. If the Soviets had trusted Petrov's algorithms in 1983, perhaps none of us would be here now, and when the crew of the USS Vincennes did trust their machines in 1988, they shot down an Iranian passenger jet, killing 290 civilians. No one wants more of that. We already don't understand Microsoft Windows, a researcher at Princeton University's Program on Science and Global Security, jokes. And so, we're certainly not going to understand something as complex as a human-like intelligence. Why, he goes on to ask, should we create something like that and then arm it? Once again, the answer is obvious, because we will have no choice. The United Nations has demanded a moratorium on what it calls lethal autonomous robotics, and an international campaign to stop killer robots is gaining traction. But when hypersonic fighter planes clash in the 2050s, robots with OODA loops of nanoseconds will kill humans with OODA loops of milliseconds, and there will be no more debate. As in every other revolution in military affairs, people will make new weapons because if they do not, their enemies might do so first. Battle the former U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Adams suggests, is already moving beyond human space as weapons become too fast, too small, too numerous, and create an environment too complex for humans to direct. Robotics is rapidly taking us to a place where we may not want to go, but probably are unable to avoid. I heard a joke at Nellis Air Force Base. The Air Force of the future will consist of just a man, a dog, and a computer. The man's job will be to feed the dog, and the dog's job will be to stop the man from touching the computer. Current trends suggest that robots will begin taking over our fighting in the 2040s. Just around the time, the trends also suggest, that the Globocop will be losing control of the international order. In the 1910s, the combination of a weakening Globocop and revolutionary new fighting machines – dreadnoughts, machine guns, aircraft, quick-firing artillery, internal combustion engines – ended a century of smaller, less bloody wars and set off a storm of steel. The 2040s promise a similar combination. 
Opinions vary over whether this will bring similar or even worse results than the 1910 saw. In the most detailed, or according to taste, most speculative discussion, the strategic forecaster George Friedman has argued that hugely sophisticated space-based intelligence systems will dominate war by 2050. He expects American power to be anchored on a string of these great space stations, surrounded and protected by dozens of smaller satellites, in much the same way that destroyers and frigates protect contemporary aircraft carriers. These orbiting flotillas will police the Earth below, partly by firing missiles, but mainly by collecting and analyzing data, coordinating swarms of hypersonic robot planes, and guiding ground battles in which, suggests Friedman, the key weapon will be the armored infantryman, a single soldier encased in a powered suit. Think of him as a one-man tank, only more lethal. The focus of mid-21st century fighting, what Clausewitz called the Schwerpunkt, will be cyber and kinetic battles to blind the space flotillas, followed by attacks on the power plants that generate the vast amounts of energy that the robots will need. Electricity, Friedman speculates, will be to war in the 21st century as petroleum was to war in the 20th. He foresees a world war in the truest sense of the word, but given the technological advances in precision and speed, it won't be total war. What Friedman means by this is that civilians will be bystanders, looking on anxiously as robotically augmented warriors battle it out. Once one side starts losing the robotic war, its position will quickly become hopeless, leaving surrender or slaughter as the only options. The war will then end, leaving not the billion dead of Petrov's day, or even the hundred million of Hitler's, but, Friedman estimates, more like fifty thousand, only slightly more than die each year in automobile accidents in the United States. I would like to believe this relatively sunny scenario. Who wouldn't? But the lessons of the last ten millennia of fighting make it difficult. The first time I raised the idea of revolutions in military affairs, back in Chapter 2, I observed that there is no new thing under the sun. Nearly four thousand years ago, soldiers in Southwest Asia had already augmented the merely human warrior by combining him with horses. These augmented warriors charioteers, literally rode rings around unaugmented warriors plodding along on foot, with results that were, in one way, very like what Friedman predicts. When one side lost a chariot fight around 1400 BC, its foot soldiers and civilians found themselves in a hopeless position. Surrender and slaughter were their only options. New kinds of augmentation were invented in first millennium BC India, where humans riding on elephants dominated battlefields, and on the steppes in the first millennium AD, where bigger horses were added to humans to produce cavalry. In each case, once battle was joined, foot soldiers and civilians often just had to wait as the pachyderms or horsemen fought it out, hoping for the best. Once again, whoever lost the animal-augmented fight was in a hopeless position. But there the similarities with Friedman's scenario end. Chariots, elephants, and cavalry did not mount surgical strikes, skillfully destroying the other side's chariots, elephants, and cavalry, and then stopping. Battles did not lead to cool calculations and the negotiated surrender of defenseless infantry and civilians. Instead, wars were no-holds-barred frenzies of violence. When the dust settled after the high-tech horse and elephant fighting, the losers regularly got slaughtered whether they surrendered or not. The age of chariots saw one atrocity after another. The age of elephants was so appalling that the Mauryan king Ashoka foreswore violence in 260 BC, and the age of cavalry, all the way from Attila the Hun to Genghis Khan, was worse than either. All the signs, particularly on the nuclear front, suggest that major wars in the mid-twenty-first century will look more like these earlier conflicts than Friedman's optimistic account. We are already, according to the political scientist Paul Bracken, moving into a second nuclear age. The first nuclear age, the Soviet-American confrontation of the 1940s to 80s, was scary but simple, 
because mutual assured destruction produced stability of a kind. The second age, by contrast, is for the moment not quite so scary because the number of warheads is so much smaller, but it is very far from simple. It has more players than the Cold War, using smaller forces and following few, if any, agreed-on rules. Mutual assured destruction no longer applies because India, Pakistan and Israel, if or when Iran goes nuclear, know that a first strike against their regional rival could conceivably take out its second strike capability. So far, anti-missile defences and the Globocop's guarantees have kept order. But if the Globocop does lose credibility in the 2030s and after, nuclear proliferation, arms races and even preemptive attacks may start to make sense. If major war comes in the 2040s or 50s, there is a very good chance that it will begin not with a quarantined high-tech battle between the great powers' computers, space stations and robots, but with nuclear wars in South, Southwest or East Asia that expand to draw in everyone else. A third world war will probably be as messy and furious as the first two and much, much bloodier. We should expect massive cyber, space, robotic, chemical and nuclear onslaughts, hurled against the enemy's digital and anti-missile shields like futuristic broadswords smashing at a suit of armour, and when the armour cracks, as it eventually will, storms of fire, radiation and disease will pour through onto the defenceless bodies on the other side. Quite possibly, as in so many battles in the past, neither side will really know whether it is winning or losing until disaster suddenly overtakes it, or the enemy, or both at once. This is a terrifying scenario, but if the 2010s to 50s do rerun the script of the 1870s to 1910s, with the Globocop weakening, unknown unknowns multiplying, and weapons growing ever more destructive, it will become increasingly plausible. The New England saying, then, may be true. Perhaps we really can't get there from here. Unless, that is, there isn't where we think it is. Come together. The secret of strategy is knowing where you want to go, because only then can you work out how to get there. For more than 200 years, campaigners for peace have been imagining there, a world without war, in much the way that Kant did, as something that can be brought into being by a conscious decision to renounce violence. Margaret Mead insisted that war is something we have invented, and therefore something we can uninvent. The authors of War suggested that standing up and shouting that war is good for absolutely nothing would end it. Political scientists tend to be less idealistic, but many of them also argue that conscious choice, this time to build better, more democratic and more inclusive institutions, will get us there from here. The long-term history I have traced in this book, however, points in a very different direction. We kill because the grim logic of the game of death rewards it. On the whole, the choices we make do not change the game's payoffs. Rather, the game's payoffs change the choices we make. That is why we cannot just decide to end war. But long-term history also suggests a second and more upbeat conclusion. We are not trapped in a Red Queen effect, doomed to rerun the self-defeating tragedy of Globocops that create their own enemies until we destroy civilization altogether. Far from keeping us in the same place, all the running we have done in the last 10,000 years has transformed our societies, changing the payoffs in the game, and in the next few decades the payoffs look likely to change so much that the game of death will turn into something entirely new. We are beginning to play the end game of death. To explain what I mean by this rather cryptic statement, I want to step back from the horrors of war for a moment to take up some of the arguments in my two most recent books, Why the West Rules, for now, and The Measure of Civilization. As I mentioned at the end of Chapter 2, in these publications I presented what I called an Index of Social Development, which measures how successful different societies have been at getting what they wanted from the world across the 15,000 years since the last Ice Age. 
The index assigned social development scores on a scale from 0 points to 1,000, the latter being the highest score possible under the conditions prevailing in the year AD 2000, where the index ended. Armed with this index, I asked, partly tongue-in-cheek and partly not, what would happen if we projected the scores forward. As with any prediction, the results depend on what assumptions we make, so I took a deliberately conservative starting point, asking how the future will shape up if development continues increasing in the 21st century just at the pace it did in the 20th. The result, even with such a restrictive assumption, was startling. By 2100, the development score will have leapt to 5,000 points. Getting from a caveman painting bison at Lascaux to you reading this book required development to rise by 900 points. Getting to 2100 will see it increase by another 4,000 points. Mind-boggling is the only word for such a prediction, literally, because one of the major implications of such soaring development is that the human mind itself will be transformed during the century to come. Computerization is not just changing war, it is changing everything, including the animals that we are. Biological evolution gave us brains so powerful that we could invent cultural evolution. But cultural evolution has now reached the point that the machines we are building are beginning to feed back into our biological evolution, with results that will change the game of death into an end game of death, with the potential to make violence irrelevant. It is hard to imagine anything that could be more important for the future of war, but in conversations over the last year or two, I have noticed a deep disconnect between how technologists and security analysts see the world. Among technologists, there seems to be no such thing as over-optimism. Everything is possible, and it will all turn out better than we expect. In the world of international security, however, the bad is always about to get worse and things are always scarier than we had realized. Security analysts tend to dismiss technologists as dreamers, so lost in utopian fantasies that they cannot see that strategic realities will always override technobabble, and technologists often deride the security crowd as dinosaurs, so stuck in the old paradigm that they cannot see that computerization will sweep their worries away. There are exceptions, of course, the National Intelligence Council's reports try to bring both points of view together, as does the recent book The New Digital Age, co-authored by the technologist Eric Schmidt and the security expert Jared Cohen. Trying to build on their examples, schizophrenic as the experience can be, I devote the rest of this section to the technologist's projections, turning to the reality check of security concerns in the section that follows. The combination produces a vision of the near future that is both uplifting and alarming. The technologist's starting point is an obvious fact. Computers powerful enough to fly fighter jets in real time will be powerful enough to do a lot more, too. Just how much more, no one can say for sure, but hundreds of futurists have made their best guesses anyway. Not surprisingly, no two agree on very much, and if there is anything we can be certain of, it is that these visions are at least as full of errors as the century-old science fiction of Jules Verne and H. G. Wells. But by the same token, when taken in bulk rather than tested one speculation at a time, today's futurists also resemble those of late Victorian times in recognizing a set of broad trends transforming the world. And when it came to broad trends, Verne and Wells were arguably right more often than they were wrong. The biggest area of agreement among contemporary futurists and the mainstay of the Matrix movies is that we are merging with our machines. This is an easy prediction to make, given that we have been doing it since the first cardiac pacemaker was fitted in 1958, or, in a milder sense, since the first false teeth and wooden legs. The 21st century version, however, is much grander. Not only are we merging with our machines, through our machines, we are also merging with each other. The idea behind this argument is very simple. Inside your brain, that 2.7 pounds of magic that I said so much about in Chapter 6, 10,000 trillion 
electrical signals flash back and forth every second between some 22 billion neurons. These signals make you who you are, with your unique way of thinking, and the roughly 10 trillion stored pieces of information that constitute your memory. No machine yet comes close to matching this miracle of nature, although the machines are gaining fast. For half a century, the power, speed and cost-effectiveness of computers have been doubling every year or so. In 1965, a dollar's worth of computing on a new, super-efficient IBM 1130 bought one one-thousandth of a calculation per second. By 2010, the same dollar-second bought more than 10 billion calculations, and by the time this book appears in 2014, the relentless doubling will have boosted that above a hundred billion. Cheap laptops can do more calculations and faster than the giant mainframes of 50 years ago. We can even make computers just a few molecules across, so small that they can be inserted into our veins to reprogram cells to fight cancer. Just a century ago, it would all have seemed like sorcery. We only need to extend the trend line out as far as 2029, observes Ray Kurzweil, the best known of the technological futurists and now director of engineering at Google, too. To get scanners powerful enough to map brains neuron by neuron and computers powerful enough to run the programs in real time. At that point, Kurzweil claims, there will effectively be two of you. One, the old, unimproved biological version decaying over time, and the other a new, unchanging, machine-based alternative. Better still, says Kurzweil, the machine-based minds will be able to share information as easily as we now swap files between computers. And by 2045, if the trends hold, there will be supercomputers powerful enough to host scans of all 8 billion minds in the world. Carbon and silicon-based intelligence will come together in a single global consciousness, with thinking power dwarfing anything the world has ever seen. Kurzweil calls this moment the singularity, a future period during which the pace of technological change will be so rapid, its impact so deep, that technology appears to be expanding at infinite speed. These are extraordinary claims. Naturally, there are plenty of naysayers, including some leading scientists as well as rival futurists. They are often blunt. The singularity is just the rapture for nerds, says the science fiction author Ken McLeod, while the influential technology critic Yevgeny Marazov thinks that all this digito-futuristic nonsense is nothing more than a cyber-wig theory of history. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it is clearly not a compliment. One neuroscientist, speaking at a conference in 2012, was even more direct. It's crap, he said. Other critics, however, prefer to follow the lead of the famous physicist Niels Bohr, who once told a colleague, We are all agreed that your theory is crazy. The question that divides us is whether it is crazy enough to have a chance of being correct. Perhaps, some think, Kurzweil is not being crazy enough. A 2012 survey of crystal ball gazers found that the median date at which they anticipated a technological singularity was 2040, five years ahead of Kurzweil's projection, while Henry Markram, the neuroscientist who directs the Human Brain Project, even expects to get there, with the aid of a billion euro grant from the European Union, by 2020. But when we turn from soothsaying to what is actually happening in laboratories, we discover, perhaps unsurprisingly, that while no one can predict the detailed results, the broad trend does keep moving toward the computerization of everything. I touched on some of this science in my book Why the West Rules, for now, so here I can be brief, but I do want to note a couple of remarkable advances in what neuroscientists call brain-to-brain -brain interfacing, in plain English, telepathy over the Internet, made since that book appeared in 2010. The first requirement for merging minds through machines is machines that can read the electrical signals inside our skulls. And in 2011, neuroscientists at the University of California, Berkeley, took a big step in this direction. 
After measuring the blood flow through volunteers' visual cortices as they watched film clips, they used computer algorithms to convert the data back into images. The results were crude, grainy, and rather confusing, but Jack Galland, the neuroscientist leading the project, is surely right to say, we are opening a window into the movies in our minds. Just a few months later, another Berkeley team recorded the electrical activity in subjects' brains as they listened to human speech, and then had computers translate these signals back into words. Both experiments were clumsy. The first required volunteers to lie still for hours, strapped into functional magnetic resonance imaging scanners, while the second could only be done on patients undergoing brain surgery, who had had big slices of their skulls removed and electrodes placed directly inside. There's a long way to go before you get to proper mind-reading, Jan Schnupp, a professor of neuroscience at Oxford University, concluded in his assessment of the research. But, he added, it's a question of when rather than if. It is conceivable that in the next ten years this could happen. The second requirement for Internet-enabled telepathy is a way to transmit electrical signals from one brain to another, and in 2012, Miguel Nicolelis, a neuroscientist at Duke University, showed how this might be done by getting rats in his native Brazil to control the bodies of rats in North Carolina. The South American rodents had been taught that when a light flashed, they would get snacks if they pressed a lever. Electrodes attached to their heads picked up this brain activity and sent it over the Internet to electrodes on the skulls of North American rodents who, without the benefit of training or flashing lights, pressed the same lever and got a snack 70% of the time. 70% is far from perfect. Rats' brains are much simpler than ours, and pressing a lever is not a very challenging task. But despite the myriad technical problems, one thing seems certain. Brain-to-brain -brain interfacing is not going to stop at rats moving one another's paws over the Internet it may well develop in ways entirely different from Kurzweil's vision, which Nicolelis calls a bunch of hot air, but it will continue to develop nonetheless. Nicolelis, in fact, expects us to get to much the same place as does Kurzweil, but from the opposite direction. Instead of uploading brain scans onto computers, he says, we will implant tiny computers into our brains. Since the experts cannot agree on the details, there is little to gain from arbitrarily picking one prophecy and running with it. However, there is even less to gain from pretending that nothing is happening at all. We might do best to heed the sage words of Richard Smalley, a Nobel Prize-winning chemist who is often called the father of nanotechnology. Smalley's law, as I like to call it, tells us that when a scientist says something is possible, they're probably underestimating how long it will take. But if they say it's impossible, they're probably wrong. However exactly it works, and whether we like the idea or not, brain-to-brain -brain interfacing, as Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Adams, quoted a few pages ago, said of robotics on the battlefield, is taking us to a place where we may not want to go, but probably are unable to avoid. That place is nothing less than a new stage in our evolution. Beginning more than a hundred thousand years ago, the struggle for survival in a harsh Ice Age world created conditions in which freakish mutants with big brains, us, could outcompete and replace all earlier kinds of proto-humans. This happened even though the proto-humans that got replaced had themselves created the mutants by having sex, which produced random genetic variations, some of which flourished under the relentless pressure of natural selection. It seems unlikely that proto-humans wanted to create monsters that would drive them into extinction, but, evolution being what it is, they had no choice in the matter. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And now, a thousand centuries on, we are doing something rather similar to what the proto-humans did, but doing it faster, through cultural rather than biological evolution. In our struggle for survival in a crowded, warming world, we are creating new kinds of freakish mutants with big brains, using machines to merge our unimproved, individual, merely biological minds into some sort of superorganism. What we are making is, in a way, 
the ultimate open access order, breaking down every barrier between individuals. Age, sex, race, class, language, education, you name it, all will be dissolved in the superorganism. Maybe the process will only go as far as sharing thoughts, memories, and personalities, Nicolelis' guess. Or maybe it will reach the point that individuality and physical bodies no longer mean much, Kurzweil's guess. Or maybe it will go even further, and what we condescendingly call artificial intelligence will completely supplant ineffective, old-fashioned animal intelligence. We cannot know, but if long-term history is any guide, we have to suspect that one way or another the mutants, the new version of us, will replace the old us as completely as the old us replaced Neanderthals. Once again, it seems that there is no new thing under the sun. Brain-to-brain -brain interfacing is just the latest chapter in an ancient story. Two billion years ago, bacteria began merging to produce simple cells. Another 300 million years after that, simple cells began merging into more complex ones. And after another 900 million years, complex cells began merging into multi-celled animals. At each stage, simpler organisms gave up some functions, some of their freedom, in a sense, in order to become more specialized parts of a bigger, more complex being. Bacteria lost bacterianess, but gained cellness. Cells lost cellness, but gained animality and ultimately consciousness. And now, perhaps, we are about to lose our individual animality, as we become part of something as far removed from Homo sapiens as we are from our ancestral cells. The consequences for the game of death are, to put it mildly, enormous. Two thousand years ago, the Roman historian Livy told a story about a time when his city had been bitterly divided. The poor, he said, had risen up against the rich, calling them parasites. As tension mounted, Menenius Agrippa, a prominent senator, entered the rebels' camp to make peace. Once upon a time, Agrippa told them, the parts of the human body did not all agree as they do now, but each had its own ideas. The stomach, the other organs felt, did nothing all day but grow fat from their efforts. And so, Agrippa said, they made a plot that the hand would not carry food to the mouth, nor would the mouth accept anything it was given, nor would the teeth chew. But while the angry organs tried to subdue the stomach, the whole body wasted away. The rebels got the point. The further that brain-to-brain -brain interfacing goes, the more Agrippa's parable will become reality. It might even push the payoffs from violence right down to zero. Should that come to pass, then the beast, along with our basic animalness, will go extinct, and it will make no more sense for merged intelligences to solve disagreements violently, whatever disagreements and violently might then mean, than it does for me to cut off my nose to spite my face. Or perhaps that is not what will happen. If the analogy between cells merging to create bodies and minds merging to create a superorganism is a good one, conflict might just evolve into new forms. Our own bodies, after all, are scenes of unceasing struggle. Pregnant women compete with their unborn babies for blood and the sugar it carries. If the mother succeeds too well, the fetus suffers damage or death. If the fetus succeeds too well, the mother may succumb to preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, potentially killing both parent and child. A superorganism may face similar conflicts, perhaps over which part of it gets access to the most energy. About one person in forty currently also has fights going on inside his or her cells, where so-called B chromosomes feed off the body's chemicals but refuse to participate in swapping genes, and about one person in 500 has cancer, with some cells refusing to stop replicating, regardless of the cost to the rest of the body. To protect ourselves from these scourges and against viruses that invade us from outside, our bodies have evolved multiple lines of microscopic defense. A superorganism may have to do something similar, perhaps even producing the equivalence of antibodies that can kill intruders or parts of its own body that go rogue. After all, as most of us have learned to our cost, 
machines are just as vulnerable to viruses as animals are. There is plenty to speculate about. What we can be sure of, though, is that brain-to-brain -brain interfacing and merging through our machines are accelerating. The old rules, by which we have been playing the game of death for a hundred thousand years, are reaching their own culminating point, and we are entering an entirely new end game of death. If we play it badly, there is almost no limit to the horrors we can inflict on ourselves. But if we play it well, before the end of the twenty-first century, the age-old dream of a world without war might become reality. The End Game of Death Everything in war is very simple, said Clausewitz, but the simplest thing is difficult. So it will be in the end game of death. Playing it well will be simple, but also terrifyingly difficult. What makes the end game simple is that once we know where there is and what war is good for, it is fairly obvious how, in theory, we get there from here. I have suggested that there is the computerization of everything, and that what war is good for is creating leviathans and ultimately globocops that keep the peace by raising the costs of violence to prohibitive levels. From these premises, the conclusion seems to follow that the world needs a globocop, ready to use force to keep the peace until the computerization of everything makes globocops unnecessary. The only alternative to a globocop is a rerun of the script of the 1870s to 1910s, but this time with nuclear weapons. And since the United States is the only plausible candidate for the job of Globocop, it remains, as Abraham Lincoln said a century and a half ago, the last best hope of Earth. If the United States fails, the whole world fails. As I write in 2013, a great debate is underway in American policy circles between those who believe the superpower should lean forward and those who urge it to pull back. Leaning forward, say its supporters, means sticking to a grand strategy of actively managing global security and promoting the liberal economic order that has served the United States exceptionally well for the past six decades, while pullers back argue that it is time to abandon the United States hegemonic strategy and replace it with one of restraint, giving up on global reform and sticking to protecting narrow national security interests, which would help preserve the country's prosperity and security over the long run. Long-term history suggests that both camps are right, or at least half right. The United States must lean forward and then pull back. As we heard in Chapter 4, when 15th century Europeans launched their 500 years war on the rest of the world, it was old-fashioned imperialists who led the charge, plundering and taxing the people they conquered. The success of the 500 years war, however, produced societies so big that old-style imperialism passed its culminating point. By the 18th century, open access orders that managed to get the invisible hand and the invisible fist working together were generating much more wealth and power than traditional kinds of empires. The result was the rise of the world's first Globocop, only for its success at implementing and managing a worldwide open access order to generate such rich, powerful rivals that the British system soon passed its own culminating point. The result of this, as we heard in Chapter 5, was a storm of steel and the rise of a much more powerful American Globocop. Now, the new Globocop's success is moving the world toward what I have called the ultimate open access order, in which the invisible hand may have no need for the invisible fist. That will mark the culminating point, not just for the American Globocop, but for all Globocops. Right now, the United States is the indispensable nation, and it must lean forward. But as it approaches the culminating point of globocoppery, the United States will need to pull back. The Pax Americana will yield to a Pax Technologica, a phrase I borrow from the futurists Aisha and Parag Khanna, and we will no longer need a globocop. Everything, then, is very simple until we start asking the kinds of questions that immediately occur to security analysts. At that point, we see just how difficult the simplest things can be. 
We cannot just wish away humanity's defence dilemmas by applying science. In fact, it would seem that merging with machines is itself the most destabilising of all the tectonic shifts, game changes, and black swans considered in this chapter, because the process will be so uneven. As I type these words, I am sitting just 15 miles, as the crow flies, from San Jose, the heart of California's Silicon Valley. The newest neighbor to move onto my road up in the Santa Cruz Mountains is an engineer working on Google Glass. When I commute to my own workplace, I fairly often pass self-driving cars, which tend to stick to the posted speed limits. But if I lived in Congo or Niger, which tied for last place in the most recent, 2013, United Nations Human Development Report, I doubt that I would have such neighbors or see such vehicles. San Jose is one of the world's richest and safest cities, Kinshasa one of its poorest and most dangerous. And, not surprisingly, places that are already safe and rich, especially San Jose, are moving toward the computerization of everything faster than those that are not. Open access orders thrive on inclusion because the bigger their markets and the greater their freedoms, the better the system works. Because of this, technologists tend to be confident that over the medium to long term, the computerization of everything will break down barriers, making the world fairer. However, throughout history, early adopters, whether of farming, leviathan or fossil fuels, have always had the advantage over those who follow later. Open access orders do not incorporate everyone on equal terms, nor is everyone equally enthusiastic about being incorporated. In the 18th century, the Europeans who colonized America brought Africans into the Atlantic open access order primarily as slaves. In the 19th, industrialized Europeans and Americans frequently used guns to force other Africans and Asians into larger markets. It is hard to imagine such crude kinds of bullying resurfacing in the 21st century, rich northerners scanning poor southerners' brains at gunpoint. But in the short run, computerization is likely to widen the gap between the first world and the rest. In the next decade or two, it may cause more, not less, conflict, as it dislocates economies and adds to the sense of injustice that already inspires Islamist violence. More terrorism, Boer wars and state failures may be looming. Nor will the disruptive effects of brain-to-brain -brain interfacing be limited to the poor South. The rather modest amount of computerization that the world's wealthiest countries have seen since the 1980s has already increased their inequality. Over the medium to long term, merging through machines should make this kind of distinction meaningless. But if, as seems quite possible, a narrow elite of wealth and talent leads the way in brain-to-brain -brain interfacing, in the shorter term the new technocrats might come to tower over everyone else in ways that today's 1% can only dream of. There is a story, admittedly of doubtful veracity, that the novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald once announced at a party that the rich are different from you and me, only for Ernest Hemingway to come back with the immortal put-down Yes, they have more money. Now, however, Fitzgerald is about to get his revenge. Over the next few decades, a new kind of rich really will become different from the rest of us. Just how different is every bit as disputed as anything else in the prediction business, but for my money you cannot beat the imaginative account by the nanotechnologist-turned-novelist and advisor to the National Intelligence Council, Ramez Nam. In Nexus, the only work of fiction I have ever encountered that comes with an appendix on bioengineering, Nam tells us that the 2036 edition of the Oxford English Dictionary will include some unfamiliar words. One is transhuman, defined as a human being whose capabilities have been enhanced such that they now exceed normal human maxima in one or more important dimensions. Another is posthuman, meaning a being which has been so radically transformed by technology that it has gone beyond transhuman status and can no longer be considered human at all. Transhumans, according to Nam's OED, are an incremental step in human evolution, while posthumans are the next major leap in human evolution. 
Nam's novel is set in 2040, and at that point, he suggests, rich countries will have not just plenty of transhumans, but also the first few post-humans. He imagines growing conflict. Idealistic, highly educated elite youths maneuver to give everyone the chance to tune in to post-humanity, turn on and drop out. A conservative American globocop tries to control the technology and protect old ways of being human, and rising rivals, particularly China, try to exploit post-humans for strategic advantage. In the sequel, Crux, terrorists get in on the act too, using merged minds for political murder. The world edges toward war, and much blood is shed, by and from humans of all kinds. Nexus and Crux are only stories, but they nicely capture the messiness of merging with and through machines, and the complexity of the choices ahead. If, for instance, the Globocop leans too far forward, say by trying to control developments too tightly, or by holding on to its job past the culminating point, it will face mounting opposition, overstretch, and financial collapse, quite possibly bringing on precisely the military challenges that it will be trying to avoid. That is a surefire strategy for losing the end game of death, and one of the reasons I spent so much time in earlier chapters looking at the theory of a Western way of war is that it seems to encourage just this kind of overconfidence about leaning forward. Thanks to the military legacy inherited from ancient Greece, Victor Davis Hansen assures us, deadly Western armies have little to fear from any force other than themselves. But this, I argued, is not what long-term history shows. In fact, as the 21st century goes on, it will be non-Western armies that challenge the Globocop most. Maintaining order will depend on sound judgment and skillful shepherding of resources, not the legacy of ancient Greece. On the other hand, if leaning forward too far or too long will lose the end game, pulling back too far or too soon will do so even faster. If the Globocop goes absent without leave, the most relevant analogy for the coming years might be not the slowly mounting crises of the 1870s to 1910s, but the abrupt catastrophe of the 1930s that low, dishonest decade when the British Globocop lay dying. Americans were unwilling to take its place, and reckless rivals gambled everything on violent solutions to their problems. In the long run, pulling back will be essential, but in the short run it will be catastrophic. Everything will hang on the relative timing of the shift from the Pax Americana to a Pax Technologica, and the mounting difficulties that the Globocop will face if current economic trends continue, in doing its job. I suggested earlier that in the 2010s and probably the 2020s too, the United States will remain largely unchallenged, but as the 2030s, 2040s and 2050s go on, it will find it harder and harder to overawe rivals. I also noted that the majority opinion among the futurists is that merging with machines will reach the singularity stage in the 2040s. If all of these guesses are right, we perhaps do not have too much to worry about. The world will become increasingly troubled, polarized, and tense as we head through the 2020s, but the Globocop will remain strong enough to handle the stresses. As we enter the 2030s, the Globocop will be feeling the strain, but it will by then be pulling back anyway, as the Pax Technologica begins to make violence irrelevant to problem-solving, and in the 2040s and 50s, just at the point that the Globocop ceases to be able to cope, the world will no longer need its services. All will be well. But will the computerization of everything really proceed at this convenient pace? The 2040s are only 30 years away, and although the 30 years that have just passed saw dramatic technological changes, it is far from obvious that another three decades will merge us with our machines. But that misapprehension, the futurists insist, comes from failing to see that technological change is exponential, constantly doubling up, not linear. Imagine, they sometimes say, that you rent a summer cottage. When you arrive, there is a very pretty lily on the pond. A week later, there are two. Another week after that, there are four. You then reluctantly have to go back to work, and two months pass before you can resume your vacation. 
When you get back to the cottage, more than a thousand lilies confront you. The four lilies you left have doubled and redoubled eight times. You can no longer see the pond under them. Let us say, for the sake of argument, that one full lily's worth of technological transformation had happened by 1983, the year of Petrov's moment of truth, and that each lily reproduces once every half-dozen years. In 2013, as I write, the lilies have doubled five times, and we have 32 of them, a lot more than in 1983, but still far from filling the pond. By 2025, however, there will be 128, and by 2043, the eve of Kurzweil's date for the singularity, over 1,000. The original pond, that is, we unimproved merely biological humans, will have disappeared under a carpet of trans- and post-human techno-lilies. The thirty-some lilies we have in the mid-2010s represent gadgets like Google Glass, the Internet, and rats moving each other's paws. These are nice additions to the ways humans have lived for the last 50,000 years, but nothing more. The 200 or so lilies of the late 2020s might add up to artificial intelligence that can sometimes pass for human, a touch of telepathy, and some people living their lives largely in virtual reality, but there will still be far more pond than lily. The knee of the curve, as statisticians call the point where the increases really take off, will come in the mid-2030s, by which time every year will see more change than happened in the whole period between the 1980s and the 2010s, and in the 2040s, when change becomes so rapid that it appears to be instantaneous, the Globocop can retire. The arithmetic only adds up, though, if the exponential improvements in computing power continue at the same speed as they have in the last 50 years. But that would break Smalley's law, the premise that everything is possible but will take longer than we think. If Smalley's law does apply to the computerization of everything, we might still be very far from finishing the end game of death when the Globocop loses its grip in the 2040s. Even a modest increase in the time techno lilies need to reproduce, from the half dozen years that I proposed to a decade, would push the knee of the technological curve back to the 2060s and delay any kind of singularity into the 2080s. If the Globocop stumbles in the 2040s, a period of several decades will then ensue with neither a Pax Americana nor a Pax Technologica. Rather than merging into a single superorganism, a Smallian world might dissolve in the 2050s into multiple and incompatible brain-to-brain -brain networks, each dominated by a different great power. We might see a high-tech version of the 19th century scramble for Africa as the networks compete for neural market share, shutting their rivals out of different parts of the world. Climate change might by then be convulsing the arc of instability, the coming of killer robots might be shifting the balance of power, and the infrastructure and energy needs of merging with machines might be providing a whole new kind of target to attack. A nation that feels it has a temporary edge in the technological transformation might be tempted to gamble on using it to impose its will violently on everyone else, or, perhaps more likely, a government that is falling behind might go for broke, betting everything on attacking before the enemy's lead becomes unassailable. Armageddon will be beckoning. War. What is it going to be good for? But that, I am confident, is not how the story will end. The reason for my optimism is our track record, revealed so clearly by long-term history. We have not managed to wish war out of existence, but that is because it cannot be done. We have, however, been extremely good at responding to changing incentives in the game of death. For most of our time on Earth, we have been aggressive, violent animals, because aggression and violence have paid off. But in the 10,000 years since we invented productive war, we have evolved culturally to become less violent, because that pays off even better. And since nuclear weapons came into the world in 1945, the incentives in the game have changed faster than ever before, and our reactions have accelerated along with them. As a result, the average person is now roughly 20 times less likely to die violently 
than the average person was in the Stone Age. Imagine for a moment that I had written this book fifty years ago, publishing it not in 2014, but in 1964, less than three years after the Berlin crisis, two after the Cuban Missile Crisis, a few months before Mao tested his first atomic bomb, and a year before U.S. Marines landed in South Vietnam. Imagine, too, that I had predicted in it that humanity was now so well attuned to changes in the game of death's payoffs that within twenty-five years the Soviet Union would renounce force, tear down the Berlin Wall, and then dissolve itself, all without firing a single shot, let alone a nuclear missile. Even if I had held myself back from speculating that Red China would embrace capitalism and turn into the world's second biggest economy, I doubt that the reviewers would have been kind. But I would have been right. And now, back in the present, the same reasoning leads me to believe that we will play the end game of death just as skillfully as we played the regular game. Si vis pacem, said a famous Roman proverb, para bellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. Despite everything that has changed in the two thousand years since Calgacus and Agricola fought rather than talked at the Gropian mountain, this has remained true. The song, War, got it wrong. War has not been good for absolutely nothing, because, uncomfortable as it is to face this fact, war is the only method humans have found for moving from tiny Stone Age bands with rates of violent death in the 10 to 20 percent range to today's vast globalized society with a rate below 1 percent. War has made the planet peaceful and prosperous, so peaceful and prosperous, in fact, that war has almost, but not quite, put itself out of business. Hence the final paradox in this paradoxical tale. If we really want a world where war is good for absolutely nothing, we must recognize that war still has a part to play. The faster the computerization of everything proceeds, the greater the likelihood that the Pax Americana turns into a Pax Technologica before the Globocop's weakness leads to a new storm of steel. But even in the worst-case Smalley's Law type scenario, the United States must remain as ready to pay any price, bear any burden, and meet any hardship as it was when John F. Kennedy first recommended such a course in 1961. In September 2013, as this book goes into production, two-thirds of Americans are telling pollsters that they oppose any use of force in Syria. But if the United States, like Britain between the world wars, wearies of its role as Globocop, there is no plan B. On the whole, American efforts to preserve global order will directly benefit the country's many overseas allies. But sometimes, inevitably, they will not, which means that the allies, too, will have a major role to play in the endgame. Sometimes they will need to speak truth to power, telling the Globocop things it does not want to hear. At other times they will need to back up the Globocop with diplomacy, money, or even force of arms. Above all, they will need the wisdom to know when to subordinate their own local concerns to a global strategy, recognizing that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The most difficult decisions of all, though, might be those that fall to the Globocop's rivals. The more these rivals' wealth grows, the more their moves will affect how the endgame turns out. A hundred-plus years ago, the British Globocop's two greatest rising rivals were Germany and the United States. Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm felt that the only options open to him were risky moves that undermined the global order, while the United States found ways to act in its own interests while still, mostly, shoring up the Globocop. Speak softly and carry a big stick, President Theodore Roosevelt advised, and as today's rising rivals acquire big sticks of their own, their leaders will have to choose between Roosevelt and Wilhelm as models. The United States can do much to influence these choices by making room for rivals' peaceful development while simultaneously deterring rash aggression. But in the end, the more that America's rivals lean toward Roosevelt, the more likely the world is to win the end game of death. What we need to do is simple, but, as Clausewitz said, difficult because humanity will only win the end game of death 
if the singularity arrives before the Globocop fails. If we are really going to get there from here, the Globocop must remain strong for as long as possible, which means that the United States must, for the next 40-plus years, maintain its military spending and readiness at levels that make it a credible leviathan. It must be ready to threaten and even use force to preserve the global order, while neither spending so much that it breaks the political consensus in favour of leaning forward, nor exploiting its advantages so aggressively that it alienates its allies. To meet all these challenges, Americans will need to get their financial house in order, sustain economic growth, and invest in basic science, all while continuing to find leaders of the same quality as those that carried the country through the Cold War. Simple, but difficult. This concludes War, What Is It Good For? by Ian Morris. Narrated by Derek Perkins. Copyright 2014 by Ian Morris. This unabridged audiobook is produced by arrangement with Farah Strauss and Giroux, LLC, and was produced in the year 2014 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Or call toll-free 877-7-TANTOR to request a catalogue. This audio program is presented by Audible.com. Audible, audio that speaks to you wherever you are.